Hello everyone, am I live? Am I visible? Am I audible? Give me a thumbs up in the chat box if I am clearly visible, audible, anyone from the audience. A very good morning to all of you. Hi, Shalini, Arvind. Can you please confirm if I am clearly visible, audible, everything is good to go? If you people confirm, I will go ahead. I am still waiting for the confirmation. Good morning. Good morning everyone. A very, very good morning, a refreshing morning, an enthusiastic morning today. Yes. Okay, so am I clearly visible audible? Thank you. Thank you for confirmation. Thank you everyone. So let me start the session. A very good morning to all of you. I am Dr. Priyanka Sachdev here and today I am here to, you know, to take a crash course. A most important high yielding topics of general pathology and hematology. So we have a two day crash course. Today we are going to finish complete general pathology as well as hematology. And tomorrow we are going to take complete systemic pathology. So today also we are having six to seven hour session. Tomorrow also we are having six to seven hour session. So in this approx 40 15 hour session we are going to cover the most important high yielding topics of entire pathology in a crisp manner so i can challenge if you attend my this course like a 12 to 15 hour course completely uh, the 90 percent questions will hit from the syllabus only because we are going to cover most important you know repeatedly asked questions whatever exam you are targeting if you are targeting fmg if you are targeting need pg if you are targeting next whatever exam you are targeting now i'm going to cover the most important topics here most of the students know my way of teaching first i will take a chapter i will take a topic i will teach you the concise theory related to that and then we will solve the pyqs and you know most important mcqs which can ask from that topic so in this way the PYQs, the last three year PYQs from that topic will be completed. Not only this, if new questions are framed from that particular topic, you are prepared for that, all, that also. So can we go ahead? Are you people ready? Are you people ready? So let's start super simplified course of pathology. Can we go ahead? Are you people ready? Can I start? Okay. So let's start with general pathology. So let's finish general pathology in say four or five hours. And after that, two to three hours of hematology. Okay. So again, I'm repeating, I'm taking the most important topics of each chapter. You can also understand completing entire pathology is not possible in 15 hours. If we want to complete entire pathology, it requires 80 hours, 60 to 80 hours, not 15 hours. So in 15 hours, what we can do, we can see the most high yielding topics or most uh, repeatedly asked topics from each chapter. Okay. So let's start with chapter number one of general pathology. Let's start with chapter number one, cell adaptation, cell injury, cell death. Okay. So let's start with the topic cell adaptation. First, I will let you know what is cell adaptation, then cell injury, then cell death. In cell death, we will see two things apoptosis as well as necrosis i can challenge whatever exam you are targeting now you will get one question from this topic okay so what is cell adaptation cell injury cell death are the three things related to each other are the three things related to each other listen in human body from head to toe we all are made up of cells you know cell is the structural and functional unit of human life so we are completely made up of cells Normally, all the cells are in homeostasis. Can you see a cell in this diagram? All the cells are in homeostasis. You can ask, ma'am, what is homeostasis? Homeostasis means a cell is performing a particular function with a particular structure. For example, the God has assigned particular function to particular cells. For example, the cells of the salivary gland, they do the function of secretion. The cell of the intestine, they do the function of absorption. The cell of the nervous system, they do the function of cognition and memory. So the, they all are cells, but they are assigned different function because they have little bit structural differences between them. That is the meaning of homeostasis. But whenever any stress acts on the cell, whenever any stress acts on the cell, whether physiological or whether pathological, three things happens back to back. Number one thing is cell adaptation in which the cell will try to adopt and survive uh, the unfavorable condition. It will, uh, it will, you know, try to survive the stress overcome the stress that is known as cell adaptation but these are reversible i mean to say once you remove the stress the cell will come to a homeostasis again after that if the stress is continued 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 the second thing take place is cell injury again cell injury first there is reversible cell injury 
followed by there is a point of no return after that there is irreversible cell injury reversible cell injury it is reversible irreversible cell injury is actually cell death it is irreversible once the cell is death it is not again alive right now please understand with the help of example it was a theory part let me tell you uh, the example okay i am coming i am coming on that uh, md islam i am coming what is stress stress is anything which is not physiological i mean to say that is not normal that is known as stress let me take an example okay how many hours you study in a day can you tell me how many hours you study in a day normally normally today how many hours you will study you will say ma'am four hours some students will say ma'am four hours some will say six hours okay so four to six hours normally you study every day that is your homeostasis you are in homeostasis but what about the day before exam how many hours you study a day one day before exam or on the day of exam how many hours you study you will say ma'am 12 hours some will say 18 hours maybe 16 17 hours impressive right so what is this what is this so exam is acting as a stress and to overcome the stress your body is doing the adaptation so instead of doing normal you are doing something uh, extraordinary you know so instead of studying 6 hours you are studying for 12 hours 15 hours so that is adaptation right so you will do so what about once the exam is over how many hours you will study how many hours you will study once the exam is over don't say ma'am I will not study 0 hours so again you will shift to the homeostasis I mean to say the once you remove the stress now the adaptations are reversible i i want to explain this but imagine the exams are continued for one month or two month so what will happen continuously you will study for 12 to 15 hours for one month or two month you will have certain diseases in your body right that is injury that is injury again up to a certain point injury is reversible once you remove the stress the exams are over it is removable it is reversible i mean but if exam continues forever forever you cannot study for 15 16 hours or 20 hours you know you will have many disorders this is the irreversible cell injury you can have so this is just an example to understand so i mean to say i mean to say there are three things happen back to back the first thing is adaptation followed by reversible cell injury and followed by irreversible cell injury which is known as cell death so if the stress continued 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 these three things are the progressive one by one they will happen okay how many types let's talk about adaptation first then we will come on injury then cell death okay the three things we have to cover the first thing is the adaptation how many how many uh, types of adaptations are there there are five type of adaptations what are the five type of adaptations hypertrophy hyperplasia atrophy metaplasia and dysplasia okay what do you mean by that okay first understand the word hypertrophy and hyperplasia okay both are hyper hyper means more hypertrophy and hyperplasia okay what is the difference between them trophy means size in pathology the word trophy means size and in pathology the word plasia the word plasia means number okay number it's the number of the cell hyper means more or increase so increase in size of the cell is hypertrophy and increase in number of the cell is hyperplasia you got it so that is the meaning of hypertrophy trophy means increase in size of the cell plasia means increase in number of the cell can you see here can you tell me what is this what is this can you see there one cell so normally this cell was in homeostasis now the stress is acting on the cell because of the stress the cell is doing certain adaptation so what does it so you can see the size of the cell here you can see the exact same size of the cell here but here one cell here multiple cell so basically the number is increased not the size so you can say it's hyperplasia it's hyperplasia okay let me see okay can we go ahead okay okay so that that is hyperplasia increase in number of the cell and here you can see this cell is also in homeostasis so when stress is acting on this cell as a part of adaptation this cell is same here it is also one here it is also one number is not increased but you can notice the size is increased so you can say this is hypertrophy so one is hyperplasia one is hypertrophy see the third here the cell is in homeostasis now the stress is acting because of the stress it decreases in size appreciate the size here appreciate the size here 
it is decreasing in size that is known as atrophy that is known as atrophy give me a thumbs up yes i will provide the pdf after the session don't make the notes i will provide the pdf on the telegram group okay you can find the uh, pdf on the telegram group of the prosium okay so can we go ahead now give me a thumbs up this is atrophy okay atrophy now i taught you three things hypertrophy hyperplasia and atrophy can you tell me a common example of all three hypertrophy is increase in size hyperplasia is increase in number atrophy is decrease in size can you tell me a common example of all three can you people please tell me the common example of all three yes so best example is the pregnant uterus you know so during pregnancy can you see the size of the uterus normally this is the size of the uterus normally but during pregnancy to accommodate the fetus inside that the size of the uterus increases we all know but how does the size of the uterus increases in the uterus there are three layers endometrium myometrium perimetrium let's talk about the middle layer myometrium these are the cells of the myometrium okay you can see the cells of the myometrium so basically the hormones during the pregnancy the estrogen and progesterone they are acting as a stress they are acting as a stress during pregnancy the hormonal changes takes place now so they are acting as a stress because of this stress the cells can you see the cells in the uterus these cell will increase in size as well as number so they increase in size that is hypertrophy they increase in number that is hyperplasia so basically pregnant uterus is an example of both so because of increase in size and number both of the cell the, the uterus increases in size the uterus increase in size because of increase in size as well as number of the cells in the myometrium but what of after delivery now the delivery of the fetus already took place the delivery of the child the fetus the newborn already took place now parturition you know during the next 2 3 months uterus again become normal size so how does it become again shrink in the size because of atrophy of the cell now these cells undergo reduction in size whatever cells they were increased now they they undergo reduction in size and because of which there is parturition so can i say uterus is coming in all three examples say yes if you got it so during pregnancy it's hypertrophy and hyperplasia which is which is leading to increase in size of uterus and after pregnancy during parturition after delivery the reduction in the size of the uterus is due to atrophy i want each of you to give me a thumbs up on this point if you got it so you can see three of the adaptation hypertrophy hyperplasia and atrophy are coming in this in this the three the three of them are coming in this can we go ahead okay yes hypertrophy is the single best you can say nadir but all three are there okay can we go ahead okay you can see here uh, the gross and the microscopy of the uterus you can see this is the normal uterus non pregnant uterus and you can see this is the pregnant uterus this is the pregnant uterus uh, uh, see the uh, appreciate the size appreciate the increase in the size grossly appreciate that now make the slide of this make the slide of this see the histopathology of both of them the non pregnant uterus see the cells of the myometrium and during pregnancy see the cells of the myometrium appreciate the size of the cell is increased and if you count the total number also the size as well as number both is increased give me a thumbs up if you got it yes i'm i'm going to cover important topics of the entire syllabus adil i'm going to cover entire syllabus today so can we go ahead so we are done with three hypertrophy hyperplasia atrophy coming on the fourth one the fourth adaptation what is the fourth adaptation the fourth adaptation is metaplasia what is metaplasia now can you tell me what is metaplasia it is transformation of one type of cell to another one type of mature cell is transformed to another type of mature cell i mean to say either the squamous cell converted into columnar or the columnar cell converted to squamous so either squamous to columnar or vice versa columnar to squamous so it is known as metaplasia basically there are two type of metaplasia whenever the squamous converted to columnar so finally columnar is formed now this is known as columnar metaplasia and whenever the columnar converted to squamous it is known as squamous metaplasia so basically you have to see finally what is formed finally what is formed can you see here in columnar metaplasia finally columnar is formed in squamous metaplasia finally squamous is formed so yes yes nadir absolutely right it is the transformation of one type of epithelia to another type of mature epithelia it's not increase in size increase in number decrease in size it is transformation or replacement of one type of epithelia by another 
either by squamous to columnar or columnar to squamous. If it is converted from squamous to columnar, it is known as columnar metaplasia. And if it is converted from columnar to squamous, it is known as squamous metaplasia. Okay. Can we give me a thumbs up? Yes, I am coming. Osama, I am coming on the examples also. Okay. Give me one example which is common for both type of metaplasia. I mean to say the columnar and squamous. As I have as given you an example of uterus. Uterus was a common example of hypertrophy, hyperplasia and metaplasia. Right. Now, I want you to give an example. Can you tell me the organ? The example which is common for columnar metaplasia as well as squamous metaplasia. In one organ, both of them takes place. Can you tell me the name of that organ? It's female cervix. The female cervix. Okay. Let me give you the basics. So, this is the uterus of a female. This is the cervix of a female. And this is the vagina of a female. Okay. Tell me the lining of the cervix. Okay. The uterus is lined by columnar epithelia. I guess we all know that. The uterus is lined by columnar epithelia. Okay. And the vagina is lined by the squamous epithelia. We all know that. So, this is the normal lining. Can you tell me the organ cervix which is between them? What is the lining? What is the lining of the cervix? What is the lining of the cervix? Can you tell me? So, yes, the cervix is having two portion. The cervix is having two portion. Let me divide the cervix. This is endocervix and this is ectocervix. So, can I say endocervix is a continuation of uterus? That's why it's columnar. Common sense? Yes. So, endocervix is columnar. And can I say the ectocervix is a continuation of the vagina? So, it's the ectocervix is squamous. Yes. So, use your common sense. There is nothing rocket science in that. Do no thing, nothing to learn. So, if you have understood, so normally the endocervix is columnar and normally the ectocervix is squamous. So, cervix is an organ in which we find both the linings, right? So, basically, let's talk about the endocervix first. Imagine the uterus is uh, connected with the pelvic cavity with the help of ligaments. Imagine if the tear, if there is a tear in the ligaments, what will happen? The uterus will prolapse. The uterus will prolapse like this. The uterus will prolapse. The uterus will prolapse like this. Now, this prolapse is acting as a stress for the endocervix. The prolapse is acting as a stress for what? Of course, for endocervix. Okay. Because of this stress, because of this stress, the endocervix which was columnar converted to squamous now. So, this is an example of squamous metaplasia. Finally, squamous is formed. See what is finally formed. Okay. Now, let's take the example of the ectocervix. In the ectocervix, during during reproductive age or during pregnancy, whenever there is increased estrogen and progesterone in the blood, that is acting as a stress. So, here the stressor is the hormone. Whenever there is increased estrogen and progesterone in the female blood during pregnancy or during reproductive age, during puberty, at that time, at that time, the ectocervix convert, the ectocervix which is normally squamous, from squamous it converted to columnar. So, ectocervix is an example of columnar epithelia. Say yes. So, the two things are in front of you. So, have you got it? So, the cervix is coming in both examples. So, can I say the endocervix is an example of squamous metaplasia in which columnar get converted to squamous? And can I say ectocervix is an example of columnar metaplasia in which the squamous get converted to columnar? Everyone give me a thumbs up. It was complicated but I try my best to give you the concept. Learn the stressor is different in both of them. Please try to learn the stressor. In case of endocervix, the stressor is the uterine prolapse, the uterus prolapse. In case of ectocervix, the stressor is the estrogen present in the blood. Try to, uh, you know, give me the thumbs up. Have you got it? So Please interact. It's an interactive session. It's a live session. It is not a recording you are watching. So, if you have any doubt, please ask. If you don't have any doubt, give me your gesture that you got it. How I, You can see me, but I cannot see you. In front of me, there is only one camera. So, I can see your comments only. Okay. So, the comment is the only way we can interact with each other. So, give me a thumbs up. You got it? Can you go ahead? So, that is regarding the metaplasia. So, till now, we have seen four adaptation. Hypertrophy, hyperplasia, atrophy, and metaplasia, the two types of the metaplasia, the columnar metaplasia, squamous metaplasia. We have seen the example, we have seen one common example of these three, the uterus. You know, during pregnancy, it's hypertrophy and hyperplasia. During parturition, it's atrophy in the uterus. And we have seen a common example of the two types of the metaplasia, that is cervix. In endocervix, in endocervix, squamous metaplasia takes place. And in ectocervix, it's columnar. Am I right? Am I right? Yes, I guess I am right. So, th this is what we have learned till now. 
let's continue the last one is the dysplasia and most important and difficult to understand most of the students have trouble in understanding what is dysplasia okay i will make it super easy for you what is dysplasia if you want to give the definition of dysplasia it's disordered development what is dysplasia it's disordered development it is a pre-malignant lesion you can ask me ma'am what do you mean by that okay so i will tell you seven features if these seven features are present in any cell that cell is known as dysplastic cell that is a pre-malignant cell so let me explain you the seven features in a diagram instead of you know reading and learning try to see them in the diagram try to see them in the diagram the seven features all seven i will show you in one diagram the one diagram is in front of you okay this is the diagram okay now see this one is the normal normal epithelia and this one is the dysplastic epithelia we will notice the changes between them the seven changes which are absent in normal and which are present in dysplasia so you will understand the definition of the dysplasia in this way okay listen now normally normally you can see this is the cell you can see these are the cells can you all see please have a look these all are cell okay this is the normal cell lining you can see actually it is a cell lining of the endocervix of the female it's a columnar lining now see during dysplasia what is happening the first thing you can see the number of the layers is increased here we can see one layer here we can see multiple layer so the first thing you can see the number of layers is increased in dysplasia on every point please appreciate that you got it the first point is increase in number of layers i guess everyone can notice here is one layer and here is multiple layer we all can see number two here you can see normally it's ordered arrangement they are back to back beautifully orderly with a pattern like orderly arrangement but here you can see haphazard they all are like haphazard haphazard so you can see the second point is disordered arrangement or haphazard arrangement so normally it's i'm sorry normally it's orderly arrangement and here it's disorderly arrangement that is the second point everyone can see in the same diagram the third point which is very important to understand is the loss of basal polarity what do you mean by basal polarity let me explain you let me explain the normal epithelia here normally this is the epithelium lining this is the basement membrane you can see this is normal i'm drawing not display dysplastic and this is the basement membrane this is the basement membrane where is the nucleus where is the nucleus of these cell the nucleus is not in the center normally the normally the nucleus is towards the basement membrane i'm saying towards the basement membrane mind my words i'm saying it is present towards the basement membrane it is known as basal polarity basal means basement membrane polarity means you know north pole south pole so it is pole base ka pole hai basal polarity it is present towards the basement membrane right basal polarity is present normally normally but see what is happening here um, in dysplasia let me draw dysplastic lining in dysplastic lining it's haphazard let me draw multiple layers not one layer let me draw they all are haphazard they all are disorderly arrangement this is dysplastic now where is the nucleus nucleus is away from the basement membrane it is not towards the basement membrane number one nucleus is enlarged in size and it is away it is dark it is condensed and it is away away from the basement membrane so can i say here the basal polarity is absent basal polarity is absent here so basically i want to say the loss of basal polarity takes place in dyspatia say yes loss of basal polarity basal polarity presence of basal polarity is a normal thing we all have this basal polarity in all our columnar epithelia it's normal but the loss of basal polarity is dysplasia so learn the third finding it's loss of basal polarity you can appreciate in this diagram also see the normal diagram all the nucleus towards the basement membrane but in the second diagram the nucleus is not towards the basement membrane it's away or haphazardly arranged got it the third point coming on the fourth point fourth point is pleomorphism pleomorphism uh, you can see all the cells normally they all are same size same shape normally they all are same size same shape that is they all are uniform but in dysplasia some are small some are moderate some are large so it is known as pleomorphism pleomorphism means variation in size of the cell all the cells are of different size so normally pleomorphism is absent but in dysplasia the pleomorphism is present can i say it yes the so pleomorphism the next is we will talk about three things of the nucleus okay see the size of the nucleus color of the nucleus and mitosis in the nucleus compare the three things in the nucleus back to back normally also in dysplasia also see the size of the nucleus in both the diagram can you appreciate here nucleus is small small okay we will talk about a ratio known as nc ratio 
nucleus in the numerator and cytoplasm in the denominator. The size of the nucleus in the numerator, the size of the cytoplasm in the denominator, this is known as NC ratio. Okay, see the NC ratio here and see the NC ratio here. Can you please appreciate what is increasing? Numerator, denominator, what is happening? So, see normally nucleus is small, cytoplasm is large. Appreciate, nucleus is small, cytoplasm is abundant, normally. So, numerator is small, denominator is more, normally. But see dysplasia, reverse is happening. Can you appreciate? The nucleus is big, cytoplasm is small. You know, so nucleus is increasing as compared to cytoplasm. So, basically, can I say in dysplasia, in dysplasia, NC ratio increases because numerator is increasing and denominator is decreasing. Can I say? So, overall NC ratio increases in dysplasia. So, here NC ratio is normal but here NC ratio increases because of increase in size of nucleus. Say yes if you got it. Do you have any problem in understanding or you got it the meaning of the NC ratio? NC ratio, the numerator is the size of the nucleus and the denominator is the size of the cytoplasm. Normally, nucleus is small, cytoplasm is more. But during dysplasia, the nucleus increases in size as compared to cytoplasm. So, if you compare, you can say NC ratio increases during dysplasia. Say yes, yes. Very good, Shalini. Very good, everyone. Can we go ahead? So, this is the NC ratio. The next is the color of the nucleus. You have seen the size. Now, let's appreciate the color of the nucleus. Here, nucleus is light color. And here the chromatin inside the nucleus become condensed. Because of condensation, the nucleus become dark color. What is color in pathology known as? The color in pathology known as chroma. The meaning, the dictionary meaning of chroma is color. So, color is increased in dysplasia, no? So, say hyperchromatism. Hyper, split the term. The meaning is in front of you. Hyper means more. Chroma means color. More color, dark color. Because the nucleus is condensed. So, say hyperchromatism is not a normal feature. Hyperchromatism is present in dysplasia. Okay. And last is mitotic activity. Normally, we cannot see the mitosis normally. But here, if you can appreciate, you can see the spindle formation in some of the cells. Some of the cells are dividing. Mitosis is a common feature of dysplasia. Can you appreciate the seven features? We are done with dysplasia. What are the seven features, please? Everyone with me? What are the seven features? See normal, see dysplasia. I appreciate the seven features. Yes? Here the number of layers are normal. Here the number of layers are increased. Say yes. The second, here see the arrangement. It's orderly arrangement. Here they are disorderly arrangement. The figures are in front of you. Please appreciate the changes. Don't learn. See in the image. The third is the basal polarity. Normally basal polarity is present. In dysplasia, it is absent. In dysplasia, it is absent. Right? Pleomorphism, normally it is absent. Hyperchromatism, normally it is absent. But in dysplasia, pleomorphism present, hyperchromatism present. NC ratio, normally it's normal, but in dysplasia it is increased. Mitosis, normally it's normal, but in dysplasia mitosis also increase. So, you learn the seven points, it's the definition of dysplasia. We are done with topic number one, cell adaptation. Everyone give me a thumbs up, we will solve some questions. Now, if you got the topic, I want you to answer the MCQs. Can we start the MCQs? Are you people ready? I will give you 20 seconds to answer each. You have to write your answer from ABCD in the comment, fast and accurate. You have to be fast, you have to be accurate. The first question is in front of you, give the answer. Both hypertrophy and hyperplasia are seen in. Four examples are breast enlargement during lactation, uterus during pregnancy, skeletal muscle during exercise and left ventricular hypertrophy during heart failure. So, what is the correct answer? A, B, C, D may say, what is the correct answer here? Can you please give me the correct answer? Very good. Arthur is first to give me the correct answer and rest all are also right. Very good. Very good. Yes, very good Osama. Very good. Absolutely right. You have enumerated the seven features. I appreciate it. Very good. Everyone, please everyone give me the answer. It's the easiest question I have asked you. Pregnant uterus is an example of both hypertrophy and hyperplasia. And instead of pregnant uterus, if I say the parturating uterus, parturating uterus, it is an example of atrophy. So, mind the words. Okay. So, yes, the correct answer is B and you all are right. Very good. The next question, transformation of one epithelia to another type of epithelia. What does it known as? Is it dysplasia? Is it hypertrophy? Is it neoplasia or is it metaplasia? What does it known as? Can you give me the answer? So, this is the definition of what? Yes. You all are right. Very good. Yes. Yes, very good. So, it is the definition of metaplasia. Very good. So, transformation of one type of cell to another type of cell. It is the definition of metaplasia. It is of two type. Either squamous to columnar or columnar to squamous. Okay. So, I have given you an example that is cervix. It is an example coming in both. The next question is in front of you. All are true about metaplasia except 
डोंट मिस द वर्ड एक्सेप्ट इज इट स्लो ग्रोइंग यस और नो रिवर्स बैक टू नॉर्मल विद अप्रोप्रिएट ट्रीटमेंट यस और नो इज इट इर रिवर्सिबल यस और नो इफ परसिस्ट इट कैन कन्वर्ट इन टू कैंसर यस और नो टेल मी द करेक्ट आंसर आई मीन टेल मी वॉट इज देयर इन द एक्सेप्ट ऑल आर ट्रू रिगार्डिंग मैटर प्लेशिया एक्सेप्ट Yes, what is the correct answer? You all are right. I told you all five adaptations are reversible. The definition of adaptation is reversible. Metaplasia is a type of adaptation, so it has to be reversible. It cannot be irreversible. So correct answer is C. The next question is in front of you about hyperplasia. Which of the following statement is false? Which of the following statement is false for hyperplasia? Is it increase in number of cell? Is it true or false? Increase in size of cell? Is it true or false? endometrial response to a estrogen is an example or all of the above what is the correct answer it's a tricky question don't get confused in the option it's very easy but tricky what is the correct answer hyperplasia plasia means number of the cell it's increase in number of the cell but not the size and yes endometrial response to the estrogen is an example so incorrect among them is b no 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 osama it's not a it's b okay incorrect among them is b they are asking the false statement not the true and they are asking about hyperplasia i told you don't get uh, confused in the trick okay coming on the next question it's very easy all of them are cellular adaptation except i told you there are five type of adaptation now so which of the following is not an adaptation hypertrophy hyperplasia necrosis metaplasia which of the following is not an example of cell adaptation can you tell me the answer can you please tell me the answer please yes what is the correct answer can you please tell me yes you all are right necrosis is not an example of adaptation it's a type of cell death rest all are the examples decrease in cell size is known as decrease in cell size decrease is it atrophy metaplasia hyperplasia or hypertrophy can you please give me the answer i guess super easy question decrease in size of the cell yes so there is a little bit lag if i ask and you give me the answer there is 10 second lag so i have to wait yes you all are right The correct answer here is of course a atrophy atrophy is decrease in size you all are right the correct answer is a let me change the question increase so correct answer here is atrophy in instead of decrease if i ask increase in size of the cell what is your answer now what is your answer now increase in size of the cell the size of the cell yes so what is the correct answer now if i change the question a little bit yes i'm waiting yes very good the correct answer here is d yes hypertrophy in that case and if i change the size to number increase in number of the cell what is the answer now in that case your answer will become c hyperplasia so you know so that is the thing so let's come on the next topic the ta two types of the cell death so i am going to cover two type of cell death now one is apoptosis one is necrosis so we will be covering two types of cell death one by one apoptosis and necrosis so why there are two type of cell death these two type of cell death the cell die by one of the method so you can compare apoptosis with the suicide and necrosis with the murder yes i will prove that in the end you will convince the apoptosis is suicide and the necrosis is like murder you know the two ways in both of them the person will die so here also the cell is dead but there are two ways the first point is that you may be thinking ma'am why there are two ways of the cell death i mean is there is a choice given to the cell you want to do suicide or you want to do the murder i mean why no nobody wants to die no the cell also do not want to the die so why there are two different type of the cell death i will explain you okay so let's start first with apoptosis see the details of the apoptosis then we will come on the necrosis then we will see the differences between them let's start with apoptosis the first point here the first thing we will discuss is the apoptosis in short if you ask me the definition of apoptosis it's cell suicide in short in short it's cell suicide number 1 learn the thing it's cell suicide okay now uh let me define it properly so if you want to learn the definition this is the definition you cannot understand it directly if i read let me show you a diagram then i will read the definition can you see a cell yes now the point is that my question is again why a cell want to do a suicide nobody wants to do a suicide i do not want to do suicide you do not want why a cell want to do a suicide there are two reason either this cell have performed its function in the body and it is no more required the function is already done and this cell is no more required in this in this human body in this world number 1 number 2 the cell dna the nucleus or the dna is damaged by some physical chemical or biological agent not dna not p53 will try to repair it first but the dna damage is too much and p53 is unable to repair it is beyond repair 
so in this way this is a cancerous cell now we do not want to keep it in the body it is abnormal cell it is a damaged cell so we will ask the cell to commit suicide because you are damaged the dna is damaged so these are the two reasons by, by because of which we will ask the cell to commit suicide yes the body will send the signal to this cell either the cell has already performed its function in human body and it is no more required or else its dna is damaged beyond repair in both of these situation we will ask the cell to commit suicide so whenever the cell get the signal that i have to commit the suicide at that point inside the cell there are enzymes the name of the enzyme is caspase please learn the name of the enzyme normally these enzymes are inactive it is present in all human cell the caspases are present in all our cell but they are inactive they are inactive whenever the cell get the signal that you have to commit suicide at that time the caspase present in the cytoplasm get activated once the caspase become activated what did, what they do inside the cell there are three things the cell have a nucleus you will say yes ma'am the cell have a nucleus the cell have a cell membrane and the cell have a cytoplasm three things are present in the cell so basically the caspase divide the entire cell into multiple small small apoptotic bodies each apoptotic body contain three things small small portion so nucleus get fragmented into multiple pieces each apoptotic body contain a small amount of nucleus each apoptotic body contain a small amount of cytoplasm and each apoptotic body contain a small amount of cell membrane and during this process when the entire cell you can see the entire cell get converted into multiple small small apoptotic bodies during this process there is no leakage during this process there is no leakage outside since there is no leakage there is no inflammation no leakage no inflammation is the hallmark of apoptosis which differentiate apoptosis from necrosis in necrosis there is leakage there is inflammation here leakage now that's why i'm comparing this the uh, apoptosis with suicide you know if someone want to commit suicide it will be done in silence you know it is done personally silence in a closed room it is not it, the person will take a loud speaker and shout everywhere i am committing suicide i am committing suicide it is done silently na so in this way here also the cell is committing suicide so silently the cell will convert into multiple apoptotic bodies there is no leakage there is no inflammation the inflammatory cell do not come to know that something is going wrong no it's silently right you know chup chap commit karega and in the end what will happen a phagocyte will come you know what is a phagocyte a phagocyte it will engulf all the apoptotic bodies and the cell disappear from the world disappear from the from the, from the from the human body say yes if you got it say yes if you got it okay yes it is required in organogenesis also shake yes so have you got it can we go ahead so this is the definition of apoptosis So what is apoptosis can you define now you will say ma'am apoptosis is a type of cell death yes it is one of the type of cell death there are two types of cell death apoptosis is one of them it is tightly regulated intracellular program during which the cell which is destined to die the cell which get the signal for death that cell activate an enzyme the name of the enzyme is caspase and caspase degrade the dna and the cytoplasm into multiple apoptotic bodies in the end the apoptotic bodies are phagocytosed during the entire process no leakage no inflammation highlight the negative findings this is the definition of apoptosis no need to learn just understand so apoptosis is a type of cell death in which the cell which is destined to die that will activate caspase the caspase convert the cell into multiple apoptotic bodies a phagocyte will come and engulf all the apoptotic bodies no leakage no inflammation give me a thumbs up got it this is the definition of apoptosis now you should ask me ma'am what is the mechanism in the mechanism there are two pathways in the apoptosis there are two pathways extrinsic and intrinsic what do you mean by extrinsic and intrinsic okay so this is the cell this is the nucleus of the cell the nucleus of the cell containing dna as i told you the signal the cell is receiving the signal to do the suicide from where the signal is coming can you tell me from where the signal is coming the signal can come from the outside or the signal can come from the inside only okay if the signal is coming from outside it's known as extrinsic pathway extrinsic matlab outside and if the signal is coming from inside it is known as intrinsic pathway intrinsic matlab inside say yes okay so this is the meaning now each of the pathway have two two phases so in extrinsic also in intrinsic also there is initiation there is execution there is initiation there is execution right so there are two two phases in each of the pathway extrinsic pathway and intrinsic pathway in each of them there are two two phases so we will understand the mechanism of apoptosis are you people with me can i tell you the ultra important topic the mechanism of apoptosis i will tell you like a movie story you know in a fun manner we will understand the entire complicated mechanism of apoptosis like this 
like this we will understand give me just three minutes in three minutes i will explain you the entire mechanism okay so i told you the meaning of the extrinsic and intrinsic the meaning of the extrinsic and intrinsic this is the cell this is the nucleus of the cell now this cell want to commit the suicide this cell want to commit the suicide now from where the signal is coming if the signal is coming from outside it's extrinsic pathway and if the signal is coming from inside it is known as intrinsic pathway okay now each of them having two two phases so first how what is the sequence i will teach you first i will let you know just a second first i will let you know the initiation phase of extrinsic pathway then i will let you know the initiation phase of intrinsic pathway and in the end i will tell you execution of both of them together because execution is common for for both of them so i am going to teach you three stories now the first story is the initiation of extrinsic the second story is the initiation of intrinsic the third story will connect the two stories together and it is the third story that is execution which is a common for both of them this is the sequence i will teach you like this say yes if you got it say yes can we go ahead can we go ahead yes so let's start so let's start with the extrinsic pathway initiation phase okay now can you see a cell all human body cell have receptors on their surface these are known as death receptor what does it known as death receptor there are two type of death receptor pas which is known as cd95 one and the same thing it is a name of receptor the pas receptor or cd95 receptor it's a type of death receptor and second is tnf tumor necrotic factor tnf so please appreciate the cell on the surface of the cell please appreciate the receptors can you appreciate these receptors this one this one these are death receptor it can be fast cd95 it can be tnf okay so these are the death receptor they are inactive currently they are inactive i'm really sorry i'm really sorry so these all are inactive these are the death receptor present on the surface of the cell now you can see here this is the signal this is the signal coming to the cell that this cell has to commit the suicide the signal is coming the signal is in the form of the ligand it is in the form of the ligand so this signal is coming from outside or inside you can see it is coming from outside that's why it is extrinsic pathway it is extrinsic pathway i'm teaching you now extrinsic pathway the signal is coming from outside so either the cell have performed its function it is no more required so the signal is coming whenever the signal is coming the ligand is coming the ligand will come so let me zoom so i'm zooming the diagram okay this ligand is coming and binding with the receptor one of the receptor so ligand is coming binding with one of the receptor you can see once it will bind with one of the receptor the receptor get activated once the receptor the death receptor the death receptor get activated multiple death receptor come closer now you can see a distance between them they are inactive there is a distance between them these are the death receptor cd95 receptor fast receptor one and the same thing pehle to yaad karo fast and cd5 is one and the same thing it's not different these are synonyms okay now once the ligand bind with the receptor multiple receptor come closer like this can you see multiple receptors coming closer like this and they are forming a domain it is known as death domain it is known as fast associated death domain fadd say fadd so it's not my mnemonic it is given in robins also fadd so fast associated death domain is formed right because of the formation of this domain what will happen now now in the cytoplasm caspases are present i told you na the main enzyme here are the caspases okay there are many type of caspases caspases number 1 2 3 4 5 because of the formation of fadd the first caspase which is activated is caspase number 8 the inactive caspase 8 converted into active caspase caspase 8 the story is over i will continue this is intermission of this story i will continue the story in execution phase this is the initiation phase you got it initiation phase the so same thing whatever i have drawn you in this sketch diagram the same is shown here so can you see the cell membrane so this is the cell membrane you can see can you see these are the receptors let me show you these are the death receptor okay on the death receptor this is the ligand the coming signal is coming and binding so multiple death receptor coming closer and because they are coming closer this is fadd formation because of fadd formation the caspase 8 converted into active form active caspase 8 is formed and that will lead to apoptosis i will let you know how it is so fast receptor fast ligand is coming binding with the fast receptor multiple fast receptor coming closer and fadd is formed fadd leads to conversion of pro caspase 8 to active caspase 8 sometime caspase 10 also get converted to active caspase 10 so learn to caspase 8 and 
they get converted from inactive to active form so this is over this is over i am leaving it to cash phase 8 and 10 activation what will happen after this i will continue here in execution phase but later on let me first tell you the initiation phase of intrinsic pathway also then i will tell you the two execution together say yes if you got it right so let me start you know you just learn the end point here i will continue later on let me tell you the initiation of intrinsic pathway intrinsic pathway intrinsic matlab what do you mean by intrinsic here the signal will come from inside the cell okay so here can you see a cell in front of you yes you all can see a cell inside the cell you can see the nucleus and inside the nucleus you can see the dna this is the dna it is intact till now there is no problem it's a healthy dna you can see the mitochondria the two membranes of the mitochondria the inner membrane the outer membrane between the two membranes of the mitochondria there is a protein known as cytochrome c so cytochrome c is present between the two membranes of the mitochondria Cytochrome C never comes in the cytoplasm. Once it comes in the cytoplasm, it will cause the apoptosis, right? Currently, it is present inside the two membranes of the mitochondria. This is normal. This is normal. Now, let me zoom it. Now, you should ask me, ma'am, you are saying cytochrome C is present between the two membranes of the mitochondria, but mitochondria have a door, na? the transit. This is the door. The door or the transit in the mitochondria. You should ask me, ma'am, why cytochrome C is not leaking out of this transit? Transit means darwaza, door, door ke jaisa. So why it is not coming out? Why? Because the three guards are present. The three guards are present. You know, they are like guards. They prevent the cytochrome C to come out. The name of the three guards is BCL2, BCLX and MCL1. So these are preventing the apoptosis. Since cytochrome C is not coming in the cytoplasm, they will not cause the apoptosis, right? So these three proteins are known as anti-apoptotic proteins. These three. The anti-apoptotic proteins prevent the cytochrome C from coming out normally in all of our cell. So currently in all of our cell, these three guards are preventing the cytochrome C to come out. But imagine the DNA is damaged. Now the DNA is damaged. So P53 will try to repair it, but it is beyond damage, beyond repair. P53 is unable to repair it. So this will give the signal to the mitochondria that I am gone. The nucleus is giving the signal to the mitochondria that I am gone, I am damaged, I cannot be repaired. Commit suicide, start suicide. Who is giving the signal? The nucleus. To whom it is giving? The nucleus is giving the signal to the mitochondria. So from where the signal is coming? Is it coming from outside? No, no, no. It is not coming from outside. The signal is coming from inside only. So that's why it's intrinsic pathway. Please appreciate. Intrinsic ka matlab, the signal is coming from inside only. So that basically the nucleus is giving the signal to the mitochondria. So nucleus is asking the mitochondria to start the suicide, to commit the suicide. How does the mitochondria will do so? The mitochondria will replace the three guard with four another guards that will open the door. These were the three guards that closes the door, that, that inhibit the transit. But it is replaced by another guard. The name of another guard is Bax, Bark, BIM, Ba. They are ultra important. They will open. They will open the transit and cytochrome C will leak out. They cause the apoptosis. So these were anti-apoptotic proteins. These are pro-apoptotic proteins. So basically on receiving the signal, the mitochondria are replacing the anti-apoptotic protein by pro-apoptotic protein. Please learn the example. Anti-apoptotic proteins are replaced by pro-apoptotic proteins. Anti-apoptotic proteins closes the door. They prevent apoptosis. And pro-apoptotic proteins open the door. They cause the leakage of cytochrome C. So anti is replaced by pro. You can see cytochrome C is coming out. Once cytochrome C come out, the first caspase it activates is caspase 9. So caspase 9 is the first caspase which is activated here. And caspase 8 and 10 were first caspase which were activated in extrinsic pathway. Here caspase 9 is activated, the story is over. The story is over. The story is over. Okay. So whenever the stimulus is given, the stimulus is the DNA damage. On DNA damage receiving the signal, the mitochondria replaces replaces the anti-apoptotic protein with pro-apoptotic protein. So basically the anti-apoptotic proteins are replaced by pro-apoptotic proteins on receiving the signal. The pro-apoptotic proteins open the door. So cytochrome C leaks out. After coming out, it activates caspase 9. Say yes if you got it. So we are done with this also. So till now I taught you the initiation of both of them. Can you tell me the end point? Here the end point was activation of caspase 8 and 10. Here the end point is activation of caspase 9. You will say ma'am what's ahead? Here the death receptors were required. Here mitochondria and cytochrome C was required. Okay. Now what's ahead? So let me tell you the execution phase of both of them together. The execution is common for both of them. So in execution phase which is a convergence point for both of them. In extrinsic pathway the first caspase activated is 8 and 10. And in intrinsic pathway the first caspase activated is caspase 9. 
So here caspase 8 and 10 and here caspase 9 activate the next caspase 3, 6, 7. And they caspase, activate all other caspase. And once all the caspases are activated, you know what happens. All the caspases will convert the cell into multiple apoptotic bodies. So multiple apoptotic bodies are formed. In the end, a phagocyte will come and phagocyte will engulf all the apoptotic bodies. The cell will disappear from the world. No leakage, no inflammation. This is the mechanism. Say yes if you got it. So I taught you the two mechanisms, the extrinsic pathway, the intrinsic pathway. In both of them, I taught you two, two phases, the initiation, the execution. Initiation is different in both of them, but execution is a common feature for both of them. I want all of you to appreciate that you got it. Kindly write down you got it or if you have any doubt, please ask it or give me a thumbs up. <laughs> Can we go ahead? Okay. So let me tell you the next thing. The next thing is the morphological changes on the apoptosis. There are seven morphological changes in apoptosis. You have to learn the sequence. During extrinsic or intrinsic whatever pathway, seven things takes place one by one. Let me tell you the seven features. Let me tell you the seven features of apoptosis. Can you see a normal cell? This is a normal cell. Now this cell is receiving the signal either from outside or from inside that it has to commit the suicide. Right. So it is starting the suicide. So the first thing happens is cell shrinkage. Please appreciate cell shrinkage. The first thing, the cell reduces in size. It's a very important question. The earliest feature of apoptosis is cell shrinkage. Repeatedly ask PYQ. Okay. You can see the cell is decreasing in size. After that, you know, in, inside the cell, what is present in the cytoplasm? You will see my mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, ribosomes, multiple cell organelles are present. If the cell reduces in size, the multiple cell organelle, they will come closer, closer, closer. Because the multiple cell organelle coming closer, the cell cytoplasm become more pink in color. Can you see the cytoplasm become more pink in color? It is known as eosinophilia. So second thing is eosinophilia because of the shrinkage. So say the first thing is the shrinkage and second thing is eosinophilia. Learn the sequence. The sequence of the seven is important. The earliest is the cell shrinkage and you can imagine the cell is shrinking. So the cell organelles are coming closer. So cytoplasm looks more pink. It's known as eosinophilia. Okay. After that coming on the nucleus. See the nucleus become more compact. The nucleus become more compact, more dense. It is known as pycnosis. Pycnosis is compactness of the nucleus. After that, the nucleus, nucleus uh, fragmented into multiple pieces. The conversion of the one nucleus into multiple pieces, it is known as carrier axis. Pycnosis and carrier axis takes place in the nucleus. First, it gets condensed, then it gets fragmented. So that is the third feature. The two we will take together, the nuclear feature. So first is shrinkage, then eosinophilia, and then nuclear feature that is pycnosis and carrier axis. After that on the cell surface, multiple blabs are formed. Multiple blabs are formed because of the cell injury. The fourth feature is the blab formation. Right. Now caspases are activated. If it is extrinsic pathway, caspase 8 is activated. If it is intrinsic pathway, caspase 9 is activated. And now in execution phase, all the caspases are activated. Caspases convert the cell into multiple apoptotic bodies. So apoptotic body formation is the fifth feature. In the end, a phagocyte will come and engulf all the apoptotic bodies. That is the sixth feature. Can you please enumerate Mirza, Nikhil, Jewel, Sheikh, Sachin, Shalini, everyone. I cannot read all the names. So can you tell me the six features, the sequence of the apoptosis, please? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six sequence. Yes. The first thing is, yes, the cell shrinkage. Very good. It's shrinkage. Now, this is a very important feature, the earliest feature that differentiates apoptosis from necrosis. In necrosis, the cell swells. Here, the cell is shrinking. Okay, cell shrinkage is there. The second is the eosinophilia. Eosinophilia is due to compactness, due to the multiple cell organelles are coming closer. Okay, that is eosinophilia. The cytoplasm looks more pink. What is the third feature? The nuclear feature. The two nuclear features. Nuclear features. Nuclear become compact and it become fragmented. Compactness is known as pycnosis. And fragmentation is known as karyoraxis. Okay, that is the third feature. After that, blabs are formed on the surface. Then apoptotic bodies are formed. And in the end, phagocytosis takes place. Say yes. So these are the six features. These are the six features. Now let me ask you two questions here. Two questions, two answers. Who will answer the two questions? The first, tell me the earliest feature. Of course, everyone can see. Earliest feature of apoptosis. It's a PYQ. And tell me the characteristic Characteristic feature of apoptosis. Two different questions, two different answers. Don't get confused. What is the earliest feature? What is the earliest feature? Very good, Osama. Very good. Very good, uh, Saya. 
Yes, very good. You have enumerated all the six features very correctly. Yes, the earliest feature is the cell shrinkage. Everyone knows, everyone knows. It is visible. But what is the characteristic feature? I mean to ask the characteristic or the pathognomatic pathognomatic feature, the characteristic or the pathognomatic. It's nuclear features, the pycnosis and carrier axis. So read your question very, very carefully in your exam. What they are asking? If they are asking earliest feature of apoptosis, go what? Go with cell shrinkage. If they are asking characteristic or pathognomatic or specific feature, go with the nuclear feature, pycnotic and carrier axis. So please read your question very carefully. Can we go ahead? Yes, yes. So you can see the same thing. Cell shrinkage is the earliest feature. Can you see in this diagram, this cell which is marked with arrow. This cell which is marked with arrow, I have highlighted the cell with blue color. It is smaller than rest of the cell. See this cell. It is smaller than rest of the cell. It is more pink than rest of the cell. See this cell. It is smaller as well as more pink than rest of the cell. So cell shrinkage is also visible and cell eosinophilia is also visible. Pycnosis you can see. See the cell, see the nucleus. See the nucleus, it get condensed. Condensation is known as pycnosis. And fragmentation into multiple pieces is known as carrier axis. That is the most specific or pathognomatic feature. Pathognomatic feature. See the blab formation. Appreciate the blab formation. See normal cell, see apoptotic cell. In electron microscopy, you can appreciate the blabs are formed. So multiple blabs are formed on the surface. Okay. After that, multiple apoptotic bodies are formed. Phagocytosis, yes. No leakage, no inflammation is the hallmark. The last thing in the apoptosis, tell me the diagnosis of apoptosis. How to diagnose the apoptosis? Tell me two features. How we can do the diagnosis of apoptosis? Tell me two features. Two. Two features. There is a marker for apoptosis. Just suppose I am giving you this slide and I am asking you, can you identify apoptotic cell? You will say, ma'am, the cell which is smaller, the cell which is pink, the cell in which the nucleus is condensed, that cell is apoptotic cell. But still you have confusion. Ma'am, this is looking like others only. I am not very much trained to pick it up. So the marker is available in the market. Don't worry. The name of the marker is Anexin 5. Anexin 5 is the name of marker. It's a liquid brown color liquid. Spread it on the slide. Spread it, leave it for some time, wash it. Only apoptotic cell will pick the marker. It will become brown color and it will be highlighted. Other cell will not pick that marker. Say yes. So what is the name of the marker? It's very important PYQ, Anexin 5. You should ask me a question, ma'am. Why Anexin 5 is picked only by the apoptotic cell, not by other cell? What is the principle behind that? Please ask the questions. Huh? More and more questions arise in your mind. Huh? More, uh, you know, uh, retention power you will have. Okay. So, apoptotic marker and exon 5 is there. That is highlighting the apoptotic cell. But why? The question is why? Let me draw a diagram for you. This is a normal cell. Okay. And this is an apoptotic cell with the blab formation. It is converting into apoptotic cell. Normal cell have a protein, a phospholipid, which is present on the inner surface of the cell membrane. The name of that phospholipid is phosphodidylserin. During apoptosis, during apoptosis, there is flip flap. I'm using the word flip, flip flap, flip flap, during which the phosphodidylserin is coming on the outer surface. The phosphodidylserin is coming on the outer surface. Now, anexin 5 bind with phosphodidylserin. So, it will not bind with the normal cell. It will bind only with the apoptotic cell. So, the answer is phosphodidylserin. Say yes. Phosphodidylserin is the answer. Phosphodidylserin. You can see it is present normally on the inner surface. This is a normal cell. And during apoptosis, there is a flip flap. During this flip flap, it is coming on the outer surface. That's why anexin 5 is not binding here. It is binding here. This is the first way. The second way of the diagnosis of apoptosis is agarose gel electrophoresis. Do you know what is electrophoresis? Okay. Let me draw a normal cell. Let me draw apoptotic cell. See the nucleus. This is the nucleus of the normal cell. And this is the nucleus of, of the apoptotic cell. Am I right? Have I drawn it rightly, correctly? You will say yes ma'am. Because in apoptosis, the nucleus undergo fragmentation. Which is known as karyoraxis. We know that, right? So if I do the electrophoresis here in this. So let's do the electrophoresis. So here the DNA is continuous, right? We will get one band. The DNA is continuous. But here the DNA is like this. We will get multiple bands. You know, so on electrophoresis, we can identify whether the DNA is continuous single band or it is multiple band. The multiple band DNA, it is looking like a step ladder, CD, CD. It is known as step ladder appearance. Step, it's a PYQ, step ladder appearance. It is, yes, very good. Andhra, very good. It is the step ladder appearance. So this is the step ladder appearance. The fragmentation of the nucleus is caused by 
an enzyme endonuclease you can see here it's continuous here it's continuous or it is discontinuous also so big big pieces are there normally but here small small pieces it is looking like a step ladder so this is apoptotic cell these all are normal cell say yes you got it so we are done with apoptosis everyone give me a thumbs up everyone do you have any doubt till now can i tell you the differences between apoptosis and necrosis the differences between apoptosis and necrosis please consider apoptosis as suicide and I'm going to teach you the next topic, necrosis, it's like murder. Okay, apoptosis takes place of a single cell. Necrosis takes place of a group of cell. If someone is committing suicide, he will do alone. Nah, suicide is done alone. It is not the complete uh, town is doing the suicide or complete family is doing the suicide, right? You can consider like that just for learning. Apoptosis, single cell. But murder can be done of multiple persons at one time. Okay, so here the necrosis, like murder, it is a group of cell. Here cells shrink. Here cells swell. So here cells shrink in size, here cells swell in size, right? Here nuclear features are both uh, common in both of them. Here also pycnosis carrier axis, here also pycnosis and carrier axis. But here cell membrane is intact. So no inflammation, no leakage. Here cell membrane disrupts, the cell burst, right? So inflammation is present, leakage is present. Here inflammation and leakage are absent. So please learn, please learn the differences between them like this. We will solve some MCQs on apoptosis and moves on the ne next topic very quickly, uh, necrosis. So you have to be fast, you have to give me the answer. What is the correct answer here? Please tell me. CD95 is a marker of, is it intrinsic pathway, extrinsic pathway, monocyte or leukocyte? CD95. Just now I told you. Okay. Let me give you a clue. CD95 is the other name of the FAST. FAST receptor or FAST ligand. So what is the correct answer now? CD95 is a marker of? Yes, yes, very good, very good. CD95, FAS or uh, TNF, these are the death receptor which are, which are present in extrinsic pathway, not in intrinsic pathway and you all are right. Very good, very correct, very intelligent, very good. The next question, the following is an example of anti-apoptotic proteins. I told you three anti-apoptotic proteins and four pro-apoptotic proteins. I told you during intrinsic pathway. So is it Barks, Bath, BCLX or BIM? What is the correct answer here? Yes. So I told you anti-apoptotic proteins are the proteins which uh, closes the door and pro-apoptotic opens the door. Okay. Here I told you three examples BCLX, BCL2 and MCL. And here I told you four examples Barks, Bath, BIM, Bark. Okay, yes, you all are right. The correct answer is BCLX here. Okay, the remaining three are from pro-apoptotic proteins. It is a very important MCQ. The next everyone knows, earliest change in apoptosis. I guess everyone knows the answer. Earliest change in apoptosis, earliest. So is it cell shrinkage, pycnosis, formation of apoptotic bodies or fragmentation of the cell? What is the correct answer? I'm asking the earliest, mind my words. Earliest feature of apoptosis. What is the correct answer? Yes, I'm waiting. So there are two different questions. Earliest is different and most specific and characteristic or pathognomatic is different. You all are right. The earliest is the cell shrinkage. But if I change the question from the earliest to the pathognomatic, what is your answer now? Pathognomatic feature or specific feature. In that case, your answer will become B. Pycnosis. Right. In that case, pycnosis and carrier access is the answer. Coming on the next question. The last question. All of the following are the features of apoptosis except. I am using the word except. Can you tell me the answer? Cell swelling. Is it feature yes or no? Nucleus become compact yes or no? Cell membrane is intact yes or no? And cytoplasmic eosinophilia takes place yes or no? So what do not take place? You have to tell me what do not take place. I am using the word except. What is the correct answer? Yes, very good. The correct answer here very good is A. Cell swelling. Swelling takes place in necrosis, never in apoptosis. Right. The next question I should not ask. Anexin 5 is a marker of. I guess each and every one of you know the answer. Is it apoptosis, necrosis, atherosclerosis, inflammation? Now the question looking very simple to you because just now I taught you the apoptosis and putting this question. But once you finish all 19 subjects now, the same question looks difficult to you. So please learn an exam 5 is a marker of apoptosis. It's a repeatedly asked question. So we are done with apoptosis coming on the next necrosis. Okay, necrosis is another type of cell death that is the murder. We are done with apoptosis. Now I'm coming on necrosis. So chapter 1 will be done. Then we will move on the next chapter that is inflammation. Can I start? Are you people there? So let's start with necrosis. Let's start with necrosis. What is necrosis? The so necrosis is also a type of cell death but here the cell will undergo bursting and the cytoplasmic leakage is there because of which inflammation is present. Inflammation is present. So basically there are five types of necrosis I am going to teach you now. The differences between them. 
कॉर्ग्यूटिव लिक्विफैक्टिव केशियस फैट फिब्रिनॉइड द लिक्विफैक्टिव ऑल्सो नोन एज कॉलीकेटिव कॉली केटिव सो यू कैन लर्न अ निमोनिक ट्रिपल सी डबल एफ द फाइव टाइप ऑफ नेक्रोसिस वॉट आर द फाइव टाइप ऑफ नेक्रोसिस देर आर फाइव टाइप ऑफ नेक्रोसिस वॉट आर द फाइव टाइप ऑफ नेक्रोसिस ट्रिपल सी एंड डबल एफ द फाइव टाइप ऑफ नेक्रोसिस कॉर्गुलेटिव कॉलीकेटिव केशियस फैट एंड फिब्रिनॉइड द फाइव टाइप ऑफ नेक्रोसिस तो बेसिकली ऑल ऑफ दैम आर सेल डेथ ओके ऑल ऑफ दैम आर मर्डर okay in all of them the inflammation is present okay then you will ask them why there are of five types come on they all are cell death na so how death can be of five types yes there can be five different type of death in all of them the cell is bursting the cytoplasm is leaking out the inflammation is present in all of them but still there is some 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 minute differences between them i want to highlight those differences to understand you the differences between the five types give me a thumbs up give me a thumbs up you got it you got it so let me explain you the five different types I want all my dear students to make this comparative table with me. Otherwise, I am providing the notes anyways. If you don't make, it's good. But if you make it now, it will it will fit in your permanent memory. Okay. So I request you to make this table in which in the introduction write down the definition of all five necrosis, then causes, gross, and microscopy. Draw the microscopy. So you will never do a wrong question on necrosis. Okay. So let's start with the first one. Coagulate before that. before coming on the uh, five type of necrosis let me tell you something can you see a cell in front of your screen yes you all can see a cell in front of your screen you can see a cell the cell have a particular shape the shape of the cell is known as architecture architecture or the outline it is the shape of the cell the shape of the cell is known as architecture inside the cell cytoplasm is present now see the color of the cytoplasm see the amount of the cytoplasm is it scanty or abundant see the granularity whether the granules are present or absent right and see the nucleus the nucleus see the location is it central or eccentric see the color is it dense or see its uh, composition so based on the three detail you can identify a cell how many types of cell present in human body you will see ma'am we have hundreds or thousands type of the cell few of them are in front of your screen So can you identify the different type of cells? You will say yes, ma'am. We can identify is it a muscle cell, stem cell, intestine cell, liver cell, blood cell. We can identify. You can identify any cell because of the three feature. See their architecture. I mean shape. See their cytoplasmic color. See their nucleus. Based on that, you can identify what type of cell is it. So if you want to identify any cell of human body, there are many cells, na? You have to see for three details. You have to look for architectural detail. cytoplasmic detail and nuclear detail by architecture i mean the outline or the shape of the cell give me a thumbs up got it right so please appreciate go on appreciating that you got it okay so this is the thing now let's start the necrosis the first type of the necrosis i am starting is coagulative necrosis in coagulative necrosis uh now necrosis takes place of a group of cell can you see here a group of four cell all of them are alive see the four cells not four i mean they are multiple cell they are alive see their three details see their outline see their shape see their cytoplasm see their uh, nucleus okay and see they undergo dead they are coagulative now so you will say ma'am what two things are changing here cytoplasm is changed okay you can see the cytoplasm is changed okay you can see the nucleus is also become pycnotic and carrier excess or it disappears the nucleus is also changed the only thing which is same here also is the shape the shape is still same right so in coagulative necrosis the architectural details are maintained but cytoplasmic and nuclear details are lost this is the definition of coagulative necrosis no one will teach you with such a simplicity in such a short duration of time the coagulative necrosis how will you define it you will say ma'am the architectural details are maintained but cytoplasmic and nuclear details are lost such a necrosis is known as coagulative necrosis say yes got it got it this is the most common type of necrosis among the five among the five this one is the most common write down the definition here in the introduction architecture present but cytoplasmic and nuclear details are lost i will tell you the differences between the five okay so okay so here architectural outline persist but the cytoplasmic nuclear details are lost it is known as coagulative necrosis since out of the three detail at least one of them is still present it is still present we can identify the cell abhi bhi tum identify kar sakte ho ye kaun sa cell hai because at least shape you can see na you cannot see the cytoplasm not the nucleus but at least the shape you can see have you seen a ghost bhoot hindi mein kahen to ise kehte hain bhoot ghost have you seen i have never seen okay but the ghost have only outline 
it doesn't have inner detail so can i say the cells in the coagulated necrosis can i compare the cells in the uh, coagulated necrosis with the ghost because ghosts also have outline only no inner detail or else have you seen a tombstone what is a tombstone it is a stone which is present over the graveyard okay so it is also having only outline no inner detail no inner detail so can i compare the cell in coagulative necrosis with ghost and tombstone yes both of them the meaning is same only outline persists i want to highlight the thing the outline persists and the cytoplasmic and nuclear details are lost but the outline persists ha na that's why the cells known as ghost cell or tombstone cell say yes the ghost cell or tombstone cell learn this terminology okay so that is the coagulative necrosis definition coming on the causes you know human body from head to toe we are supplied with blood each and every organ have blood supply what happens if any organ or any cell do not get the blood you will say ma'am that organ will die because of the necrosis so which necrosis takes place because of ischemia it's the coagulative necrosis so in any organ of human body if blood supply is not there if there is ischemia ischemia means no blood supply that organ will die the cells of that organ will die because of coagulative necrosis except brain learn the exception that's brain so ischemia in all organs leads to coagulative necrosis but ischemia in brain leads to liquefactive necrosis the second type liquefactive necrosis okay the second uh, uh, the ischemia in brain leads to liquefactive necrosis if you have burns on anywhere just suppose i am having a small burn here or multiple burns are there in burns the cell of that portion undergo died because of coagulative necrosis and zanker's degeneration is also an example please learn glossy the organ is pale form microscopically all the cells look tombstone tombstone or ghost appearance now compare in this diagram you can see a kidney here you can see a kidney here you can see this is normal kidney and you can see this is coagulative necrotic kidney compare and at the junction you can see the inflammation let me show you you can see the junction it contains the inflammatory cell it contains the lymphocyte so in all necrosis inflammation is a hallmark inflammation is present at the junction now see the cells here see the cells here compare the cells so you can see ma'am the outline is exactly same you can see the outline is exactly same these are the cells now outline is same but the cytoplasmic and nuclear details are lost but outline is same so the cells are looking like tombstone or ghost so this is the diagram can we go ahead can we go ahead uh, andhra brain is not sp uh, spared i am saying in ischemia of the brain it's liquefactive necrosis not the coagulative one because brains have multiple hydrolytic enzyme in which the liquefactive necrosis will take place i mean to say the entire necrotic tissue will convert it into a gel like material which is liquefied i am coming on the second one after that you will understand your point can we go ahead yes 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 mohit absolutely right okay the so second type is the liquefactive also known as colligative necrosis uh why it is known as liquefactive because after necrosis the necrotic tissue is semi fluid like a gel like a gel jelly gel that's why it is known as liquefactive it's looking like liquid so what is the difference see here a group of alive cell can you see the architecture you will say yes can you see the cytoplasm can you see the nucleus yes but when it undergo necrosis everything disappear architecture detail is lost cytoplasmic is lost nuclear is also lost so all three details are lost in contrast to coagulative necrosis where at least architecture was maintained cytoplasmic nuclear details were lost there also but at least architecture was maintained there but here architecture is also lost and the cell are converted a group of cell converted into a gel like material liquid material that's why known as liquefactive necrosis say yes so here the architecture is maintained that's why known as ghost cell or tombstone cell here the group of cell get converted into a liquid a gel like material that's why known as liquefactive see the two diagrams see the contrast between them appreciate appreciate it and if you have appreciated let me know okay okay so here the architecture cytoplasmic nuclear all three details are lost that is liquefactive necrosis okay causes one of the cause you already know it's ischemia of the brain ischemia of all organ it's coagulative but ischemia of brain is liquefactive okay and if you have pyogenic pus forming bacterial infection in any body any body organ so it also leads to liquefactive necrosis grossly you can see this is the brain this is a diagram of brain intentionally i put a diagram of brain to learn you that in brain there is liquefactive necrosis see the cavity formation and inside the cavity appreciate the gel the liquid it's liquefactive necrosis right microscopically this is the diagram again a diagram of the brain okay let me show you this is a normal brain this side it's normal okay and this side it's liquefactive necrosis and appreciate the junction at the junction it is all inflammation 
inflammation with granulation tissue it's all inflammation junction is inflammation there is nothing in that compare the normal with the necrotic site okay let me show you normally i can see the neurons see the outline see the cytoplasm see the nucleus i can see all three details right but see when it converted to necrotic tissue i can see nothing what i can see is dot 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 dot, dot. this is all liquid material so neither architecture nor cytoplasm nor uh, nuclear details say yes appreciate the diagram okay this is liquefactive necrosis the third one is the caseous necrosis you know the word caseous it's a greek word it means cheese you like cheese i love cheese you know i like cheese so see this is cheese it's looking why it is known as caseous necrosis because grossly it looks like cheese how does the cheese look you will see ma'am the cheese is white or yellow in color it's granular in appearance granular i'm using the word granular it's dry dry granular white cheese it is cottage cheese the necrosis looks like that okay that's why it is known as caseous necrosis right what is the definition now so this is the meaning because it is looking like cheese what is the definition now see the three type of see the three type of necrosis in front of you so in caseous necrosis here the architecture cytoplasmic nuclear all three details are lost so you will see ma'am the same three details were lost in liquefactive also then what is the difference between liquefactive and caseous you are saying here also all three details are lost so the difference is that here in liquefactive all three details are lost and the group of cell converted into a gel or liquid like material here the group of cell converted into granular debris solid granular debris not liquid solid granular debris like cheese you know so that is the difference and in um, a coagulative you know the architecture is maintained but the cytoplasmic and nuclear details are lost that's why giving a ghost or tombstone appearance see the three things in front of you see appreciate my hard efforts behind all this you can appreciate the alive cell have all three details architecture cytoplasmic and nuclear now you have to see which details are lost and accordingly you can decide the type of the necrosis appreciate appreciate it yes yes can you can you got it do you got it give me a thumbs up if you got it the three type of the necrosis no one will teach you with such a super simplicity the three type of necrosis define them coagulative necrosis liquefactive necrosis caseous necrosis have you understood the differences between them now can i come on the examples of the caseous in the caseous there are two bacteria two fungus so the two bacteria are tb and syphilis and the two fungus is histoplasma and coccidiomycosis so learn the two bacteria learn the two fungus the four causes the four causes of the liquefactive necrosis right uh, caseous necrosis grossly it looks like cheese i told you it looks like cheese and microscopically this is the diagram it is a diagram of the lymph node you all can see a diagram of the lymph node in which you can see this is the normal lymph node this section is normal in all the necrosis one is normal one is necrotic tissue this is necrotic tissue and at the junction you can appreciate the inflammation at the junction please appreciate the inflammation this is the inflammation at the junction right at the junction i'm not interested in inflammation but here the inflammation is a special inflammation it's chronic granulomatous inflammation i can see the giant cells okay epithelioid cells so inflammation is special it's granulomatous inflammation and see the normal cell the normal cells they have this architecture these are the lymphocytes you can see the shape size you can see the cytoplasm nucleus but here you can see nothing a pink color material the debris the granular material this is caseous necrosis it is looking like cheese the dry the granular say yes at least appreciate yaar come on interact got it or didn't got it so that is the third type coming on the fourth type the fourth type is the fat necrosis it's a special necrosis which occurs in fat rich location in human body tell me three fat rich location in human body fat rich location in human body three location number one female breast the female breast have abundant of uh, female breast have abundant of fat number one number two pancreas okay and number three mesentery number three mesentery okay these are the three fat rich locations so they contain they all contain adipocytes they all contain adipocytes adipocytes are the fat cell so death of adipocyte is known as fat necrosis so basically fat necrosis takes place in three organs right female breast have trauma pancreas have inflammation mesentery have inflammation these are the causes because of which the adipocyte undergo death leading to fat necrosis so basically fat necrosis is death of the adipose cell the three causes i told you female breast pancreatitis and mesentery inflammation because of which grossly it looks like chalky white can you see chalky white due to saponification 
you can see the chalky white deposits or yellowish deposits grossly and microscopically it is having a cloudy appearance take the word cloudy cloudy yani badal ke jaisa can you see cloudy appreciate the cloudiness i want to highlight the cloudiness if you are getting the word cloudy in your question they are talking about fat necrosis because they contain fat na the fat is cloudy in appearance right so that is cloudiness that's it the last one is the fibrinoid the last one is the fibrinoid necrosis okay fibrinoid necrosis it is a special type of necrosis takes place in the wall of the blood vessel you know blood vessel have three layers the innermost is the intima the middle layer is the media and the outermost is the external these are the three layers in the media in the media uh, a, a pink color ribbon like material is formed let me show you the diagram can you see this it is a wall of the blood vessel see the innermost layer this one this one is the lumen containing the blood it is intima and this is all media in the media i can see the inflammation along with the inflammation i can see a pink color material a ribbon like a ribbon like eosinophilic structureless material it is fibrinoid necrosis the fibrinoid necrosis takes place in the wall of the blood vessel due to vasculitis due to vasculitis that's it nothing important we are done we are done with the five type of the necrosis the master table is in front of you if you have understood it correctly and completely you can revise the necrosis hardly in 2 minutes with this table can you please revise with me everyone everyone can you please revise with me the first thing is to learn the name of the five type of necrosis so the mnemonic is triple c double f there are five type of necrosis the first one is the coagulative the second is the colligative colligative also known as liquefactive the third is the caseous then fat then fibrinoid the five type of necrosis tell me the definition come on everyone tell me the definition so in coagulative the architecture is maintained but cytoplasmic and nuclear details are lost that's why it is known as ghost or tombstone appearance in liquefactive all three details are lost here also in caseous all three details are lost but in liquefactive it's gel like formation in in caseous it's the debris granular formation the fat necrosis takes place at fat rich location you know the three fat rich location the female breast pancreas and omentum or mesentery one and the same thing and fibrinoid necrosis takes place in the wall of the blood vessel so first learn the definition unka matlab kya hota hai first learn that then learn the examples so ischemia of all organ except brain is coagulative necrosis ischemia of brain with pyogenic infection is liquefactive necrosis caseous you know the bacteria and parasites fat and fibrinoid i told you gross is not important and microscopy i have given you i had given you the diagram for all of them so in all of them on one side there was normal on one side there was necrotic tissue and at the junction there was inflammation can we go ahead can you solve the mcqs now are you ready for solving the mcqs can we solve it right now are you people ready if you people ready ready give me a thumbs up you have to be fast huh very fast you have to match your speed with me are you are you ready can we start okay So this is the first question in front of you. We are done with necrosis also. Necrosis with cell, the uh, cell body is retained as ghost cell. It is seen in which necrosis? Coagulative necrosis, liquefactive necrosis, caseous necrosis, or none? What is the correct answer? Yes. So I am asking about the ghost cell. or tombstone appearance i told you in which type of cell this is seen the type of necrosis in which the architecture is ma maintained but the inner details cytoplasmic and nuclear details are lost so yes the correct answer here is the coagulative necrosis you all are right i guess everyone is right the correct answer is coagulative necrosis very good the next question is in front of you all of the following organs likely to undergo coagulative necrosis except very repeatedly asked question tell me one organ in which never never coagulative necrosis takes place is it spleen is it heart is it kidney or is it brain yes what is the correct answer so i told you one exception ischemia of all organs except one in which coagulative necrosis never take place but liquefactive necrosis take place yes brain is the exception in brain coagulative necrosis never take place can we go ahead yes so we are done with chapter number 1 we are done with chapter number 1 let's start chapter number 2 the inflammation are you people ready can i start now chapter number 2 inflammation i will teach you acute inflammation all the events chronic inflammation all the events so let me finish acute and chronic inflammation maybe in another 45 minutes i guess or one hour after that we will take a small break 15 20 minutes break so it's a marathon i'm going to teach you con con uh, you know continuously for 7 8 hours uh, there, there will be not much breaks okay so let's start the next section uh, just a second the inflammation 
okay so first let me start with acute inflammation then i will be coming on chronic inflammation before starting the inflammation you should understand what is inflammation hota kya inflammation ka matlab what is inflammation you know there are four types of microbes can enter human body bacteria virus fungus and parasite and they all after entering human body what does they cause they cause the ill effects they cause the ill effects i mean they cause the disease they cause a disease but human body do not want to have disease so body have a defense mechanism for them body do not want it body want to defense the the ill effects caused by them and that defense mechanism is known as inflammation so can what is inflammation inflammation is the body's defense mechanism infection is the harmful effect caused by the microbes and inflammation is the protective response against them so inflammation is useful for us that is the meaning of inflammation so you can understand inflammation is the defense mechanism for anything which is foreign for human body it can be bacteria virus fungus or parasite you can learn like every country have a army na no? every country india also have a army every country have a army so army is the defense for that country right so whenever any foreign terrorist harmful foreign like the terrorist enters the human territory uh, enters the country's territory the army get activated so there is a fight between the army and the terrorist who wins depending on who wins what is the result if the army wins that is wbc wins it is inflammation and if the terrorist wins i mean the bacteria win it's the infection so in our body infection or inflammation what is taking place that will result decide the fact give me a thumbs up you got it you got it what is inflammation so there are two type of inflammation the acute inflammation and the chronic inflammation acute inflammation take the example of tonsillitis take the example of tonsillitis chronic inflammation take the example of tb okay both of them are caused by bacteria tonsillitis is caused by bacteria streptococcus pyrogens tb is also caused by bacteria mycobacterium tuberculosis both of them are caused by bacteria so here as soon as do you have tonsillitis of course i guess everyone have tonsillitis till now so from childhood we have multiple episodes of tonsillitis now we are aware what is tonsillitis so as soon as bacteria enters inside human body within few hours the symptoms appear so onset is very fast here but in tb the bacteria enters the lung remain there for years or months and when the immunity drops then the patient have symptoms so your onset is very slow once the person have tonsillitis it will reside and it will you know the person will become normal in 7 days whether he takes treatment or do not takes the treatment but tb lasts for 1 year 2 year 6 month so here duration is short duration is long okay so here onset is fast here onset is late here duration is short here duration is long here edema is always present here granuloma is also always present here the hallmark feature is edema here the hallmark feature is granuloma here main cells are neutrophils here main cells are uh, macrocytes or monocytes give me a minute okay so please learn the differences between acute and chronic understand the example now for acute there are five cardinal sign acute inflammation takes place from head to toe at any part of body acute inflammation can take place in any part of body from head to toe acute inflammation can take place in any organ whenever acute inflammation takes place five things happens one by one the five things always happen one by one okay example i will always tell you tonsillitis to learn the example of tonsillitis because we can understand it better right not only in tonsillitis in all organs acute inflammation these five things takes place these are known as the cardinal signs so that organ turns red in color you can see the tonsils become red in color that organ temperature is more as compared to surrounding temperature that is increased local temperature that organ swells up you can see the swelling the organ swells up in that organ there is pain there is pain in that organ we have tonsillitis we have pain okay and there is temporary loss of function of that particular organ temporary okay so that is the five sign you don't have to learn the five signs in uh, english language i taught you in english na do you know latin i don't know latin but in the exam you have to learn these five cardinal signs in latin language it's a important mcq so redness in latin language is known as rubor increased temperature in latin language known as calor have you heard the calorimeter instrument calor the instrument used to measure the heat calor okay then swelling is known as tumor don't get confused okay don't get confused tumor is not english it is not cancer tumor i am asking tumor in latin language in latin the tumor is the swelling pain is known as dolor and loss of function is known as functiolasia so please enumerate the five features rubor calor tumor dolor functiolasia rubor calor tumor dolor functiolasia so rubor means redness calor means increased temperature tumor means swelling dolor means pain and functiolasia means 
temporary loss of function so please learn the five cardinal signs of acute inflammation it's very important mcq let's start acute inflammation okay in acute inflammation there are five vascular six cellular total 11 events i am going to teach you all 11 events in one diagram so these are the five vascular events i will i am not reading it i will directly explain you these are the six cellular events i am not reading directly i will explain you at the end after 5 or 10 minutes in 10 minutes i will explain all all 11 events after that you will be able to say all the events we will revise all 11 events in the end okay all 11 events i am going to explain in one diagram the master diagram everyone here on the screen please concentrate now on your gadgets everyone it's very important topic i am going to explain you all 11 events in one diagram if you don't understand this diagram you cannot understand the acute inflammation this is my sketch diagram my way of teaching okay can you see this master diagram in this master diagram can you see the yellow line here i have drawn a yellow line okay just a second you can see this is the yellow line imagine this is the skin the human skin imagine this is the skin of this portion okay now some bacteria have entered the human body it can be bacteria it can be virus it can be fungus it can be anything it can be the injurious agent so let's take an example bacteria i will call it a terrorist it is a foreign material now i will call it the terrorist okay you can see the blood vessel just below that there is a blood vessel this is the endothelial lining of the blood vessel and inside the blood vessel we have three type of cells rbc wbc platelet currently i am interested in wbc which is the army the defense mechanism these are the army these are wbc this is the army right now there is a terrorist there is an army you can see the terrorist you can see the army the terrorist cause the disease and the army protect us you got my point but there is a they should fight with each other if the terrorist win then infection takes place if the army win inflammation takes place so you will say ma'am okay let them fight let's see who is winning who is more powerful let's see and that will decide the fate whether the person have infection or inflammation that will decide after the fight but there is a problem there is a problem a small problem for which we have to conduct the 11 steps what is the problem can you see what is the problem Huh? you all can see you will see ma'am the terrorist is extravascular i mean the bacteria is extravascular and the army is intravascular so how they can fight they cannot meet na one is extravascular one is intravascular they cannot meet with, with each other if they cannot meet how they can fight with each other so you will see ma'am there are two ways either 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 uh, take i'm sorry either take the bacteria inside the blood vessel if you take the bacteria inside the blood vessel they will meet and they will fight right they will meet and they will fight but it's a bad idea if you take the bacteria inside the blood vessel there is sepsis there is sepsis no so the other way around we will take the army out yes it's a good idea take the wbc out and let them fight so for taking wbc out we have to do 11 steps so that is the motto why we are doing 11 steps everyone learns the 11 steps they the five vascular the six cellular even students don't know why it is happening what is the purpose why we are performing all this tedious exercise we want to take the WBC out so that it can fight or it can do the phagocytosis of the bacteria and bacteria is dead. This is the purpose. Say yes, everyone with me. You got it? So I will tell you the 11 steps one by one. Among the 11 steps, the five are vascular events and six are cellular events. The last event in which the WBC will do the phagocytosis of the bacteria. Can I start? Are you people with me? If you say yes, then only I will start. Okay. So this is the master diagram in which I am going to explain you all 11 events. Okay. Let me start with the five vascular events first. Then I will come on cellular. In the five vascular events, the first event is the vasoconstriction, transient vasoconstriction. See the diagram. See the diagram. Can you see this is the uh, bacteria or a terrorist, whatever you say. So the blood vessel just below that undergo vasoconstriction. It will go you know, sympathetic stimulation. So that portion undergo vasoconstriction, but it is transient. It is only for few seconds, hardly, hardly for few seconds. So say the word transient vasoconstriction, the first event. Transient vasoconstriction, the first event. So as soon as, so just suppose this is my um, uh, skin and just below that I am having a blood vessel. So if some injury is here, so the blood vessel just below this injurious agent, the blood vessel in that segment, not the complete blood vessel, blood vessel in that segment undergo vasoconstriction transiently. So transient vasoconstriction is the first event. It is only for few seconds or minute. Appreciate it. The first event, transient vasoconstriction. I am teaching you the 11 events of acute inflammation, the 5 vascular, the 6 cellular. The first is over. The second is vasodilatation. Now after that, the same portion which was initially undergo vasoconstriction, not undergo vasodilatation. It's vasodilated now. And it is persistent. It's not transient. 
to say the second event is vasodilatation and it's persistent okay now imagine again this is the portion this is the point where the bacteria is entering so the blood vessel just below this portion of the skin this is undergoing this portion not the complete blood vessel only this blood vessel portion which is below this section it is undergoing vasodilatation what do you mean by vasodilatation you will say ma'am vasodilatation means more blood so this portion have more blood so if i see from above this portion look red to me yes obviously hai na? so it is explaining the rubor i told you the five cardinal sign now one is explained if i ask you what is the reason for rubor you can answer ma'am it is the second step that is persistent vasodilatation leading to rubor and if i touch this portion as compared to surrounding temperature it's more hot because it is having more blood more blood more hotness as compared to more warm i mean as compared to surrounding area so rubor and calor can be explained because of this so second step step number two that is persistent vasodilatation is explaining the two features rubor and calor say yes say yes rubor calor can be explained because of persistent vasodilatation we are done with two features till now the first is vasoconstriction the second is vasodilatation the vasoconstriction is transient in nature the vasodilatation is persistent in nature vasoconstriction leading to nothing but vasodilatation leading to two features rubor and calor everyone yes everyone give me a thumbs up everyone can we go ahead yeah coming on the third third feature the third feature for understanding the third uh, step you have to understand the starling's law what is starling's law starling's law says that in a blood vessel in a capillary two types of pressure always operate one is outward that is hydrostatic pressure and one is inward that is osmotic pressure hydrostatic is always outward osmotic is always inward hydrostatic as the name say hydro hydro ka matlab kya hota hai water so it is the pressure due to water the water is leading to this pressure and osmotic or oncotic is due to protein it's always inward and normally they are equal and opposite so whatever coming out is going back so there is no fluid no edema this is normal starling's law i guess um, um, like uh, you all have uh, have uh, read this thing in the physiology okay so can we go ahead okay yes so this is the two type of the pressure now you tell me because of the last step the second step was vasodilatation which pressure will increase is it hydrostatic or oncotic is it hydrostatic or oncotic which pressure will increase can you please tell me which pressure will increase common sense so you will say ma'am vasodilatation means there is more blood more blood in this section in this section more blood more blood means more water more water means hydrostatic pressure the hydrostatic pressure will increase so outward is more inward is less outward is more inward is less since outward is more inward is less there is an imbalance the imbalance because of the imbalance the fluid will come out the fluid will come out leading to edema it will accumulate here and leading to edema leading to edema say yes this is step number three so step number three leading to edema and because of the edema there is swelling this portion will swells out this portion will just suppose i am having an injury yes it can be insect bite arthur yes it can be any injury bacteria virus insect bite whatever so that portion will swell out do you have a mosquito bite anytime of course we all have experienced that so we have a swelling focal swelling at that point now where the mosquito is biting or any insect is biting the swelling is due to this step so the third step is explaining the swelling or the tumor out of the five cardinal feature yes so this is the thing can you have you got it have you got it the fourth step till now we have studied three step one two three the one was vasoconstriction which was transient the second is vasodilatation which is persistent which is persistent and third is increased hydrostatic pressure okay uh, vasoconstriction leading to nothing vasodilatation leading to two features rubor and calor increase hydrostatic pressure leading to edema edema also known as tumor okay edema only fluid came out so this type of edema is transudate edema you know there are two types of edema transudate and exudate here only fluid was coming out due to imbalance in the pressure now coming on the fourth step the fourth step the fourth step is increased vascular permeability you must ask me ma'am what do you mean by vascular permeability have you seen a blood vessel in the blood vessel these are the endothelial cells these are the endothelial cells they are continuous one behind the other they are continuous one behind the other there is no gap in them i am using the word gap there is no gap you can see okay but now the increased vascular permeability means the gaps will be created the gaps will be created creation of gap can you see the gaps now these are the gaps creation of gaps is known as increased vascular permeability you must be thinking ma'am why the gaps you are creating the gaps i want to take wbc out now 
what is my ultimate purpose i want to take this wbc out and make a fight between the back area and the wbc if there is no gap how the wbc will come out so ultimately we have to create the gap and from that gap we have to take the wbc out so that is creation of gap the creation of the gap is known as increased muscular permeability and this step is the hallmark out of the 11 steps this step is the most important okay now the gaps are created you can see these are the gaps these are the gaps the gaps are created from this gaps from this gaps the protein will also leak out protein will also leak out fluid was already there now protein also leak out so edema will increase and this edema is exudate okay let me explain you you can see here the first diagram in the first diagram see the wall of the blood vessel see the endothelial cell they are continuous there is no gap appreciate there is no gap in the first diagram and see the two pressure outward is equal to inward so everything was normal everything was normal in the second diagram you can see the gap is still not there it's it's continuous it's continuous okay there is no gap okay but the outward pressure is more and inward is less so because of the imbalance only fluid came out can you see the fluid is coming out see the background blue color appreciate the background blue color here which is accumulating so only fluid is accumulating so this is known as transudate transudate contains only fluid now see the third diagram in the third diagram this is endothelial cell this is endothelial cell this is endothelial cell now at the junction you can see the gaps you can see the gaps at the junction from this gaps the protein is going out the protein is also going out now the fluid along with protein is known as exudate initially only fluid was there so there are two types of edema what are the two types of edema transudate exudate transudate exudate transudate contains only fluid exudate contains fluid plus protein so here among the six steps uh, five steps i am telling you the third step that is increased hydrostatic pressure leading to transudate and the fourth step increased vascular permeability leading to exudate that is my point to explain you both of them leading to edema both of them causing the swelling so initially the swelling contains only fluid after that the swelling contains fluid with the protein that is pus formation say yes so you got my point you got my point that is a thing so transudate followed by exudate the reason for the transudate is increased hydrostatic pressure the reason for exudate is increased vascular permeability say yes you got it everyone so let's revise the fourth step till now we have studied the fourth step then i will come on the fifth one can you please tell me the four steps anyone from the audience anyone from the audience can you tell me the four steps please i'm teaching you the vascular vascular steps the first step is the vasoconstriction the second is the vasodilatation the vasoconstriction is transient the vasodilatation is the persistent okay the third is increased hydrostatic pressure the fourth is increased vascular permeability increased vascular permeability is the hallmark step or pathogmatic step the most important step okay tell me the consequences vasoconstriction leads to nothing there is no consequence vasodilatation leads to two things rubor calor increased hydrostatic pressure leads to edema increased vascular permeability also leads to edema but increased hydrostatic pressure only fluid came out that's why edema is transudate in nature and increased vascular permeability along with fluid protein also came out that's why edema is exudate in nature so till now i taught you this anyone having any confusion in that <coughs> anyone having any confusion in that can we go ahead so the last step okay don't go in the mechanisms there are five mechanisms of creating the gaps you must know the names but don't go in the detail the five mechanism we can skip of creating the gaps okay and yeah the last and the fifth step is the slowing the slowing like stasis of the blood now the fluid also came out the protein also came out so what remain now in the lumen of the blood vessel in this section only cells are present so there is stasis of blood so the fifth and the last step is the stasis we are done with five vascular steps yes everyone yes saya usama mohit arthur you all are genius good great i'm very happy good good everyone everyone yes okay so naveen you have you have a uh, trouble in understanding exudate can i repeat you got it or you are asking so there are two types of edema now mean there are two types of edema there is transudate and there is exudate okay in transudate only fluid come out of the wall of the blood vessel and in exudate along with the fluid protein also come out this also leads to edema this also leads to edema but this is a watery edema only fluid is there and this is pus thick like along with the uh, fluid it contains protein and cell also it looks like pus white thick pus that is the two types of the edema right so whenever the wall of the blood vessel is continuous now it's like this 
so only fluid can come out only fluid can come out but whenever the gaps are present in the wall of the blood vessel along with the fluid protein also come out so whenever there is increased hydrostatic pressure it's only fluid coming out but whenever there is increased vascular permeability the protein also come out you got it i hope you got it now right stasis so it's now there is nothing to understand in stasis stasis is just you know the fluid and the protein is already leaked whatever remaining is the stasis so that's the stasis there is nothing to learn in that so the five the five uh, you should learn the vasoconstriction which is transient vasodilatation which is persistent increase hydrostatic pressure increase vascular permeability and stasis please learn and among them the hallmark feature is the increase vascular permeability and you know the consequences of each of them yes give me a thumbs up you got it can we go ahead so we will solve some questions on these five and then i will come on the six cellular events in this way all 11 will be done so please solve some mcqs the first question is in front of you can you give the answer please <clears throat> can you tell me the sequence of the events in acute inflammation i told you the muscular events you can read the four option i told you the five events can you tell me the sequence is it vasodilatation followed by stasis followed by transient vasoconstriction or permeability read the four options i'm not reading the four options please read the four option and tell me the correct sequence of the vascular events of acute inflammation who will tell me the correct sequence please what is the correct sequence of vascular events in acute inflammation yes what is the correct sequence please yes very good very good no meher it's not c read again read again meher others you all are right correct answer is d the so first is vasoconstriction followed by vasodilatation increased hydrostatic pressure is not given the third the fourth is increased vascular permeability and then last one is the stasis so out of the five four are given but you have to arrange them in a sequence right this is a very commonly asked pyq okay the next question uh, is in front of you can you tell me the first step in acute inflammation the first is it vasodilatation or constriction is it increased vascular permeability or decreased vascular permeability the first step the first step yes hydrostat is missing mohit right what is the first step yes you all are right i guess the question is very easy the first step is vasoconstriction although it's transient but don't miss it although it's transient i know it's only for few seconds only for few minutes but please don't miss it although it's transient but don't miss it so correct answer here is b yes everyone is right you all are right so going to the next question all of the following vascular changes are observed in acute inflammation except in your question there are many questions having the word except don't miss the word except so what are the four options which do not take place in acute inflammation vasodilatation takes place yes or no stasis takes place yes or no increased vascular permeability takes place yes or no decreased hydrostatic pressure takes place yes or no so tell me what is the correct answer what is the correct answer here yes yes you all are yes osama absolutely right and everyone else is also right the correct answer here is the d because it's not decreased hydrostatic pressure it's increased hydrostatic pressure and rest all the three options are right you all are right so correct answer here is d we are done with vascular events coming on the cellular events very quickly can i start the cellular events yes we should start quickly now the cellular events of uh, acute inflammation so till now tell me the summary <coughs> first tell me the summary of these five vascular events we have done the five vascular events vasoconstriction vasodilatation increased hydrostatic pressure increased vascular permeability and stasis what is the summary the last summary diagram is this Till now what we have done in in the vascular events of acute inflammation we have created a gap we have created a gap we have already created a gap now it's time to take wbc out of that gap you will say ma'am take it out now why you require six steps it is not that easy we require six steps to take wbc out right so these six events are cellular events in which the cell will come out the cell is the wbc the army you know this is the terrorist you can see the microbe is the terrorist it's still present and the army is still inside but we are you know arranging arranging a channel arranging a, a gap from which we will take the army out and take it towards the terrorist and let them fight we will do the phagocytosis by the army to the terrorist right so this is ultimately we want so we have already created a gap we have already created a gap but now we want to take wbc out of that gap that is cellular events so what is the problem have you read bernoulli's theorem when you were a kid i mean in physics in your 6th 7th 8th standard bernoulli's theorem what is bernoulli's theorem so this is a pipe you know empty illuminated pipe whenever fluid travel in a pipe the heavy portion travel at the center and the light portion travel at the periphery this is the statement of the bernoulli theorem let's apply the bernoulli theorem bernoulli's theorem on a blood vessel blood vessel is also illuminated pipe now 
right in which we are having four things we are having rbc wbc platelet and uh, the plasma so which is the heaviest one the heaviest will travel at the center i told you na the heaviest unfortunately the heaviest is the wbc the wbc travel at the center and after that there is rbc so this is all rbc surrounding the wbc there is rbc okay after that there is platelet so surrounding that there is platelet and most lightest one the lightest one is the plasma so this is the plasma the lightest one present at the plasma at the most periphery now there is a gap imagine this is my gap right i want to take wbc out i do not want to take rbc and platelet and plasma out i want to take wbc which is present at the center so i how can i take it directly from the gap it is present at the center now first i have to take it at the periphery then only i can take it out it was a fun when it the it was very easy i mean when the wbc was already present at the periphery but it is not the case in all of our blood the wbc present at the center so during inflammation we have to take it to the periphery so that we can take it out of the gap you got my point normally when the wbc travel at the center right it is known as axial blood flow axial blood flow so basically we want to convert axial to reverse axial axial to reverse axial in which we want to take the wbc from the center to the periphery say yes so this is the thing so let me tell you the six steps now so this is the summary these are the six steps see here everyone here on the screen can you see this is a wbc i'm drawing this one see this is the wbc present at the center say yes right the first step taking the wbc from the center to the periphery this is known as margination margin you are taking the wbc from the center to the margin that's why known as margination okay margination also known as fermentation after that where is the gap this is my gap so gap is not immediate gap is not immediate we have to take it a distance it is thoda sa dur hai so wbc have to travel that distance to reach the gap okay so for that wbc will do rolling you know wbc is rolling like a tire on a road like a tire on a road who is the tire wbc who is the road it is the endothelial lining say yes it's very important to understand so here you can see the tire is the wbc and the road is the endothelial lining so the tire is rolling on a road 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 this step is known as rolling so the second step is the rolling after that just before the gap it stop stoppage is known as adhesion the third step is adhesion first margination then rolling then adhesion it stop after that it comes out ultimately wbc comes from intravascular space to extravascular space ultimately it's known as transmigration what does it known as it known as transmigration in which wbc come from intravascular space to extravascular space it's transmigration okay transmigration also known as dipediasis dipediasis very important step yes it's dipediasis it's coming out okay now wbc don't have eyes where is the bacteria it's a three dimensional space in the three dimensional space how does wbc recognize that bacteria is in this direction and in a three dimensional space i have to move this not there not there wbc don't have eyes to see where is the bacteria oh here is the bacteria i have to move here not here so it is due to the chemical how does it takes place the bacteria secrete some chemical and that chemical attract the wbc so this step is known as chemotaxis chemo means chemical taxis means chemical oriented movement so wbc will move towards the chemical that is the fifth step and lastly you can see wbc is phagocyting the bacteria the last step phagocytosis enumerate the six steps please what are the six steps can you tell me the same six steps from a book diagram you can see this is my sketch diagram okay you can see the wbc at the center wbc leave the center and come at the periphery margination after that rolling 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 just before the gap it stop that is adhesion after that it is coming out that is transmigration or dipediasis after that it is moving towards the bacteria because of chemical it's chemotaxis lastly it is doing phagocytosis so say the six steps can you please enumerate 1 2 3 4 5 6 don't learn please don't learn close your eyes and imagine the six steps wbc present at the center you know bernoulli's theorem okay you know bernoulli's theorem wbc present at the center what you will do first you will take the wbc from the center to the periphery known as margination after that wbc will roll rolling like a tire on the road okay after that it will stop just before the gap that is known as adhesion after that it comes out of the gap transmigration or dipediasis dipediasis okay after that it moves towards the chemical secreted by the bacteria chemotaxis in the end it will perform phagocytosis it will perform phagocytosis absolutely right absolutely right navin osama very good very good so these are the six steps among them 
I will now margination you already got it to convert the axial blood flow into reverse axial please learn this this definition the definition of margination now I will explain you how does rolling adhesion and transmigration and chemotaxis takes place the details of them so let me take the rolling adhesion and transmigration together how does it take place how does it takes place how does rolling takes place how does adhesion how does so can you see for rolling WBC, how the WBC is rolling on the surface of the wall of the blood vessel so with the help of the receptor everything in pathology is like receptors only it's like receptor so can you see here the receptors are present on the surface of the wbc the corresponding i'm using the word corresponding the corresponding receptors are present on the the on the wall of the blood vessel so because of which interaction of these receptors the rolling takes place so the receptors are present on the surface of the wbc the corresponding receptors are present on the wall of the blood vessel so, the, the receptor between the road and the tire, you know, this is a road and this is a tire. So, because of the receptors, the bond is formed, it's very transient, it break, then it moves. Then again, the bond is formed, then again, it break, then again, the bond is formed. In this way, the rolling takes place. And for addition, the bonds are firmer, it stop, right? So, tell me the name of the corresponding, tell me the name of the corresponding receptors. It's known as complementary addition molecules, CAMS. Complementary addition molecules, there are six pairs you have to learn. The six pairs. And these are pairs you cannot change. No, these are pairs. Exactly. So you have to learn which member present on the road, which member present on the tire. This is road. I always call endothelium as a road. I always call WBC as a tire. So you will have a better imagination what is road, what is tire. So what is present on the road, correspondingly what is present on the tire and what is the pair. What is the pair? You have to learn it. So don't worry, I'm having a super simplified diagram for you. Super duper simplified. Nowhere it is given else in the world. In none of the books, this diagram is given. It is, I have drawn this diagram for you. Right. You have to understand the six pairs. The six pairs are drawn in front of you. I will write their names in front of you to make the pair. You have to learn the pairs. So this is a diagram of complementary addition molecules, the CAMS. Okay, the six pairs. You can see this is tire. Uh, the WBC okay this is WBC you can see this is road the endothelial lining the road now appreciate the receptors corresponding receptors between them let's write let's write okay so the first is the P and E selectin first pair okay let me write this is P selectin present on the tire and this is E selectin again present on the tire I mean on WBC they form bond what is present on the road on the endothelium P and E selectin, they form bond with Silyl Lewis X. Silyl, both of them form bond with Silyl. So, first pair is P selectin with Silyl Lewis X. The second pair is E selectin with Silyl Lewis X. You have to learn the name of the pairs. I'm sorry, but you have to learn. I'm trying to simplify it. Okay. The third selectin, P and E selectin present on the. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me erase it. I have done reverse. I have done reverse by mistake. Uh, how to erase it? Okay. We'll try. Ah, done. Okay. Okay. So we will try again. Okay. I'm sorry. It's it was my mistake. So here P selectin and E selectin is present. I mean to say P selectin and E selectin is present here. They form bond with Sila. You cannot reverse it. They form bond with Silyl Lewis X only. But the P and E selectin present on the endothelium. And Silyl Lewis X is present on the WBC. The third selectin, there is P and E selectin present on the endothelium. The third selectin, L selectin present on the WBC. L for leukocyte. Leukocyte ka matabuta hai WBC. So L selectin present on the leukocyte. Okay. It form bonds with glycam. It form bonds with glycam. It form bonds with glycam 1. Okay. Glycam se yaad aega ICAM and PCAM. ICAM and VCAM. They form bond with integrin, beta 2 integrin and beta 1 integrin. Please learn it. I know it's difficult. I know, but you have to learn the five pairs. So, the first pair is in front of you, P-selectin with Silyl Lewis X. The second is E-selectin with Silyl Lewis X. The third is Glycam with L-selectin. The fourth is I-cam with beta 1 integrin. The fifth is V-cam with beta 1 integrin. So, if you don't change the sequences, it's easy to learn. I have written, you can see the name of the five pairs in front of you. Right. The last how does diapediasis takes place? WBC don't have ISQ. There is a gap. Just fall down. It doesn't happen like this. Just fall down and go out. No, it's not like that. Again, it, it is with the help of receptor only. So what is the receptor for diapediasis? So you can see these are the receptors. Only one receptor which is present on both. Which is present on WBC also. Which is present on endothelium also. The road also, the tire also. So the name of that receptor is PCAM. Here also, here also. It's PCAM. 
known as CD31, CPCAM. PCAM is the only receptor which is common in the road and the tire and that leads to transmigration and diabetes is ultra important MCQ. Say yes if you got it. So can you try the pairs? Can we write it? Can you help me? Tell me what is present on the road. Tell me what is present on the tire. Tell me the pairs. Can you please help me? Try it out. At least try it out. The first pair is P-selectin and E-selectin. Okay, P and E-selectin. So, P and E-selectin, they form bond with Xylyl Lewis X, Xylyl Lewis X. The third selectin is L-selectin. It is present on WBC. It form bonds with glycam. It form bonds with glycam. Glycam se yaad a jayega, ek I-cam bhi hota hai, aur ek V-cam bhi hota hai. Teen cam hai, glycam, I-cam, V-cam. I-cam and V-cam, they form bonds with integrins. They form bonds with integrin. So, this is beta 2 integrin. This is beta 1 integrin. So, learn the pairs. It's not very tough. I tried. Okay, you can see. And the last ultra important, super duper important pair you cannot afford missing is PCAM, PCAM. PCAM here also. PCAM here also. PCAM also known as CD31. Learn other name also. And this one is responsible for transmigration or diabetes. So say yes. Say yes. Now, learn. The first pair is responsible. First and third is responsible for rolling. Fourth is responsible, fourth and fifth for adhesion. But the second pair is responsible for both. Second pair, that is E-selectin and Xylyl Lewis X, responsible for both. Rolling as well as adhesion. And the last one, we all know it is for diabetes. So, this is the thing. Can you see here? Here also, you can see the first, let me write, the first and the third responsible for rolling, rolling. The fourth and the fifth responsible for adhesion, adhesion. And the second pair responsible for rolling and adhesion, it's the PYQ. Okay. And the last one, PCAM with PCAM, it is responsible for transmigration or diapediasis. You get many MCQs on this. No one will teach you this complicated topic with such simplicity. You can see in front of you. You can appreciate the pairs. Give me a thumbs up. So the next is the chemotaxis. I told you the bacteria. This is the bacteria. It is secreting the chemicals. It is secreting the chemicals and chemicals is attracting the bacteria, uh, attracting the WBC. So, this WBC travels towards the bacteria because of the chemicals secreted. It is known as chemotaxis, which is a unidirectional motion. Unidirectional chemical oriented motion. Say, unidirectional motion or movement because of the chemical gradient. Okay, name the chemical. Name the chemical. Name the four chemicals. The four chemicals. What are the four chemicals here? Can you name them? One is leukotrin. One is interleukin and two are complement. Learn the numbers. Leukotrin is B4. Okay. Interleukin is 8. Okay. And the two complement is C3A, C5A. C3A, C5A. The four chemicals. Please learn. So, these are the chemicals. The four chemicals secreted by the bacteria that attracts the WBC. So, the WBC moves towards the bacteria in a three-dimensional space. Do not go anywhere else. So, it's leukotrin B4. Interleukin 8. Complement C3A, complement C5A. Say yes. Okay. So, can you see these are the four uh, chemicals. So, you have among them C5A is most potent. C5A is most potent. There is multiple time PYQ on that. We are done with all and lastly there is phagocytosis. So, we are done with cellular events also. Congratulations. We are done with acute inflammation. So, do you want to solve some MCQs or shall I skip this MCQs or you want to solve it? You want to solve it? Okay. So, the first question is in front of you. Can you please give me the answer? What is the correct sequence in extra position of the WBC? Tell me the sequence for uh, cellular events. I told you the six cellular events. Now, arrange them in a sequence. Can you please arrange them in a sequence for me? You know the six events. Read the four options. If you know the sequence, you can tell me. Yes? What is the correct answer? Okay. So, is it margination followed by rolling, addition or transmigration or transmigration followed by margination, rolling, addition? You can read the options and tell me what is the correct answer. Yes, absolutely right. Absolutely right. The correct answer here is the A. So, it's margination followed by rolling, followed by addition, followed by transmigration, chemotaxis and phagocytosis is not given here. The next two. So, out of the six, four are given. Yes, you all are right. The correct answer is A. The next question, most important for diapediasis. What is diapediasis? The transmigration. Tell me the receptor responsible for that. Is it PCAM? Is it one of the selectin? Is it integrin? Or is it mucin like glycoprotein? What is the correct answer? What is the correct answer, please? Yes. Yes, margination and pavimentation is same. Metroid, it's same. 
Yes, you all are right. The correct answer here is the PCAM. Ultra important question. PCAM. And if I change the question instead of diapediasis, it's rolling. Answer will become selactin. P selactin, E selactin. If I change it to adhesion, answer selactin and integrin both. So that's how we can change the question according to, we can change the answer according to the question. So the next question is in front of you. Chemotaxis is mediated by. I told you the chemicals for the chemotaxis. Huh? I told you one uh, leukotrin, one interleukin and two complement. You have to learn the numbers and you have to match it here. Is it histamine? Is it leukotrin B4 and C5A? Is it leukotrin C4 and C3A or bradykinin? If you know the numbers, you can answer it very correctly and very easily. So let me help you. Let me help you. So leukotrin is B4, interleukin is 8 and the two chemicals are C3A and C5A. Now match it correctly. Match it correctly among the options. Leukotrin B4 is given and C5A is also given. If you see the option number C, C3A is correct but leukotrin C4 is not there. So yes, you all are right. The correct answer here is B. Very, very good. Excellent. Excellent. And most potent among them is C5A. Okay. So correct answer here is B. We are done with acute inflammation. The next thing is the chronic inflammation. Another 10 minutes. 10 or 15 minutes. We will be done with chapter 2 also inflammation. I have to teach you 5 important chapters in general. So 2 will be done. I mean the first chapter was important. Cell adaptation, cell injury, cell death and inflammation was also important. After that we will come on hemodynamics. After that we will come on neoplasia. The next we will come on genetics and lastly we will see something on immunopathology. Right. So these are the four, five, five, six important topics in general. After that, we have to see hematology, the RBC, anemias, the leukemias and some platelet disorders. Okay, so let's finish chronic inflammation quickly. So what is chronic inflammation? Chronic inflammation, it's a prolonged duration in which inflammation, injury and attempts to repair takes place simultaneously. Before understanding the chronic inflammation, you have to understand a concept. Let me explain you. You know, where are the blood cells formed in human body? Where does the blood cells formed? The, all the blood cells are formed in bone marrow. In the bone marrow, the first cell is always hematopoietic stem cell. This is the first cell, the hematopoietic stem cell. From the hematopoietic stem cells, RBCs are also formed, WBC, platelet are also formed. There are five types of WBC. What are the five types of WBC? Neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil, monocyte and lymphocyte. I am interested in monocyte because I am teaching you chronic inflammation. Now, I am interested in monocyte. So, from the hematopoietic stem cell, monoblast are formed. Monoblast. And this is the blood vessel from the monoblast, monocyte are formed. So these monocytes will come in the blood. So in the in the bone marrow, these are known as monoblast. In the blood vessel, these are known as monocyte. Right. After that, once the monocyte comes out of the blood vessel in the tissue, this is any tissue. Once it comes out of the blood vessel, these are known as macrophages. These are known as macrophages. Okay. Macrophages get modified. They get modified. They become become bigger. Nucleus become bigger. These are known as epithelioid cells. Epithelioid cells are nothing. They are modified macrophages. Epithelioid cells are the modified macrophages, okay? And multiple epithelioid cells fuse with each other and they form giant cells. They form giant cells. So learn the sequence, I mean to say. So they all are same. One behind the other, they are forming. So tell me the sequence. The first cell is monoblast in the bone marrow. It gives rise to monocyte in the blood. Monocyte in the tissue is known as macrophage. Macrophage become modified, known as epithelioid cell. And epithelioid cell fuses with each other and they form the giant cell. Give me a thumbs up if you got it. So the same thing is seen here, monoblast giving rise to monocyte, giving rise to macrophage, giving rise to activated macrophage known as epithelioid cell. You can see and epithelioid cell fuses with each other and form the giant cell. The same thing, you can see the bone marrow, hematopoietic stem cell, monoblast, this is monocyte, this is epithelioid cell. Okay, same thing is seen. Let's start chronic inflammation. Are you people with me? Can I tell you the steps of chronic inflammation? Acute inflammation have 11 steps, the 5 vascular and 6 cellular. Chronic inflammation have only 3 steps. It's a small, it's small, it's not as big as uh, acute inflammation. So, the chronic inflammation have only 3 steps. The chronic inflammation is also known as granulomatous inflammation because, uh, because uh, it is, uh, uh, here the granulomas are formed. I will send you the notes now after the session. Yes, definitely after the session, I will send you the notes on the group, on the telegram group of the ProCM, you will get it, okay. The granulomatous inflammation, also known as chronic inflammation. Here granulomas are formed. The end result is granuloma. It's type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. I will draw all the three steps in one diagram. Everyone here on the screen, see the diagram. This is an antigen entering human body. The specialty of this antigen, it is non-digestible. It is non-degradable like the TB bacteria, like the talcum powder, right? They are non-degradable antigen. Once they enter the human body, the first cell they interact is antigen-presenting cell. Antigen-presenting cell engulf the antigen, 
try to degrade it but unable to degrade it because the antigen is non-degradable. So what does antigen presenting cell will do? This antigen presenting cell will take the antigen to the T lymphocyte, helper T lymphocyte, helper TH1 lymphocyte to be specific and precise. Helper TH1 lymphocyte will get activated. The helper TH1 lymphocyte on activating, it will secrete three cytokines on the tip of your tongue, the three cytokines there. It will secrete three cytokines that will lead to formation of granuloma. The first is interferon gamma, please learn it. The first is interferon gamma, please learn it, interferon gamma. The second is TNF alpha, okay. And uh, the third is interleukin. Interleukin 1 and 2, multiple interleukins are there, right. What does the three cytokines will do? Now see, this is a blood vessel. From the blood vessel, they will take one one cell out of the blood vessel. Let me tell you the name of the cell, okay. So let's talk about interferon gamma. Interferon gamma take the monocyte out. They take the monocyte out. Monocyte after coming out, they convert into macrophages, okay. So basically, they, it causes accumulation of the macrophages and not only this, it modifies the macrophages and the macrophages convert into epithelioid cell, epithelioid cell. Not only this, epithelioid cell fuses with each other and it leads to formation of giant cells. So macrophage, epithelioid cell, giant cell are all due to interferon gamma. Interferon gamma. Okay. Coming on the next, the next TNF alpha. What does it do? TNF alpha takes the fibroblast. Fibroblast out. Fibroblast out and fibroblast will do the collagen formation or fibrosis. And last one, the interleukins. Interleukin, no? Interleukin, they will take the T lymphocyte out. T lymphocyte out. So they will cause the proliferation of the T lymphocyte. Now at last we have three type of cell. What are the three type of cells due to the three type of the cytokines? Can you tell me what are the three type of cells with the three type of cytokines please? We have epithelioid cells and giant cells because of interferon gamma. We have fibroblast because of TNF alpha. We have T lymphocyte because of inter interleukin 1 and 2. Please learn which, which, which uh, uh, cytokine is leading to which type of cell. Now these cells will arrange themselves. This, one, this will form the center. This will form the middle zone. And this will form the outermost zone. And this is known as granuloma. On the next page, I will draw a granuloma for you. You got it? Let me draw a granuloma. In the granuloma, in the center, epithelioid cells are present, which are sleeper shaped like this. Epithelioid. Some of them fuses with each other and they form the giant cell. Some of them, not all. So in the center, there is epithelioid cell and giant cell. It is surrounded by T lymphocyte. It is surrounded by T lymphocyte. And outermost, it is surrounded by fibroblast. Outermost, it is surrounded by fibroblast like this. And fibroblasts secrete collagen and do the fibrosis. So most outermost is the fibrosis. This is granuloma. People don't understand what is granuloma. This is the most simplified version of granuloma I have made for you. Say yes. So how does a granuloma form? In the granuloma, there are three types of cells. The central epithelioid cells and giant cells are due to interferon gamma. The middle T lymphocytes are due to interleukin 1 and 2. And the outermost fibroblasts are due to TNF alpha. Are you people there? Or everyone is gone. Are you still there? Give me a thumbs up if you got it. This is the diagram of a granuloma. The well structured diagram. How does a granuloma form? This is chronic inflammation. Step by step you have to tell me what is chronic inflammation. Say yes if you got it. Everyone. Just a second. Everyone got it. What is inflammation? The chronic inflammation. Now there are two types of granuloma. Sometimes. Just a second. You can see just a granuloma. There is no necrosis at the center. It is known as hard tubercle or hard granuloma. Sometimes at the center, there is caseous necrosis. I told you five type of necrosis. Now the third type, the caseous necrosis at the center. The cheese like, it is known as soft granuloma. This is known as soft granuloma. This is how a granuloma is formed. This is chronic inflammation. Can you tell me the steps of the chronic inflammation, please? So first an antigen will come in human body. The antigen is non-degradable. It will go to APC. APC will try to degrade it but unable to degrade it. APC will take it to TH1 cell, helper TH1 cell. Helper TH1 cell on stimulation secrete three cytokines, name the three cytokines. You cannot miss that, you cannot. Interferon gamma the most important. Okay, after that interleukin 1 and 2. Okay, and after that TNF alpha. After that TNF alpha. Now they will take one one cell from the blood out. The interferon gamma take the monocyte out and convert them to macrophage, convert them to epithelioid cell. And fuses some of them to form giant cell. Yes, sab kaam karega interferon gamma. Okay. TNF alpha will take the T lymphocytes out. Okay. And I am sorry, interleukins take the T, T, T lymphocyte. And TNF alpha will take the fibroblast out. They will arrange themselves and they form a granuloma. This is the center. This is the middle zone. And this is the outermost zone. Just arrange them. Center, middle, outer. A granuloma is in front of you. 
ओके इट इज एज सिंपल एज दैट थैंक यू थैंक्स फॉर द कॉम्प्लीमेंट इट्स एज सिंपल एज दैट सो प्लीज लर्न द स्टेप्स यू नो इट शुड बी क्रिस्टल क्लियर इन योर माइंड स्टेप बाय स्टेप इट्स टाइप फोर हाइपर सेंसिटिविटी द एंटीजन इज पोअरली डाइजेस्टेबल द सेम थिंग इज शोन हियर वॉट एवर आई हैव ड्रॉन फॉर यू लेट मी शो इट हियर ऑल्सो कैन यू ऑल सी एंटीजन येस इट इज एंटरिंग द ह्यूमन बॉडी दिस सेल इज ए पी सी ए पी सी इज कैप्चरिंग इट इंगल फिंग इट सी ट्राइंग टू डिग्रेड इट बट अनेबल टू डिग्रेड इट सो दैट्स वाई टेकिंग इट टू द नेक्स्ट सेल द नेक्स्ट सेल इज वॉट it is helper th1 it is not helper th2 you will get helper th2 also in your option it's helper th1 cell on stimulation it will secrete three type of cytokines the inter um, interferon gamma tnf alpha and interleukin 1 and 2 they are taking one one cell out and in this way a granuloma is formed the granuloma is in front of you same thing is written the antigen is coming macrophage apc is engulfing it try to destroy it but unable to destroy it fail to digest it that's why it is taking it to the helper th1 the helper th1 will get activated and secrete the three secrete the three cytokines the three cytokines will do one one thing the intel interleukins will take the t lymphocyte interferon gamma take the macrophages and convert them into epithelioid cell and giant cell tnf alpha take the fibroblast out they will rearrange themselves and this is granuloma everyone on the screen this is granuloma you can see the central purple color cell these are epithelioid cell some of them fuses and form the giant cell the epithelioid cells and the giant cells are due to interferon gamma i am repeating again and again the middle zone the red color cells can you see the middle zone the red color cells these are t lymphocytes these are due to interleukin 1 and 2 and outermost you can see the fibroblast the spindle shaped fibroblast these are due to tnf alpha we are done we are done okay let me tell you the types of the giant cells and pack chronic inflammation also okay how many types of giant cells you know this is how granuloma is formed now you understand what is acute inflammation in acute inflammation in chronic inflammation acute inflammation chronic inflammation in acute inflammation we have 11 events the five vascular the six cellular i guess you know the sequence in chronic inflammation we have only three events Ah, huh, what are the three events? The first event is the engulfment of the antigen by the APC and unable to destroy it. The second is activation of helper Th1 cell, and third is secret secretion of the three cytokines, which is taking one one cell out and forming the granuloma. That's it. But here we have five vascular and six cellular events. You know the detail. So this is how acute and chronic inflammation differ from each other. You got it? Now let me tell you the types of the giant cells. There are four types of giant cells: foreign body giant cells, Langhans giant cell. Totten giant cell. It's not totten. It's totten. And giant cells in tumor. Let me explain you. All the giant cells have multiple nucleus. You know, twenty to hundred nucleus in one cell. That is a giant cell. See the foreign body. See first the foreign body giant cell. In the foreign body, can you see this is foreign body? Where is the nucleus? The nucleus is present haphazard throughout the cytoplasm. There is no sequence. In foreign body, the nucleus is present haphazard throughout the cytoplasm. Okay, but in Langhans. nucleus nucleus is not haphazard it is present at the periphery it is present at the periphery forming a two third ring a two third ring it is known as horse horse shoe ring horse shoe ring or else the nucleus is present at the poles the north pole and the south pole right this is known as langhans now see the difference the foreign body the langhans please appreciate the foreign body and the langhans in the foreign body the nucleus are present haphazardly right and in the langhans the nucleus is present either at the poles or in the form of the horseshoe learn the examples are important tb is a common example of both type in tb both type of uh, foreign body as well as langhans giant cells uh, are seen it's very important pyq along with uh, tb in foreign body the second example you have to learn is sarcoidosis and along with tb the second example in langhans you have to learn is the leprosy it's leprosy please learn the examples the third is the totten in totten where is the nucleus where is the nucleus the nucleus is present at the center not at the periphery the nucleus multiple nucleus are forming a ring multiple nucleus forming a ring and not only this in the cytoplasm you can see the you can see the vacuoles the vacuoles in the cytoplasm is very important it's totten type only one example xanthoma e the diagram you can get a image based question very frequently c the definitions i mean where is the what is the arrangement of the nucleus and see the examples in each of them yes say so the three type of the giant cells the three important type the first is the foreign body then langhans then totten i'm coming on the tumor giant cells also see these three first in the foreign body giant cells the nucleus is scattered throughout the cytoplasm example uh, you have to learn here is the tb leprosy foreign body the second is the langhans i told you reverse i guess ha right? na examples here in langhans the example is tb and sarcoid 
liprescents sarcoid i told you reverse but learn this one in langhans the nuclei are present the nucleus is present either at the periphery in the form of the horseshoe ring or they are clustered at the two poles right and you can see here please appreciate this diagram and this diagram see where is the nucleus haphazard throughout the cell see where is the nucleus in the form of the horseshoe ring two third ring this is foreign body and this one is langhans say yes got it the third one is the totten in totten the nucleus is present you can see a real diagram they are formed they are present at the center and they are forming a ring they are forming a ring see the cytoplasm is the vacuolated learn the example is xanthoma learn the example foreign body langhans totten we will revise foreign body nucleus present haphazard throughout the cytoplasm example tb example leprosy the second langhans the nucleus is present at the periphery horseshoe ring or at the poles example tb example sarcoid okay and totten the nucleus is present forming a ring at the center and the cytoplasm is vacuolated example xanthoma never forget never never the last one the last type of the giant cells sometimes in tumors they are present but not important at your level you know reed sternberg cell you know in hodgkin's lymphoma today only i will teach you it is a type of giant cell and other tumors also have that so we are done with the various types of the giant cells now there is a special type of granuloma known as stellate granuloma what do you mean by stellate stellate ka matlab hota hai star the meaning of the stellate is star the meaning of the stellate is star can you see here the granuloma the shape of the granuloma is looking like a star you know how does a star it's like this the granuloma is like a star that's why known as stellate very commonly asked pyq in your exam learn the two examples of the stellate granuloma at the tip of your tongue star shaped granuloma it is the only granuloma in which the center have the neutrophil normally granuloma don't have neutrophil you know the three type of the cells the center have epithelioid cells and giant cells surrounded by t lymphocyte and outermost is the fibroblast but it is an exception where the center have the neutrophils example is cat scratch disease and lgb lymphogranuloma venerum so learn the two examples cat scratch and lgb these are the two examples where stellate shaped granulomas are seen lastly before ending this chapter <clears throat> let me tell you the examples how many examples of granuloma you know can you tell me melin shalini cabalia <coughs> anyone anyone i cannot read the names anyone can you tell me how many examples of granulomatous inflammation you know examples just example i know every one of you will taste say tb tb ke alawa batao more examples how many examples you know i want you to tell me at least 18 20 examples right how many of you know okay let me tell you there are eight bacterial causes can you see the eight bacterial causes of granuloma there are four fungal 8 plus 4 12 and there are one parasitic 13th and there are four miscellaneous 14 15 16 17 18 18 causes of granuloma 18 yes sarcoid is right tb everyone knows shalini apart from that i am asking okay let me let me tell you learn the eight causes of the bacteria one is tb that everyone knows tb is a granuloma granulomatous disease leprosy syphilis you should learn also right granuloma inguinal brucella cat scratch mein cat scratch disease mein stellate granuloma just now i told you stellate shaped granuloma toluremia and glanders learn the eight tb leprosy syphilis granuloma inguinal brucella cat scratch toluremia and glanders if you don't learn it's also okay but have a look on the example so that in mcq you can pick it up these are the eight bacteria learn the causative organism also tb is caused by mycobacterium tb leprosy is caused by mycobacterium leprae likewise so these are the eight bacterial causes there are four fungal causes one is actinomycosis blastomycosis cryptomycosis coccidiomycosis right you know the causative organism so please learn the fungal causes parasite may only one parasite form granuloma so only one cystosoma cystostomiasis okay cystosoma is the parasite and in miscellaneous there is sarcoid crohn's disease silicosis berylliosis foreign body granuloma so please these are the examples yes in the malaria there is drug granuloma absolutely right it is also a specialized form of granuloma in which plasmodium falciparum is forming the granuloma the granuloma is filled with the parasite plasmodium durex granuloma very good so we are done with chronic inflammation also we will solve some mcqs and pack this chapter also so the first question is in front of you can anyone try the first question is in front of you can you try please what is the correct answer the macrophages are converted to epithelioid cell by which cytokine by which cytokine is it interleukin 2 is it interferon gamma it's gamma is it tnf alpha and is it tnf tgf beta 
What is the correct answer? So I told you macrophages are converted into a specialized epithelioid cell by which cytokine? And then the same cytokine uh, causes the fusion of multiple epithelioid cells and convert them to giant cells. Yes, absolutely right, Nikhil. Everyone else is also right. No, no, no. Answer is not C. What is the correct answer? Yes, the answer is B, not C. It's interferon gamma, which converts the macrophages to epithelioid cell. Interferon gamma. Interferon gamma. Some of you are saying TNF alpha. No, TNF alpha is responsible for the fibroblast. Interferon gamma is there. The next question is in front of you. The epithelioid cells and multinucleated giant cells. These are giant cells, huh? No? Of granulomatous inflammation are derived from. Epithelioid cells and multinucleated giant cells are derived from basophil or eosinophil or T lymphocyte or monocyte macrophage. So what does what does epithelioid cell and multinucleated giant cells are derived from? Have you understood the question? I have told you the entire sequence. Now, what is the correct answer here? What is the correct answer here? Yes. So the epithelioid cells and multinucleated giant cells are derived from which cells from the blood? From the blood, which cells is coming out and converted into epithelioid cells? And multinucleated giant cells. Yes, you all are right. The correct answer here is the D. I told you the sequence in the bone marrow, it's monoblast. Once it go in the blood, it is known as monocyte. Once it come out of the blood, it is known as macrophage. Once the macrophage is modified, it is known as epithelioid cell. And epithelioid cell fuses with each other and known as giant cell. So, in the question, they are asking for epithelioid and giant cell. So, basically, they are derived from monocyte and macrophage. You all are right. The correct answer here is D. Okay. The next question is not a characteristic feature of granuloma. Not. Tell me one feature which is not characteristic of granuloma. What is the correct answer? Is it chronic inflammatory infiltrate? Is it epithelioid cell? Is it giant cell? Or is it PMN with fibrinoid necrosis at the center? PMN means neutrophil. What is not seen in granuloma? Tell me which thing is not seen in granuloma. Very easy question. If you know the composition of granuloma, you can answer it very easily. Which thing is not seen in granuloma? Yes? Yes, you all are right. The correct answer is again D. Granuloma never contain neutrophil. No, it's not contained. Epithelioid cells are present. Giant cell is present. Chronic inflammation is there. But neutrophils are not present. And it's not fibrinoid necrosis. It's caseous necrosis. Both the things are wrong. And PMN is seen only in one type of granuloma, steely granuloma. That is an exception. That is an exception. Answer is not B. Gaisley. Answer is D. Epithelioid cells are present. Now they are asking not a characteristic feature. So PMN are not present. Right. The next question is in front of you. I guess everyone knows the answer. Steelate granuloma is a feature of. So, steelate granuloma is a feature. Steelate is star-shaped granuloma. Can you tell, tell me star-shaped granuloma seen in which two diseases I told you, the two examples I told you. What is the correct answer here? Yes, star-shaped granuloma. Beautiful granuloma. The exceptional granuloma where the center contains the neutrophil. Yes, what is the correct answer? Yes, you all are right. The correct answer here is the cat scratch disease. The correct answer here is the cat scratch disease. We are done with inflammation also. Till now we are done with two chapters. The third chapter hemodynamic we will start after a break. So let's take a break. Let's say currently it's 11.30 now. So we will start again at 11.50. Let's take 20 minute break. Let's take a 20 minute break. Okay. 30 to 40, 40 to 50. Yes. 11.50. So please everyone back. I am not ending the session. The session is on. I only I will, I will mute and uh, you know the camera will be off. The same link you have to join. In this link only we will be back at 11.50. Okay. If you got it, give me a thumbs up. Everyone give me a thumbs up. So we are taking a break. Just for 20 minutes. Appreciate it. Give me a thumbs up. 11.50 I will be back here. And we will start with hemodynamics. Followed by neoplasia. Followed by genetics. And uh, uh, immunopathology. So, uh, before lunch, we will finish the general. We will take lunch break for 30 minutes or 45 minutes. After that, in the evening, I mean after 2 o'clock, we will be taking the hematology. So, hematology, I will teach you few anemias and leukemias. Okay. Thank you.
Hello everyone, am I live, am I visible, am I audible? Give me a minute to confirm. If I am clearly visible, audible, I will start the session. You can write in the chat box, I can see your chat. We will wait for few seconds. I am just waiting for the confirmation. If I am clearly visible, audible, I will start the session. I guess there is a little bit lag. Okay. Can you write down in the chat box if I am clearly visible, audible? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you for confirming. Give me a minute. Okay, I guess yes, it's working now. Okay, so let's continue the session. I welcome for this uh, session. Uh, so after the break, let's continue the session. Let's start with hemodynamic disorders. Okay, in the first uh, session, we have already completed the general pathology, cell adaptation, cell injury, cell death, acute inflammation, chronic inflammation. Now I'm starting with hemodynamic disorders. Here basically, I would like to discuss four disorders. I would, I would like to discuss edema, thrombosis, embolism and shock in detail. And after that, we will move on the next chapter quickly. Okay, so let's start with hemodynamic disorder. Let's start with edema. What is edema? How you will define edema? Does anyone know what is edema? What is edema? So in Hindi, if you say edema in layman language, it's swelling. Swelling on any portion of the body. Swelling. You know, Hindi me kaintu sujan agai kain bhi. That is the edema. You know, human body is made up of cell. From head to toe, we all are made up of cell. All our organs are made up of cell. The cells are like this in the organ. The space between the cell is known as interstitial space. Can you see the space? The space between the cell is known as interstitial space. Can you see the space? Yes. It's interstitial space. It is all interstitial space. Normally, interstitial space is dry. There is no fluid in that. But if fluid accumulates in the interstitial space, it gives rise to edema. Can you see here? It's edema. Edema is the accumulation of the fluid. Abnormal and excessive accumulation of the fluid in what? In interstitial space. But students have trouble in understanding what is interstitial space. Interstitial space is the space between the cells. If fluid is accumulating here, the fluid is accumulating, it is known as edema. So please learn the definition of the edema. There is a related term known as effusion. Effusion and edema are same. The pathophysiology is same. Here also the fluid get accumulated. The abnormal and excessive fluid accumulation is there, but where? Not in the interstitial space, in the body cavities. We know that we have few cavities in our body, like the lungs are surrounded by pleural cavity, you can see. The heart is surrounded by pericardial cavity. So if there is fluid in pleural cavity or pericardial cavity, it is known as effusion. So can anyone define edema and effusion for me? What is edema and effusion? The pathophysiology of both of them is same. That's why I'm taking the two topics together, edema and effusion. So what is edema? What is effusion? In both of them, edema and effusion, there is abnormal and excessive abnormal and excessive accumulation of fluid here in edema in interstitial space but in effusion it is accumulated in the cavities like pleural cavity pericardial cavity whatever cavity so edema and effusion that is the definition now for understanding the pathophysiology of edema and effusion you have to understand the starling's law the normal fluid exchange uh, you know human body from head to toe we have cells we have organs all the organs receive blood we all know all the organs receive blood why all the organs receive blood why blood is required for all the organs for all the cells all the tissues why because of supply of oxygen basically we, organs do not require blood oxygen require oxygen uh, organs require oxygen from the blood you know so let me draw an organ imagine this is any organ of human body these are the cells of the organ these are the cells of the organ. This is the blood supply. This is the blood supply. So this is the pure blood. This is the artery. The pure blood in the artery, pure or oxygenated blood is coming here. See the arrow. It is coming towards here. Here exchange takes place and it converts. This is capillary. And here it is converted to vein. In the vein, it is deoxygenated blood. So how does the oxygenated blood converts into deoxygenated blood? Have you ever thought? Can you tell me how oxygenated blood converts into deoxygenated blood? How does it happen? How does? So basically at cellular level exchange takes place. So at cellular level the fluid comes out. Does the exchange. The oxygen is given to the cell and carbon dioxide is taken from the cell. So after the exchange the whatever fluid comes out the same fluid goes back. And that's why the tissue is dry. There is no edema. The tissue is dry. Only for exchange purpose the fluid is coming out momentarily. The fluid is coming out doing the exchange going back. 
the fluid is coming out doing the exchange going back so this happens normally physiologically at arterial end fluid comes out at venous end fluid go fluid fluid goes back in the capillary so basically you can see a capillary so basically there is a capillary let me draw a capillary for you this is a capillary so capillary have two ends this is the arterial end of the capillary this is the venous end of the capillary this is a capillary so at arterial end the oxygenated blood enters and at venous end the deoxygenated blood takes out so what is happening in between in between this is happening the oxygenated blood comes out does the exchange and then at venous end it goes back give me a thumbs up if you got this basic concept so this is the fluid exchange we will talk so for this fluid exchange you have to understand the pressure how does the pressure acts normally there are two types of pressure let me draw a capillary there are two types of pressures acting the one is the hydrostatic pressure the pressure due to water it's outward look at the arrow it always outward it is due to the water the second is osmotic pressure it is due to protein you know the protein the albumin present in the blood it is always inward look at the arrow to learn the basics hydrostatic pressure is outward osmotic or oncotic pressure is inward so learn these two things right now you can tell me the values of hydrostatic and osmotic pressure at the arterial end and at the venous end again this is a capillary this is a capillary this is the arterial end this is the venous end please tell me hydrostatic pressure osmotic pressure here and please tell me the values of the hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure here right osmotic pressure is always same it's always 25 25 mm 25 mm it's throughout there is no problem in that there is no change in that protein is throughout same whatever protein present here the same protein present here that's why it's always 25 but see the values of the hydrostatic pressure at arterial end the hydrostatic pressure is 38 because water is more after that water will leave so hydrostatic pressure will fall because water is leaving right and it is falling it is falling up to 12 here it become 12 mm right now see the change the change in the hydrostatic pressure you have to learn the values come on you have to learn the values right hydrostatic is outward osmotic is inward you know the basics okay now tell me at arterial end what is the net net which is more so you will say ma'am net is 38 minus 25 can you do the calculations yes it's 13 mm 13 mm outward or inward which is more 38 is more or 25 is more of course 38 is more hydrostatic is more so net 13 is outward so with 13 mm the fluid goes out and do the calculation at the venous end at the venous end it's 25 minus 12 again it's 13 but this time it's inward this time it's inward so with the same 13 the fluid comes back you got my point so basically at high, at arterial land you can see 38 minus 25 the fluid is going out with 13 mm does the exchange by exchange i mean two things i mean two things the fluid is giving oxygen to the cell taking carbon dioxide from the cell and after all the exchange at venous end it is coming back so with 13 mm it is going out with 13 mm it is coming back so whatever going out it is same coming back so there is no balance there is no balance here that's where the tissue is dry after that at the end the tissue is the tissue is uh dry you got my point so at arterial end the fluid goes out at venous end it is coming back so the tissue is dry the tissue is dry at the end with 13 mm the fluid is going out with the same 13 mm the fluid is coming in give me a thumbs up everyone give me a thumbs up everyone give me a thumbs up kindly you don't spam medico nepal please don't spam sending the same same message again and again okay so this is the thing okay so with whatever uh, pressure the learn the values you have to learn the values okay now any change in pressure if the outward is more imagine a condition outward pressure is more or inward is less what will happen more fluid will come but less will go so what will lead it will lead to accumulation of the fluid and accumulation of the fluid is in is known as edema the accumulation of fluid is known as edema okay so hydrostatic pressure is the outward pressure osmotic pressure is the inward pressure so osmotic pressure is always 25 but hydrostatic pressure at arterial end is 38 at venous end is 12 you have seen the values you do the calculation at both here also you do the calculation answer is 13 mm here the calculation answer is 13 mm but this 13 is outward this 13 is inward so there is a balance whatever goes out you can see here with the same pressure it is coming in so tissue is dry insist the word dry there is no edema there is no edema when the edema will occur when whenever come more and go less 
so there is accumulation of the fluid right you will say ma'am this is very complicated is it really means when I've, i i read it for the first time now when i was in second prof i was really wondering this is operating in my body constantly i'm not aware of it at every moment whether we aware or don't aware this all mechanics is applied in our body in each and every capillary this is automatically taking place we don't have to take care of that we don't have to take care of that like what is my hydrostatic pressure what is my osmotic pressure we don't have to take care of that right it is taking place automatically okay so that is the hydrostatic pressure osmotic pressure balances take place now what happens even if small change just suppose instead of 13 it is 14 just suppose instead of 13 it may be 12 so what happens a little bit accumulation who does take care of it so god has given a backup the name of the backup is the lymphatic. The name of the backup is the lymphatic. We all have lymphatics. So whatever a small amount of fluid is accumulated here, now it is taken away by the lymphatic. At the end, the tissue is dry. We don't have edema. I don't have edema. The healthy human don't have edema because God has given this mechanics inside us. This is the pressures operating at our capillary. That's why we don't have edema. Even a little bit edema is there that is taken care by the lymphatic. So tell me the causes. So normally there is a balance between the outward and the inward pressure. Even after the balance, a small amount of the fluid is there. It is taken care by the lymphatic. If you got it, let me know. Okay. Okay. If you got it, let me know. Okay. So, this is how normally we don't have edema. This is the reason for that. Now, you tell me the causes of edema. If you have understood this, you can tell me three causes of edema. Out of five, you can tell me from three from this diagram. Can you tell me? You will say, ma'am, the first reason it can be there. Outward pressure is more. It can be the reason. I mean, hydrostatic pressure is more. Or oncotic pressure is less. Oncotic pressure is less. Inward is less. So if outward is more or inward is less or both of them, it leads to edema. Yes, agree or do not agree. Outward zada hai, inward kam hai. So there is accumulation of fluid. So increase hydrostatic pressure, decrease osmotic pressure. And the third reason is lymphatic obstruction. Lymphatic. If lymphatics get obstructed, this also leads to edema. So these are the three main reasons of the edema in front of you. If you understand the Starling's law, there is no need to learn. You can yourself tell me the three, three reasons for the edema. Okay. So increase hydrostatic pressure, decrease osmotic pressure and lymphatic obstruction. These are the three main causes of edema. Learn these three. Increase hydrostatic pressure, decrease oncotic osmotic pressure. Oncotic and osmotic is same. Okay. And lymphatic obstruction. The fourth one you have to learn sodium water retention. I will explain. And fifth is increased vascular permeability in inflammation we have seen. I will explain. So there are five causes of edema out of which the three can be understood from the starlings itself. Okay. Now let me give you the uh, causes or examples of each of them. Now the patient, you are a doctor now, of course. You are a doctor and the patient will come to you, doctor, I'm having swelling. I'm having swelling. Now the cause of the swelling can be anything. Swelling can be any, any part of the body. Now it can be due to increased hydrostatic pressure. It can be due to decreased osmotic pressure. It can be due to lymphatic obstruction. It can be due to sodium and water retention. And it can be due to increased vascular permeability. It can be affecting different organs, different physiology. So treatment is different. Prognosis is different. So for patient it's only swelling. But being a doctor swelling have all these differentials. So let me give you the examples of each category. Let me give you the first Increase hydrostatic pressure. Do you know some example of increased hydrostatic pressure? Edema due to increased hydrostatic pressure. There are two examples. The first is the cardiac left heart failure or right heart failure. Let me do right heart failure. Imagine the right ventricle is not pumping. What will happen? Common sense. What will happen? The right ventricle is not pumping. What will happen? The blood will not go ahead in the lungs for the purification. The lungs, the blood will not go ahead. It will go backward. The right ventricle is not pumping. No. Right heart failure. So blood will go backward. In the backward from left, right ventricle, it will go to right auricle. From right auricle, it will go to SVC, IVC. From SVC, IVC, it will go to all organs. All organs veins. So more blood. More blood is going because of the backward flow. More blood means more water. More water means more hydrostatic pressure. More hydrostatic pressure, so all organs will have edema. So in right heart failure, patient have anasarca. All organs edema. This is the reason. This is the reason. So heart failure can be the reason. Or second, postural edema. Especially seen in the persons who are standing like traffic policemen and all. So you can see the person is standing. So you know, gravity is operating all the time. Newton has given gravity. He, he discovered gravity, I mean. So gravity is operating all the time. So because of the gravity, most of the blood is present in the lag veins. So out of the 5 liter of the blood in the body, most of the lugs, uh, blood is in the uh, lag veins because of the gravity. More blood means more water more water means more hydrostatic pressure so this person will have edema of the legs and the foot 
So this is known as postural edema. So learn two examples. Cardiac edema and postural edema are due to increased hydrostatic pressure. Give me a thumbs up if you got it. Everything is very conceptual. If you understand now, there is nothing to learn in pathology. Just understand it. It will be forever. You know, and it will be like fun. Okay. So please learn. Please learn the two things. The cardiac edema and the postural edema are due to increased hydrostatic pressure. You have seen this diagram. You can see right heart failure, the backward pressure, more blood, more water, more hydrostatic pressure leading to edema. Such edema in all organs is due to heart failure, it's hydrostatic pressure. And edema in the person who is standing, not only traffic havildar, only uh, uh, all the persons whose job is like more and more standing. Because of the standing, because of the gravity, more blood is in the lag veins. More blood, more water, more hydrostatic pressure leading to edema. Right. The, the second cause of the edema is decreased osmotic pressure. Decreased osmotic pressure means due to decreased protein content. The protein content is less. Decreased Osmotic pressure is decreased protein content. Which protein? The main protein here is the albumin. The main protein here is the albumin. Albumin is the main protein. Okay. The main protein here is the albumin. Uh, we have albumin also, globulin also. But when, when total protein, what is the normal protein in our blood? Normal protein is 6 to 8 gram per deciliter. You, me, all healthy individuals have this level. If it is below 5, it will lead to edema. Please learn the values. If it is below 5 gram per deciliter, it will lead to edema and main protein which leads to edema, the decrease is the albumin. Give me the causes, examples. From where the protein comes in the blood, blood vessel? Simple question, simple answer. Do you know from where protein comes in the blood? Osama, Shalini, Kuldeep, Tejdeep, Pankit, anyone? Do you know from where protein comes in the blood? There are two sources. Number one, whatever protein we eat in the diet, do we eat protein? Of course, the pulses, soya bean, egg, meat, whatever we eat, veg, non-veg, it contains protein. So, the protein is absorbed and from the GIT it is coming, number one. Number two, liver also synthesizes protein, so it is com coming from the liver. So, here it is coming by absorption, here it is coming by synthesis, okay, in the blood it is coming. Does protein excreted in the urine via kidney? No, normal human don't have protein in the urine. Normally healthy individual don't excrete it, don't excrete it. Now, there can be three causes for four of protein in the blood either the absorption is less there is problem in the intestine like malabsorption or the synthesis is less there is problem in the liver like cirrhosis and stage disease or cirrhosis or absorption is normal synthesis is normal but the excretion is more right the kidney kidneys are defective in the kidney there is glomerulonephritis or some disease nephrotic syndrome is there leading to more and more excretion so there can be three causes, three causes of decreased oncotic pressure. You know, in malabsorption, patient have edema. In liver cirrhosis, patient have edema. In nef glomerulonephritis, nephrotic syndrome, patient have edema. But the reason for all these three edema is same decreased oncotic pressure. Give me a thumbs up if you got it. So patient will come to you, doctor, I'm having edema. So you have to look for the albumin level, protein level. If the protein level is low, there can be three organ problem. Problem in the kidney, problem in the liver or problem in the intestine. So you have to look for that. For liver, you will do LFT, you will do imaging. For kidney, you will do RFT and imaging. For intestine, you will do endoscopy. You will do biopsy. You can do some imaging, whatever. So based on that, you will make the diagnosis. You will treat the disease. So for patient, it's very simple swelling. But being a doctor, there are multiple differentials. You got it? Say yes if you got it. So there are three reasons for decrease, decrease oncotic pressure or decrease protein. Number one, problem in the intestine, decrease absorption, that is malabsorption. There is problem in the synthesis, decrease synthesis, that is liver disease or cirrhosis or increased excretion, problem in the kidney, that is nephrotic syndrome. You got it? Everything is conceptual if you get. So you can see decrease absorption, decrease synthesis or increase excretion. The three causes of Decrease oncotic pressure leading to edema. Coming on the third, third cause is the lymphatic obstruction. What do you mean by lymphatic obstruction? Can you give me the example when lymphatic obstruction lead to edema? At least give one example. At least give one important example of lymphoedema. The edema due to lymphatic obstruction is lymphoedema. Why God has given us lymphatics? The lymphatics are the backup. Now I told you, right? Imagine a lady is coming to you, Dr. I am having a lump in the breast, a lump in the breast, okay. So you are doing the biopsy and it's a cancer, it's malignant cancer, not benign one, it's malignant. So what is the treatment? Of course, the treatment is surgery. You will ask the lady to get it operated, it's a malignancy, it can do the metastasis. So in operation, we don't remove only cancer, we remove the axillary lymphatics also, right? Because these are the regional lymphatics and tumor can spread via the lymphatics, you know that, I will teach you in neoplasia also, 
right so we will remove the tumor we will do the lumpectomy mastectomy and we will remove the lymphatics also it is necessary to prevent the metastasis but these were not vestigial organ the lymphatics god has given the lymphatics as a backup so after the surgery this lady will present like this edema of the of that particular limb right or left edema of that limb so it is the breast surgery with axillary lymph node removal it is the post surgery morbidity so if we don't do it the patient will have metastasis and if we are doing it the patient is having lifelong this morbidity so it is the most common example of lymphoedema okay number one number two there is a parasite known as bucheria bancrofti the name of the parasite it's a nematode okay what does it do it blocks the lymphatic the adult worm limbs in the lymphatic can you see the worm the male and the female worm they are blocking the lymphatic once the lymphatics are present but they are blocked they are non-functional it leads to edema of the lag it is known as elephantitis hathi palm you see the the lag is looking like an elephant that's why known as elephantitis elephantitis got it and third is milroy disease you know congenital god has given the defective lymphatics or absent lymphatics it is milroy disease so learn the three examples removal of the axillary lymph node after breast cancer Number two, the Bucheria bancrofti obstructing the lymphatics known as elephantitis. And number three, Milroy disease, hereditary lymphoedema. You got it? So these are the three examples. The fourth cause is the sodium water retention. So you know sodium, wherever there is a sodium, there is a water. So due to any reason, either, either due to renal failure or due to heart failure, there is sodium water retention in the body. And all the pressure are, are normal. Hydrostatic pressure is normal. Oncotic pressure is normal. Still the patient can have edema. And this is due to sodium water retention. Okay. And last is increased capillary permeability. Have I told you this diagram? In, in inflammation chapter, you can see the blood vessel here. The endothelial lining is continuous. Okay. The endothelial lining is continuous. You can see the blood vessel here. Here also see the blood vessel. But here the endothelium lining is not continuous. There are gaps in between. See the gaps. The gaps are present in between. So I told you when the endothelial lining is discontinuous and the gaps are present, the gaps are known as increased vascular permeability. When the endothelial lining is continuous, only fluid goes out. But when the gaps are present along with the fluid, protein also goes out. So this edema is exudate edema. Basically, it's pus. It's exudate edema. It's exudate edema. Right. So whenever there is the inflammation, I told you the five vascular events. No? The fourth event is the, is the increased vascular permeability that leads to exudate type of edema. Now learn two things. The edema can be generalized throughout the body. Throughout the body it is known as anasarca. Anasarca is throughout the body edema. And it can be focal, localized, mosquito bite or any insect bite. So it can be focal, it can be generalized. So these are the five causes of the edema. Can you please enumerate? Can you please enumerate? Increase hydrostatic pressure. Okay. Decrease oncotic pressure. Lymphatic obstruction sodium retention and inflammation or increased vascular permeability learn the examples the examples are important so increased hydrostatic pressure is cardiac failure right heart failure leading to edema of all organ postural edema and traffic policeman okay decrease osmotic pressure three causes decrease absorption from the intestine decrease synthesis from the liver and increase excretion in the kidney right lymphatic obstruction again three example after breast surgery axillary lymph node removal, Bucheria bancrofti leading to elephantitis and Milroy disease. Okay, sodium retention, heart failure, renal failure and inflammation may acute inflammation basically acute inflammation. Everyone give me a thumbs up at least I try giving you the causes of the edema. These are the causes as well as pathogenesis of the edema. Yes, yes, can we go ahead? Can we go ahead? Okay, so edema is of two type. Edema is of two type. Transudate Exudate. We have seen the patho pathogenesis. Now, edema. How many types of edema is there? How many of you know the meaning of the transudate exudate? Diagram is in front of you. See everyone here. Concentrate here on your gazettes. See the lining of the endothelium. It's continuous. It's continuous. Here it's continuous and the pressure is equal. Outward pressure is equal to inward pressure. No edema. See the background is clean. See the background. It's clean. There is no edema. See the second diagram. Here also the lining is continuous. You will see ma'am, the lining is continuous here also. I cannot see the gap. Yes, the lining is continuous. There is no problem. But see, this arrow is thicker than that arrow. So, I mean to say the outward pressure is more as compared to inward pressure. Either the outward pressure increases or the inward decreases. So, only fluid came out. Can you see the background? In the background, I appreciate the blue color. Fluid is accumulating in the background. So, only fluid is coming out. And this edema is known as transudate edema, which contains only fluid. 
only fluid see the third diagram in the third diagram this is endothelial cell this is endothelial cell this is a... now you can see the gaps between them oh there are gaps from these gaps the uh, protein will come out the cell will come out protein and cell so along with fluid there is protein and there is cell this edema is known as exudate edema this edema is known as exudate edema you got it so transudate edema can i say transudate is low protein or low cell so can i say transudate edema is protein poor cell poor no protein no cell but exudate is protein rich cell rich because the gaps are present can i say this is non inflammatory edema it, it doesn't occur in inflammation and this is inflammatory edema this occurs in inflammation because of increased vascular permeability the gaps formation say yes so as i told you here protein is less cells are less here protein is high cells are high since here protein and cells are less specific gravity is also less since protein and cells are high the specific gravity is also high okay and ldh is also low ldh is also high so four things are low protein cell specific gravity and ldh and all four things are high there only thing which is opposite is the ph here ph is high and here ph is low you have to learn okay so that you have to learn the differences between transudate exudate does anyone have any uh, difficulty in understanding the transudate and exudate transudate exudate the two types of the edema can you please tell me so here protein is less cells are less specific gravity is less and ldh is less all the three, four things are more there okay but here ph is more than 7.3 is it disconnected i guess it is connected now i guess it is connected now okay so increase accumulation of fluid in the interstitial space is known as is it edema effusion transudate or exudate what is the correct answer so please highlight the word interstitial space Increase accumulation of fluid in the interstitial spaces known as. What is the correct? Yes, it's edema. Very good. You all are right. Absolutely right, Shalini. What about others? Please answer it. Please everyone answer it. The correct answer here is A. Very good. Very good. If I change the question, instead of interstitial space, I say the word cavities. What is your answer now, Usama? Would you like to change the answer? Dr. Parveen? Islam? Anyone? Would you like to change the answer now? Yes, in this case, the answer will change. Instead of edema, we will say effusion. So I told you the definitions very correctly. The next question, edema occurs when plasma protein level is below what? What is the normal plasma protein in blood? 6 to 8 gram per deciliter. 6 to 8 gram per deciliter. When it is below what? It will lead to edema. When it is below what? I told you the value. When it is below 5. When it is below 5, then it will lead to edema. So, correct answer is 5. Correct answer is 5 yes so coming to the next question all of the following are included in the pathogenesis of edema except don't miss the word except i told you the five causes of edema now decrease hydrostatic pressure is it a cause or does it is not a cause decrease osmotic pressure plasma osmotic pressure lymphatic obstruction and increase vascular permeability so tell me which is not a cause of edema not i am asking not so you people are getting confused you people are getting why you are saying C. You are saying C for which option? Yes, Lee. Yes, the correct answer is A. It is decrease. It is not never decrease osmotic pressure. The increase, uh, I'm sorry, increase hydrostatic pressure leads to edema, not decrease. So, incorrect among them is A. The remaining three are correct. And uh, decrease osmotic pressure also leads to edema, lymphatic obstruction also leads to edema, and increased vascular permeability also leads to edema. The correct answer is not B, Ankit. The correct is A. Okay, you are getting confused, I guess. The question is about accept. Got it? Can I move ahead? Yes, moving to the next topic, thrombosis. What is thrombosis? Can I move to the next topic? What is thrombosis? Imagine I have a cut here. What will happen? Of course, I will bleed. Everyone bleeds. Whenever we have injury at any portion of the body, we start bleeding. How long we bleed? We bleed for the next few seconds, say next few minutes. After that, the bleeding stops automatically. Why does the bleeding stop automatically? Because of the clot formation. So here at the site of the injury, the blood vessel is sealed. There is an injury in the blood vessel. It is sealed with the help of a clot. So let me draw a diagram for you. Imagine this is the blood vessel and this is the site of the injury. Okay, here the endothelial lining is continuous and here it is discontinuous. So this is the site of the injury. This is the site of the injury you can see. Imagine. So here the person is bleeding whenever we have injury. So first the platelet will come and form a clot here, the primary clot. 
the platelet will seal it stop the bleeding temporarily and after that it is stabilized by fibrin by coagulation cascade the fibrin so secondary clot is formed so basically this site is sealed and patient stop bleeding you will say yes ma'am we all know that this is known as clotting this is known as clotting right so this is the uh, normal physiological clotting it is not a disease it is known as hemostasis hemo matlab blood bleeding stasis matlab stoppage stasis stasis means stoppage so bleeding stoppage whenever we have cut anywhere we don't think we say okay we just press it for few seconds it stop automatically because it is a physiological phenomenon given by the god in all human body it is hemostasis it is not a disease it is a useful physiological phenomenon so you will say ma'am yes we can understand hemostasis but how does you are teaching us thrombosis right now no how does thrombus thrombosis is related to this why you are teaching this here because thrombosis is the same as that hemostasis without injury if the same thing occurs without injury it's a disease if it occurs after injury it's physiological it's useful but if it occurs with just imagine i don't have injury anywhere on the body and still inside my blood vessels small small clots are formed they are not known as clots now they are known as thrombus because they are without injury they are they are not useful they are harmful they are causing obstruction in the flow of the blood now this this um, uh, is uh, this is a blood vessel artery supplying to some organ now so this organ can have ischemia because of the obstructed blood flow so it is harmful to have thrombus so with injury it is known as hemostasis it's physiological it's useful without injury clotting is known as thrombus and it's harmful and it's a disease say yes if you got it yes i'm coming on with your try but you got it what is thrombus so thrombus is the clotting without injury in short what is thrombus it's the clotting same as that of clotting like hemostasis but the glitch here the glitch to be taken here is without injury without it is occurring without injury in a intact blood vessel okay the formation of a blood clot in unruptured blood vessel unruptured means uninjured so that is the glitch you have to take here that is thrombosis it is the pathological form of intravascular fibrin platelet two things are there na in the clot first platelet come and they form a clot then it is stabilized by a thread like material that is fibrin so it is also made up of the same thing it is also made up of the same thing and it is known as thrombus it is known as thrombus you can see in the intact blood vessel how does the clot is forming in the intact blood vessel you can see these are the platelet you can see these are the rbcs these are the platelet and the thread like material can you see the thread like material it is fibrin so this is a thrombus this is a thrombus so the same thing is written hemostasis thrombosis hemostasis after the injury thrombosis without injury right so please understand the differences one is hemostasis one is thrombus this is after injury this is without injury this is useful physiological this is harmful causing ischemia everyone say yes everyone say yes got it got it so coming on the path of physiology now you may be thinking ma'am why without injury the clot is formed why without injury the clot is formed there can be three causes which are known as virtuo triad the three causes what are the three causes so imagine this is the blood vessel this is the endothelial lining of the blood vessel so endothelial lining is injured by some toxin or something present in the blood endothelial but there is no bleeding means endothelial lining is injured but bleeding is not there still the blood vessel is intact so because of the endothelial lining injury the clot can be formed here in an intact blood vessel which is not bleeding now it is not hemostasis it is thrombus so the first cause is the endothelial injury say yes the first cause is endothelial injury number 2 i said you this is the blood vessel i told you bernoulli's theorem na no? i guess i told you na no? in the last uh, uh, first session what is bernoulli's theorem the the heavy thing travels at the center so basically the wbc and the rbc travel at the center and in the periphery there is plasma the wbc rbc is at the center and the periphery there is plasma and this blood flow is known as axial blood flow axial blood flow so till the blood is flowing in all of us the heart is pumping continuously the blood is flowing continuously it is never stopping the blood is flowing continuously this is axial blood flow imagine for a few seconds the blood blood flow is stopped due to any reason there is stasis of the blood like an in inflammation the last step was stasis the blood is not flowing it is stasis so due to the gravity the rbc will fall down the platelet will fall down you know the wbc will fall down you know because of the gravity and they form a clot there they form a clot there so stasis can lead to formation of clot altered blood flow that is stasis or turbulence the second cause and third cause hypercoagulability now in a blood in a blood god has given two things the procoagulant and the anticoagulant what are procoagulant they promote coagulation they causes coagulation anticoagulation coagulants inhibit coagulation so basically we all have a balance 
we all have a balance in my blood procoagulants are equal to anticoagulants so they neutralize each other they balance each other but due to any condition if procoagulants are more and anti are less so such a blood is known as hypercoagulable blood hypercoagulable blood and that leads to clot formation even without injury so the third cause is the hypercoagulability so can you tell me the three causes please osama tejdeep mohit debanjan anyone can you tell me the three causes of the thrombosis the virtual triad what are the three causes the first one is the endothelial injury okay the second one is the stasis of the blood or um, the stasis or the turbulence of the blood and the third one is the what is the third one i told you hypercoagulability hypercoagulability please write down the three causes ultra important pyq the three causes of the thrombus okay now coming on the types of the thrombus ultra important where does the thrombus is present if the thrombus is present in the artery or vein both are intact no injury no injury where is the thrombus so if the thrombus is formed in the artery it's arterial thrombus if it is formed in the vein it's venous thrombus both are intact there is no injury without injury it is forming so basically it is of two type arterial thrombus venous thrombus there are two type of thrombi arterial and venous see this diagram i have drawn this diagram for you everyone here on the screen can you see this is an artery see the blood flow see the direction of the blood flow can you see this is a vein see the direction of the blood flow so can you see the arterial thrombus i have drawn yellow color intentionally i have drawn yellow color it is white uh, thrombus it is having more platelet that's why it is yellowish in color yellowish or whitish but the venous thrombus contain more rbc that's why it's red in color so first see the arterial one is the white the venous one is the red please learn please learn the color because of the composition the arterial one can you see here it's partially obstructing and the venous one is completely obstructing can you see here the venous one is completely obstructing the arterial one is partially obstructing the venous one is completely obstructing so a partial obstruction is known as mural complete obstruction is known as occlusive so arterial one are partially obstructive the venous one are complete obstructive please learn that the third one in the arterial one the lines of zahan are present alternate light dark light dark light dark lines are present these are known as lines of zahan in the venous one the lines of zahan are absent the lines of zahan are absent there are no lines of zahan in the venous one they are absent okay in the arterial one okay you tell me what does the artery do it supplies pure blood to this organ now because of the thrombus the limited blood is coming to the organ it is leading to ischemia this is the effect of arterial thrombus but what does a vein do it carries impure blood away so pure blood is coming but impure is not leaving impure blood is accumulating in the organ because of the venous thrombus and it will lead to edema of the organ it will lead to edema of the organ so can you tell me the arterial and the venous one arterial and venous one more difference one more difference please see the differences one more difference so the last difference you can see here let me show you here this is the point of the origin of arterial thrombus after that where does it grows please see it is growing in opposite direction as compared to blood flow and venous one it is growing in the same direction as compared to blood flow so arterial one is growing in retrograde direction opposite direction to that of blood flow and venous one growing in the same direction anterograde direction of the blood flow give me a thumbs up if you got it give me a thumbs up you got it yes osama oh, lines of zahan are alternate light or dark bands can you see here alternate light or so these are the the dark bands are made up of rbc and the light bands are made up of platelet and fibrin so basically the the rbc is then platelet fibrin then rbc then platelet fibrin so it occurs in arterial thrombus but in venous thrombus they all are mixed match and basically there are more rbcs that's why it is red in color so that's why lines of zahan are absent in venous one but in arterial one the alternate light dark light dark light dark bands are present let me show you so you can see osama this is a thrombus so here also you can see the alternate light dark light dark and if i cut and make a slide you can see the light dark light dark these are known as lines of zahan which are present in arterial but not in venous you got it say yes or no you got it if you got it can we go ahead okay so yes so these are the differences between arterial and venous better to understand them in a diagram so don't learn the table students used to learn the table like arterial venous this that why you are learning come on have a look on the diagram everything is crystal clear everything is crystal clear only here okay see the arterial thrombus see the venous thrombus can you see the arterial one is white color yellow color venous one is red color you know the reason okay arterial one is partially obstructing the venous one is completely obstructing the arterial one the lines of zahan are present in the venous one the lines of zahan are absent most important point 
arterial one leads to ischemia why you are learning come on if the arterial blood supply is obstructed what the organ will have organ will have ischemia of course and if the venous one is obstructed the vein is obstructed so impure blood will not leave and accumulate in the organ leading to edema arterial one growing in opposite direction retrograde the venous one growing in the same direction antegrade so please have a look on the diagram and enumerate enumerate the differences don't try to learn them so these are the differences between arterial and venous we are done with thrombosis in the thrombosis i told you the causes and the two types of the thrombosis the causes of the thrombus we have seen the virtual triad and the two types arterial and venous everyone give me a thumbs up can i move ahead can i move ahead can we go ahead yes yes so this is the first question in front of you virtual triad for thrombosis include all except the question includes except please tell me the answer what is the correct answer the question includes the except virtual triad do not include so you know the three things in the virtual triad give me a minute the three things in the virtual triad stasis is there or not there endothelial injury there or not there hypercoagulability and platelet thrombus so platelet thrombus is not there the remaining three are the three points of the virtual triad you have to learn okay no the answer is not a kushwa the answer is d right they are asking the except the correct answer here is d so next uh, topic i am coming is embolism what is embolism what is embolism can you define embolism so embolism is anything solid liquid or gas anything solid liquid or gas mass moving in the blood the point of origin is something else okay so here in the diagram have a look see this is the blood vessel in the blood vessel this is the thrombus just now i taught you what is thrombus till it is attached to the wall it is thrombus once it get detached not as no more thrombus it is moving freely so we will call it a embolus so embolus is a moving freely moving mass it is not attached with the wall of the blood vessel so imagine if the wall of the blood vessel this is the thrombus without injury it is formed the clot without injury it's a thrombus so till it is attached it is known as thrombus once it get detached and start freely moving here it is no more thrombus now i will call it a embolus so what is embolus what is embolus prasad mohit arthur shalini what is embolus embolus can be solid can be liquid can be gaseous mass it can be any mass moving freely in the blood from one point to another this is known as embolus one of the embolus is made up of thrombus it is one of the type thromboembolus but there can be other types also the thromboembolus is one is the solid one but there can be liquid and gaseous also you got it so what is embolism it can be solid it can be liquid it can be gaseous mass say yes so it can be any mass moving freely in the blood yes when the thrombus migrate so mohit when the thrombus migrate it is one of the embolus embolus is not always thrombus thrombus originated it can be some other origin also it is one of the example i had given you so it is not the definition the definition is solid liquid or gaseous mass moving freely moving freely carried to other organs it is known as embolus okay there are four types of classification of embolus the first depends whether it is solid or liquid or gas in the solid i have given you an example the solid embolus is the thrombus embolus the thrombus once it detach it is a solid embolus na so it is thromboembolus the solid example is the thromboembolus in the liquid in the liquid see amniotic fluid amniotic fluid embolus is the liquid embolus or fat embolus is also liquid embolus and in the gas air embolus can be there so it can be solid it can be liquid it can be gas it can be of three types i will give you examples of all of them the second classification whether it is infected or not whatever embolus are there does it contain bacteria inside them or does they are sterile if they are sterile if they are sterile they are bland if they are infected with bacteria they are septic so they can be of two types where they are present they are present in artery or vein if they are present in artery they are arterial type if they are present in vein these are the venous types right now i would like to explain you something here just a second can you see this diagram i guess everyone can see this diagram where are the organs these are the organs you can understand the cardiac cycle i am not explaining you that these are the organs you can see the arterial supply to the organ via aorta aorta supplying pure blood and venous drainage of the organ to svc ivc impure blood is carried by the vein where is the embolus embolus can be present at two places it can be present in the artery it can be present in the vein listen everyone here on the screen imagine if the embolus is present in any artery what will happen common sense no knowledge is required i am asking common sense 
we will say ma'am the arterial blood flow is obstructed because of the ambulus the organ will not get the pure blood because the artery is obstructed it will lead to ischemia yes it will lead to ischemia of that organ if the ambulus is present in artery if the ambulus is present in artery ischemia of that organ if the organ is heart it's mi if the organ is the brain it's stroke if the organ is the leg it's gangrene it's it can be intestinal gangrene so depending on organ to organ basically it's it's um, basically it's ischemia but what happens if the ambulus is present in vein who will tell me who will tell me kuldeep shalini anyone arthur so what happens if the ambulus is present in the vein not in the artery what will happen what is the consequence i'm waiting for your reply what happens if the ambulus is present in vein i told you what happens if the ambulus is present in the artery the pure oxygenated blood is obstructed the organ will not get the blood so it will lead to ischemia of that organ depending on organ to organ it can be mi it can be stroke it can be gangrene but what happens if the or, uh, or ambulus is present in the vein what is the consequence i want to ask yes yes i was waiting for this so most of you are saying congestion or edema okay no it is not congestion of edema if it was a fixed one and completely obstructing the lumen it can lead to congestion or edema but it is freely moving na edema will not be there no congestion will not be there you are wrong because it is freely moving it is not obstructing it completely so blood blood is accumulating in that here it is not complete like it is freely moving from here and there so blood flow is not obstructed here completely i mean to say so no it will not yes shalini absolutely right so shalini is right so here the ambulus will go in the vein it will keep on moving keep on moving keep on moving all the veins where does it go any vein of your human body all the veins go in svc ivc so the ambulus will move to svc ivc from svc ivc it will move to the right auricle right side of the heart from the right side of the heart it will move to the right ventricle from the right ventricle the ambulus will go in pulmonary artery from the pulmonary artery it will go to pulmonary capillary and block there so basically it will cause pulmonary edema so all venous ambulus leads to pulmonary edema you can see the root all arterial leads to infarction ischemia and infarction all venous leads to pulmonary edema give me a thumbs up on this point it was a very big point i explained to you all arterial ambulus what is the consequence all venous con ambulus what is the consequence whatever ambulus it is whether it is thromboembolus fat ambulus amniotic fluid if it is present in artery whatever it is solid liquid gas if it is present in artery it will lead to ischemia and infarction of that organ and if it is present in vein it will lead to pulmonary edema it it will lead to pulmonary edema you got it so this is a basic concept you must know now we will see the various types of ambulus one by one so the same thing is written all the arterial one lead to ischemia and infarction of that organ in the lower limbs it leads to gangrene in the heart mi in the brain it leads to stroke and sudden death so it is ischemia and infarction but venous one will lead to pulmonary embolism pulmonary thromboembolism okay the same route so here it will start from here it will keep on moving 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 like this right side of the heart right auricle right ventricle pulmonary artery and finally lungs so any vein it will go to svc ivc from there to right auricle from there to right ventricle from there to pulmonary artery and from there it will lead to pulmonary thromboembolus so whatever vein is there it will lead to pulmonary thromboembolus now i am going to discuss four ambulus one by one the thromboembolus which is a solid one the two liquid i will discuss fat and amniotic fluid and i will discuss the gas embolism thromboembolism you already know how does it formed by detachment of thrombus till the clot is attached it is known as thrombus once it get detached it is no more thrombus it is known as ambulus so out of all the ambulus the 90% are thromboembolus the most common type the most common type what is the most common source the most common source is deep vein thrombosis dvt deep vein thrombosis leads to embolism most common second is fat okay we got it from where the thrombus is coming but from where the fat will come imagine this is a blood vessel in the lumen of the blood vessel from where the fat is coming the fat embolism what is the source i mean to ask what is the source of this fat embolism from where it is coming can anyone tell me do you know from where this fat is coming the fat embolism from where this fat is coming can you tell me the source of this fat from where it is coming fat embolism yes from where this fat is coming there can be two causes listen we all know we all have bone marrow in the bone marrow there are two types of marrow the red marrow and the yellow marrow the yellow marrow contains the fat okay the yellow marrow contains the fat now imagine this person have a fracture from here the bone is cracked there is a fracture of the bone 
the fracture of the bone so the yellow marrow is leaking out the yellow marrow is leaking out of the fracture and entering in the blood and forming a fat embolus so this is how fat embolus is formed by fracture this is known as traumatic cause traumatic cause traumatic cause means because of the fracture the yellow marrow is leaking and coming and forming a embolus moving here and there number 1 number 2 without fracture also sometime we can see it is present in the blood without fracture so this is non traumatic cause this can be the non traumatic cause in the non traumatic cause um, like lipid uh, profile can be altered like in the blood we have ldl we have vldl chylomicrons and all so if all these are increased they will accumulate and form a fat embolus so that can be the non traumatic cause okay so fat embolism here the fat globules are formed can you see the lumen of the blood vessel containing a fat globule it is a fat globule the embolus formed by the fat globule there can be two causes the traumatic and non traumatic in the traumatic i told you it is the injury or the fracture to the bone and in non traumatic it can be any cause which can alter the lipid profile so that can be the two causes now imagine a scenario you are a an orthopedician any one of you want to become a orthopedician you want to become a orthopedician orthopedics is a very you know uh, fascinating branch most of the students want it yes especially the boys ha huh? it's a very good branch yes orthopedics ha huh? imagine you are a orthopedician and a 25 year old boy who was driving having a road traffic accident right and he is having the fracture of say tibia he is having fracture of tibia and he is on your clinic on your hospital whatever and he is having a fracture of the tibia we will say it's okay it's a simple fracture of the tibia let's fix it we have fixed the fracture if the stent is required you have put the stenting is done you have done the surgery you have fixed the fracture and you have put the cast for two months there is a cast the patient is still admitted in the hospital in a day or two in a day or two you got a call from your nurse the doctor the patient the 25 year old boy you operated is dead that what happened what happened it was a simple case of fracture oh my god it was a shocking it was a shocking news what may have happened can you correlate now what may have happened so you ask what is the cause of the death he was having some breathing difficulties all of a sudden he has dyspnea he has respiratory distress and suddenly he is dead so what may have happened what may have happened to this boy can you tell me so yes he is having fracture from this fracture the yellow marrow may have leak that may have formed the fat globule the fat embolism in the vein all venous embolus there where they where does they go they go in the lung and he may have pulmonary thromboembolism and that is the cause of the death the cause of the death can be pulmonary thromboembolism because of the venous obstruction you know the venous embolus caused by the fat embolism so yes yes it's a typical case scenario you will get typical this case maybe the values the age and this scenario may be different but ultimately after injury after fracture the patient is dead or the patient is having respiratory difficulty so it's a typical case of the fat embolism right now what will happen you are in trouble na you are a orthopedician in this case so the family will sue you you are under medico legal case that the why the boy is dead is is there is some negligence medical negligence from your side or it is simple fat embolism you will ask for a autopsy the post mortem of the dead body the autopsy the autopsy just suppose i am the doctor performing the autopsy right now i will hear the complete history what is the problem why the autopsy is performed the autopsy will be performed by the forensic team okay the medico legal team so they will perform the autopsy and they will take extra care of the lung they will take the lung out especially the pulmonary capillaries out they will cut the lung make a slide and they will look for fat embolism if the fat embolism is found it will it will be a proven case that the cause of the death is fat embolism and there is no negligence of the doctor you got my point so here autopsy have a main role in the autopsy the autopsy so same thing is written so after the fracture of the bone if there is a sudden death so on autopsy we will look we'll see the lungs specially in the lungs we will apply special stain for the fat you know there are two special stain for the fat sudan black and oil red they will highlight the fat right sudan black give black color oil red give red color to the fat to the adipocytes so if these are found in the lung either this or this it is found in the lung so it is a typical it is a typical case of the uh, it is a typical case uh, of the fat embolism there is no prevention arthros you have to be vigilant but yeah i i don't know if exactly some prevention is taken uh, by the orthopedicians you know but yeah it is a typical case you should understand so from mcq point of view if after the fracture if sudden death is given so pulmonary edema or pulmonary embolism is the cause okay now coming on the next amniotic fluid embolism how does it is formed what is amniotic fluid what is amniotic fluid 
whenever there is a pregnancy this is a pregnancy okay the lady is pregnant this is the fetus inside the pregnant uterus so the fetus is surrounded by uh, amniotic membranes containing the amniotic fluid so the fetus is surrounded by the in the gestational side the fetus is surrounded by the amniotic fluid right now just suppose it is the time of the labor it is a time of the labor the lady is in labor pain during labor the uterus contracts vigorously the uterus contracts vigorously like this during labor i am saying okay so there are tears there can be the tears in the myometrium there can be and this is the umbilical vein let me draw the umbilical vein this is the umbilical vein of this mother vein umbilical vein of the mother okay so because of the tear in the uh, uterus and vigorous contraction the amniotic fluid can enter via tears into the umbilical vein and all veins go where all veins kahan jati hain all the veins will go in svc ivc so this embolus is amniotic fluid embolus it is a liquid embolus it will reach the lung leading to pulmonary edema it can lead to sudden death during labor or just after delivery of the mother so imagine a mother she was absolutely mother means a pregnant lady imagine a pregnant lady who is absolutely normal healthy and during labor she is dead or just after the delivery she is dead so what can be the cause the cause can be the amniotic fluid embolism so here again we will order the post mortem the autopsy in this case again the lung we will see very carefully we will make the slide of the lung section and in the lung we will find the amniotic fluid here say yes if you got the complete scenario so this is the amniotic fluid embolism it is very serious unpredictable it is very serious just a second unpredictable unpreventable cause of maternal mortality just a second okay and during labor or immediate postpartum due to vigorous contraction the amniotic fluid can enter the uterine vein sorry not umbilical vein it's the uterine vein and it will reach the right side of the heart causing pulmonary embolism in the pregnant lady and can cause so if you are making the slide you will get the amniotic fluid in the lung the amniotic fluid in the lung is a typical scenario here the next and the last is the gas embolism got it the next and the last is the gas embolism how does the gas embolism occur how does the how does the gas can can present inside the blood vessel so you give injections to your patients iv injections so when we give iv injection we fill the injection with the medicine whatever the liquid medicine is there and we take the air out if you have seen first we take the air out we take the medicine up to the tip of the needle and then we inject if we don't take the air out air is also injected and that can cause the air embolism so that can be the one of the cause one of the cause but not very much because most of the time we take the gas out but sometime it can lead to air embolism where air is introduced in the vein or the artery say yes this can be one of the cause okay one of the causes just direct injection iv infusion of the or second cause just suppose you are a head surgeon head and neck surgeon you are operating on your patient on the head and neck area and by by uh, mistake uh, you have cut the jugular vein or any uh, major vein in the neck so what will happen the air present in the environment during surgery can enter inside the vein or you are a obstetrician uh, and uh, during uh, some surgery you are a gynecologist you, you, uh, during some surgery some major vein is uh, traumatized in the pelvic area again the environmental air can enter so operation on head neck or operation of the obstetrix it can lead to accidental opening of the major vein like jugular and accidental opening of the air so that can happen so this is the air embolism again air embolism can also be venous the venous is dangerous it is always leading to the pulmonary embolism you can see the pulmonary embolism that's all about it that's all right what does you do in this case imagine there is a patient and you are you are a head neck surgeon you are operating on the patient and by accidental uh, incision the jugular vein is open so the environmental air will enter inside and it will form the air embolism it's a vein where does all the veins go all the veins the blood will go in the pulmonary circulation so the air embolism will leave the pulmonary circulation and patient is suddenly dead just imagine again we will perform the autopsy in this case also we will take the lungs out so what do you want to see in the lung in the fat embolism you look for fat in the amniotic fluid embolism you look for amniotic fluid how does you see the air air is not visible air is not visible if you give the cut it will evaporate like this you know if you give a cut here where is the air embolism if you give a cut here it will you know it will just go out there is, it, you cannot capture the air on a slide how, how you will uh, prove that it's a typical case of air embolism i'm asking you does anyone know the answer does anyone know the answer so what we will do in such case 
So we perform the autopsy, we take the lungs out, we try to figure out the pulmonary capillary and we take the pulmonary capillary and give a, give a cut under the water, under the water, under the water. You got my point? So we will give the cut under the water, in the water bubbles will come out. If the bubbles are coming out in the water, it means the air was present in the pulmonary capillary. You got my point? So give the cut underneath water, not in the air, in openly in the air, you cannot notice that. Say yes if you got my point. Say yes. You got my point? Yes. In the water. Like have you seen how a tire puncher is repaired? How to the tire puncher person who is repairing the tire puncher, he finds out what is the site of the tire puncher. So we take the entire tire, put it in a water and see where the leakage of the air is there. In the same way we do it underwater. So same thing is written. We open it in C2 water. We so open the pulmonary artery in C2 water. Right, this is how we see that. So, we are done with ambulus also. We are done with ambulus also. Ambulism, we will solve some questions and we will move on the last topic shock of hemodynamics. Okay, so the first question is in front of you. Can you please tell me the answer? The most common source of embolism. What is the most common source of embolism, please? Is it DVT, trauma, infection, or surgery? The most common cause of embolism. I told you 90% of the embolus are thrombus embolus. They are made up of thrombus. Once the thrombus get detached, it leads to embolism. The 90% of them. So what is the most common cause of thrombo thromboembolism? Now I had given you a clue. Can you tell me the answer? Yes, DVT. Because in deep veins, most common site of thrombus is the deep vein. And this is the origin of the embolus. Yes. The next question is in front of you. Typical case scenario question. Please pay attention. Take the clues. Take the clues. There is a 58 year old man having a road traffic accident okay came to the hospital he had multiple fractures in lower limb in the ribs in the lung contusion ultimately he scumbled to his injury he's dead we cannot save him unfortunately the person is dead now at autopsy the lung is showing the following slide typical slide given to you you can see something in the lung can you see what are these these cells white color cells cluster of white color cells these are adipocytes in the lung, you can see the fat, the fat in the lung. What is the correct answer? Yes, it's a typical case of fat embolism. So see the slide also. It's a, you can do the special stains also. The Sudan black, the oil red, I have told you. So sometimes you can get the question on the special stain. So it can be typical case scenario based question. It can be image based question. You know, it can be any question. Like if you know the concept, you can make it out. We are done. We are done. The last thing here, I will tell you the shock, right? So hemodynamics is also done. And after that, we will move on the last topic, neoplasia. Genetics and neoplasia, two more are left in the general. Okay. You want me to take hemat also today now? You want me to take hemat also? After general, I have to take hemat also. Right? Okay, okay. So let's continue with shock. Let's continue with shock. Does anyone know what is shock? What is shock? How you will define shock? Don't read here. Just tell me. What is shock? Is shock is a disease of one organ? No. It is a disease of multiple organ. In shock, multiple organ failure takes place. In human body, from head to toe, we are supplied with multiple organs made up of multiple cell. We require blood supply to all these cells. Why? Why all the cells require blood? Why all the cells require blood? Why all the cells are requiring blood? Can you tell me the answer? Why all the cells require blood? Because it contains oxygen. All the cells require pure oxygen. That's why uh, all the cells. So this is known as perfusion. You know, so all the organs require perfusion because of the oxygen. If oxygen is not supplied, the organs or the cells will undergo ischemia and infarction. So ischemia and infarction can be there. So uh, if all the organs simultaneously do not get the perfusion, if all the organs, not only one organ, all the organs of human body do not get proper perfusion, do not get proper blood supply, what will happen? First, the cells will start dying. The cells will start dying. Then first cells will not function. It will show ischemia. Then cell death. Then particular organ death. Then multiple organ death. Then death of the person. So it's a syndrome one by one. So if all the organs do not receive enough perfusion of the blood, the pure blood, first the cell will not function of multiple organs. Then cell death of multiple organs. Then organ death of multiple organ. Multiple organ failure leading to the death of the person. This is shock. This is shock. It's a syndrome. One by one, the things takes place. It's a syndrome. So first cell death, 
then organ failure, then multiple organ failure, and then the death of the person. This is shock. Now, you may be thinking why multiple organs are not receiving the blood at the same time. So, there are three types of shock having three different reasons. The hypervolumic shock, cardiogenic shock, septic shock. I request all my dear students to make a comparative table between them once for all. Hypervolumic shock, cardiogenic shock, septic shock. So, I will tell you the causes of each of them. Pathogenesis, how each of them leads to decreased perfusion and the symptoms of each of them. So, treatment of each of them is different, you know. So, let's start with the first shock, hypervolumic shock. As the name indicate, okay, how many liters of blood you have in your body? All the adult human, they have 5 liter of blood. I am having 5 liter of blood. You are having, all the adults have approx 5 liter of blood in our body. That is our fluid. That is our fluid balance, right? We all know we have 5 liters of fluid in our body. 5 liters of blood in our body, right? If imagine someone is having some accident, road traffic accident, or there is a major surgery, or there is abundant of vomiting, or there is diarrhea, or there is burns. In burns, the fluid evaporate. All these reasons lead to less than 5 liter of blood in the body. So less than 5 liter of the blood. So bloody nahi hai, all the organs are receiving less blood. If I am having enough blood, I am having 5 liters. So my 5 liters is distributed. My brain is getting, my heart is getting, my kidneys, my liver, my all organs are receiving a proportion of 5 liter. That is fixed and that is sufficient for them. But if, if some person is having less than 5 liter of blood, it can be 4 liter, 3 liter, 2 liter, depending the blood losses how much, right? So whatever blood is left, so all the organs are receiving less blood all the organs and that shock is known as hypervolumic shock so all the organs undergo multiple organ failure that will that is known as hypervolumic shock so the name itself indicate hypovolumic hypo means less volumic means less volume of the blood so out of the three type of the shock this is the most common type of the shock hypervolumic shock is the most common type of the shock it is the most common type of the shock in which there is decreased volume of the blood in which there is decreased volume of the blood what are the causes it can be acute hemorrhage it can be you know, acute hemorrhage like RTA, road traffic accident, surgery, dehydration, vomiting, diarrhea, burns. In burns, everything evaporates. The use of the diuretics, right? Uh, okay, you can see. What is the pathogenesis? Now, blood he come in. If, all the, if, if the blood in the body is less, see, in hypervolumic shock, due to the hemorrhage, road traffic accident, surgery, trauma, burns, dehydration, vomiting, diarrhea, less blood is present. Less blood means less venous return. Less venous return means less cardiac output. Less cardiac output, less blood will go in aorta. Less blood will be distributed to all the organs. All the organs have anoxia and that will lead to shock. Give me a thumbs up if you got it. Give me a thumbs up if you got it. Okay. What is hypervolumia? What should I say about hypervolumia? Stage deep. It is related to hypovolumia, not hypervolumia. Hypovolumia is less than 5 liters of blood leading to the shock. Okay. Now, what will be the symptoms? As soon as the blood supply to all the organs is less, the heart will try to compensate and increases the rate, right? So, all the organs are not receiving enough blood. So, heart will try to compensate by increasing the heart rate, I mean increasing the pumping, increasing the rate of the pumping. So, heart rate is more, that is tachycardia. Since there is less blood in all the arteries, it will lead to low blood pressure. So, blood pressure is less than 120 by 80 and heart rate is more than 100. So, tachycardia with hypotension, the typical, typical two things which occurs in the, typical two symptoms in the shock. So, all the organs are receiving less blood. Kidney also receives less, less blood. It will lead to oliguria. The brain also receives less blood. It is leading to confusion and lethargic and, you know, coma and death can be there. That is hypovolumic shock. Got it? Now, it is of three types. How much blood is lost? You, you told me that there are, there is 5 liter of blood. So, if 20, 20 percent is lost, 20 percent is only 1 liter. 20 to 40 percent means 2 liter and more than 2 liter how much it is lost if only 1 liter or less than 1 liter is lost it's hy mild hypovolumic shock stage 1 if 2 liter is lost it's stage 2 if more than 2 liters is lost it's stage 3 say yes if you got it that is hypovolemic shock that is the first cause second cardiogenic shock here normally 5 liter of the blood is present you will see then why organs are receiving less blood because heart is not pumping the left ventricle is not pumping so, there is some problem in the muscle of the left ventricle. You know, the muscle of the left ventricle. The muscle of the left ventricle is ischemic, it is cardiomyopathy or some problem is there so that it is not pumping. So, although 5 liter of the blood, 5 liter of the blood is present. But since it is not pumping properly, it is not ejecting the blood in the aorta. So, all the organs is receiving less blood. This is known as cardiogenic shock. Here, the problem is in the heart. So, here the blood is normal, but the problem is in the pumping of the heart. Inadequate pumping of the heart. Okay, so 
when at least 40% of the left ventricle is destroyed by some disease, then inadequate pumping takes place. Right, it can be MI, cardiomyopathy, rupture of the heart, cardiac arrhythmia, cardiac tamponade, it can be any cause. The basic problem is in the heart. That's why it is known as circulatory failure. But here the volume is normal. It's normal volumic shock. It's a shock with 5 liter of the blood. The blood is 5 liter in contrast to hypovolemic shock. Still patient is in shock. The problem is in the circulation. I mean the problem is in the heart. Say yes. So in hypovolemic shock, the blood was less. Total blood is less than 5 liter. That's why cardiac output was less. In cardiogenic shock, blood is 5 liter. Normal 5 liter. But since the heart is not pumping, that's why cardiac output is less. So cardiac output is ultimately less here also, here also. Cardiac output is less. Here it is less because bloody nahi hai. Blood is less. It is not 5 liter. That's why it is less. Or yaha pe less blood to hai. Blood is there. But the left ventricle cannot eject it. So cardiac output is less. Less blood will go in aorta. All the organs receive less, less blood. Less oxygen leading to anoxia, leading to shock. Say yes. Say yes. Got it. So here the symptoms are same. Here also exactly same symptoms are there. All the organs will receive less blood. Kidney receive less blood, having oliguria, anuria. Brain receive less blood, again confusion, lethargy, coma, death. But one symptom is additional. Can you tell me what is the additional symptom here, which was not there in hypovolemic shock? Here also tachycardia is there, uh, hypotension is there. Here backward flow of the blood is there. Blood is not moving forward. The left ventricle is not pumping. So blood is not moving forward, it is going backward. So left ventricle, the blood is going backward from left ventricle to left auricle, from left auricle to pulmonary vein and from pulmonary vein to the lungs. It is accumulating in the lungs. It is accumulating in the lungs and leading to dyspnea, pulmonary edema leading to dyspnea. So dyspnea is an additional symptom here which was not there in, a, uh, the dyspnea was uh, not there in hypovolemic shock. But dyspnea is there in this shock, cardiogenic shock. The last and most difficult shock to understand is septic. Are you people awaken or still there? Kindly interact in between. Right? Don't keep the session as monotonous. So, Shalini is awakened. What about others? Others are sleeping or listening to me? Huh? Are you there? Okay. So give me a thumbs up. Everyone give me a thumbs up. Can we go ahead? The third type of the shock, the septic shock. Okay. The third type of the shock is septic shock. Here, due to the bacterial infection, the gram positive or the gram negative bacteria leads to the shock. How infection can lead to the shock? How infections can lead to shock? I am asking you, how does infection lead to the shock? How does the infection lead to the shock? Yes? So, gram positive bacteria and gram negative bacteria. How does they lead to the shock? Can you tell me? So, let me tell you, it's a difficult mechanism, but I will try. Okay? Listen, the gram positive bacteria. I am sorry. Then gram negative bacteria have lipopolysaccharide on their cell wall and gram positive bacteria have lipoticoic acid of the, on their cell wall. I will draw it also for you. So in the blood vessel, whenever gram positive or gram bacteria, negative bacteria, whatever entering, it will go to the macrophage and stimulate the macrophage. Lipopolysaccharide through CD14 receptor and lipoticoic acid through ILR2 receptor. Macrophages on activating secrete interleukin 1 and TNF alpha. Okay, let me draw it. Okay. Let me draw blood vessel. In the blood vessel, these are the macrophages. Imagine this is a gram positive bacteria and imagine this is a gram negative bacteria. The gram positive bacteria, the gram positive bacteria have lipoticoic acid on their cell wall and gram negative bacteria have lipopolysaccharide on their cell wall right so here lipoticoic acid here lipopolysaccharide it will stimulate the macrophage on the macrophage specific receptors are present for lipoticoic acid ilr1 receptor is present and for lipopolysaccharide cd14 receptor is present if you want to learn the name of the receptors so ultimately macrophages is activated on activating macrophage secrete tnf alpha and interleukin 1 that causes two things please understand it's difficult these two will cause two things number one it causes vasodilatation number one it causes vasodilatation this is an artery now supplying blood to some organ it is causing vasodilatation in the artery you will say Man, what do you mean by vasodilatation by vasodilatation there is more blood supply to this organ you are saying shock is due to decreased blood supply but you are saying here there is more blood supply yes it's a unique shock it's a unique shock in which initially there is hyperdynamic circulation instead of hypodynamic. 
So there is more blood supply to this organ in contrast to hypovolemic and cardiogenic shock. I taught you two shocks till now. In both of them, there was less blood supply to the organ. In hypovolemic uh, shock, the blood is less. It's less, blood, less blood supply. In cardiogenic shock, the heart is not pumping properly. That's why there is less blood supply. But in septic shock, I'm saying there is more blood supply to the organ. You got my point? There is more blood supply. There is more uh, blood supply to the organ. Okay, there is more blood supply to the organ. So, it's a hyperdynamic situation initially, but later on, the vascular permeability is also increased. After vasodilation, the vascular permeability means gaps will be formed. The gaps will be formed. So, what will happen? You can see the gaps are formed here. The gaps are formed. From this gaps, the fluid will leak out. Fluid will leak out, leading to edema. Leading to edema. So, less fluid will remain in the blood and now it will lead to shock. So there are two stages in septic shock. First hyperdynamic stage and later on hypodynamic stage that leads to shock. Hyperdynamic stage is due to vasodilatation. Hy uh, and um, later on increased vascular permeability. Increased vascular permeability leading to the shock. Say yes if you got it. Everyone. So this is the mechanism. This is the mechanism of the shock. The septic shock. Gram positive bacteria, gram negative bacteria. Both of them can lead to shock. So, vasodilatation leads to hyperdynamic circulation which is in contrast to other two shock. Right. And increased vascular permeability later on leads to edema. I tried. At least appreciate my efforts. You got the mechanism of the septic shock. Septic shock has two stages. Early hyperdynamic stage in which there is more blood. So, if you touch the extremities, the um, you know, the palms and the soles of the patient in cardiogenic and hypovolemic shock they are very cool because of less blood supply but here initially they are warm warm extremities even the patient is in shock with warm extremities it's a typical clue uh, given to you in the question the warm extremities with shock it's septic shock but later on the patient have increased vascular permeability leading to the shock say yes if you got it we are done with three type of shock you want me to explain it again the third type of the shock septic shock or you got it so, in all the shock, whether it is hypovolumic shock, whether it is cardiogenic shock or whether it is septic shock, in all of them, one thing is common, decreased perfusion. All the organs are receiving less blood supply. Less blood supply means less oxygen. Less oxygen means anoxia. Multiple organs have anoxia leading to multiple organ failure and leading to death. So, this is common for all of them but the reason is different. Here, less perfusion the reason is less blood less volume of the blood less than 5 liters of the blood is present due to accident surgery vomiting diarrhea burns diuretics whatever in cardiogenic shock the left ventricle is not pumping that's why this is the reason and in septic shock either gram positive or gram negative bacteria first leading to hyperdynamic circulation that is increased perfusion and later on because of increased vascular permeability it is decreased perfusion and decreased perfusion leading to the shock so that is the thing so yes i hope you all got it yes can we go ahead kindly everyone respond so you can see this is the master table of the shock this is the master table of the shock here you can see so hypervolumic shock cardiogenic shock septic shock see the causes of hypervolumic shock see the causes of cardiogenic shock see the causes of septic shock septic shock is due to gram positive gram negative bacteria see the pathogenesis hypervolumic shock is decreased volume of the blood less than 5 liter cardiogenic is due to left heart failure Right, and septic shock is due to bacteria. Right, see the symptoms here increase heart rate, decrease BP, decrease urine output, altered mental status. Pulmonary edema is a unique thing. I told you, dysnea. Dysnea is unique. Right, and here inflammatory edema is unique because of the increased vascular permeability. We are done with shock. We are done with shock. Are you ready for the MCQs? Can we try some MCQs now? The first question is in front of you. Perioperative shock is an example of which type of shock? perioperative like during surgery during surgery or after surgery which type of shock the patient have hypovolumic septic cardiogenic or neurogenic i'm asking you what is the correct answer so during surgery the patient can bleed the, sometimes the patient can bleed too much because of the bleeding the volume of the blood will be less than 5 liter yes absolutely right and this will lead to hypovolumic shock is it right why people you are you are not answering is it right so, perioperative shock is hypovolumic shock. Let me see. Yes, yes. Very good. In shock, what is the characteristic feature which is present in all shock? Tell me one feature which is present in all type of shock. Whatever type of shock it is. Tell me one feature. 
इज इट कार्डियक फेलियर ओवर परफ्यूजन साइनोसिस और एडिमा तो इज साइनोसिस एडिमा कार्डियक फेलियर और पोअर टिश्यू परफ्यूजन विच इज प्रेजेंट इन ऑल टाइप ऑफ शॉक टेल मी वन फीचर यस यू ऑल आर राइट द करेक्ट आंसर इज पुअर परफ्यूजन डिक्रीज ब्लड सप्लाई टू ऑल द ऑर्गन वेदर इट इज हाइपर वॉल्यूमिक शॉक कार्डियोजेनिक शॉक और सेप्टिक शॉक इट अकर्स इन ऑल ऑफ दैम द हॉलमार्क फीचर ऑफ द शॉक तो करेक्ट आंसर इज बी एंड यू ऑल आर राइट तो वी आर डन विथ हिमोडाइनमिक्स ऑल्सो गट इट कैन वी गो हैड से यस इफ यू कैन गो हैड कैन वी गो हैड यस यस तो कमिंग टू द नेक्स्ट चैप्टर वेरी क्विकली जेनेटिक्स एंड आफ्टर दैट वी आर लेफ्ट विथ वन मोर चैप्टर न्यू प्लेशिया ओके सो जनरल विल बी डन ऑल द इम्पॉर्टेंट टॉपिक्स आर जनरल इज डन जनरल इज वेरी बिग बट या मोस्ट ऑफ द इम्पॉर्टेंट टॉपिक्स आई एम ट्राइंग टू कंपाइल इन शॉर्ट स्पैन ऑफ टाइम so let's start with genetics in genetics let me tell you the genetic inheritance of single gene disorder autosomal dominant recessive x linked disorder x linked recessive if you are a fmg student now you always get one question on genetic inheritance of this but in other exams also directly or indirectly there can be integrated question on this but in fmg always there is a question right so let me tell you uh, genetics is the study of the genes you know what is chromosome what is human karyotype in humans how many chromosomes are present in each cell in each nucleus diploid nucleus how many chromosomes are present in humans i'm asking how many chromosomes are present in humans the so 46 chromosome either say 46 chromosome or say 23 pair 23 pair this is pair number 1 pair number 2 pair number 3 4 5 6 so if we arrange all 23 pairs pair number 1 pair number 2 3 likewise till 23 so it is known as karyotype karyotype is the arrangement of all 23 pairs according to their length see it is the largest one see this one is the smallest one so according to their descending order of their length of their length of the chromosome okay so this is known as karyotype you can see the karyotype out of the 23 pairs the 22 pairs you can see these one these one till here it is common in all it is common in all but the last pair is known as sex chromosome right these are known as allosomes or sex chromosome these are different in male and female we all know it's if a male it's xy and if it is a female it's xs so last pair is different according to the gender the males have xy and the females have xx we all know that but the first 22 pairs is common in all of them right we all we, we all know that yes the first 22 pairs x absolutely right shalini it's autosome and the last pair is the sex chromosome absolutely right now let me discuss some genetic inheritance single gene disorders with you genetic inheritance single gene disorders autosomal dominant autosomal recessive x linked dominant x linked recessive let's start with autosomal dominant basically you have to learn the examples you have to learn the examples here you have to learn the two things the pedigree analysis and the examples basic is examples okay let's start with the first one autosomal dominant autosomal dominant can you see this is the pedigree now it is not related to sex you can see the males the square is a male i guess everyone know and the circle is a female So learn the basic sign, है ना? So the the filled one, the dark is the diseased, and the empty one are the healthy. I guess everyone knows that. So male and female both can transmit the disease. So it is not related to the sex. Okay? You can see there is no skip of the generation. There is no gender bias. You can see in this generation, in this generation, in this generation, all the generation, the diseased person are there. So no generation skip. No gender bias. You can see the male is also transmitting to the next generation, and here you can see the female is also transmitting to the next generation. The female is also transmitting. So there is no gender bias also, and it is having variable onset. Variable, right? Learn the examples. Autosomal dominant. What is the example? I am having a mnemonic for you. For the four inheritance, I am going to give you four mnemonics. Okay? Yes, I am giving you four mnemonics. So the mnemonic is VO familial hypercholesteremia autosomal D O M I N A N T dominant hai. so wo von willebrand disease familial is familial adenomatous polyposis hypercholesteremia is hypercholesteremia only autosomal is adpkd adult polycystic kidney dominant d o m i n a n t d stands for dystrophic myotonica o for orthogenesis imperfecta m for marfan syndrome i for intermittent porphyria there are two n neurofibromatosis 1 and 2 A is and A chondroplasia. T is tuberous sclerosis and H, H is Huntington's disease and hereditary spherocytosis. So please learn the full form. Try to learn the full form. I know it's not very easy, but at least with full form you can apply in the exam and rule out some options. So, wo familial hypercholesteremia, autosomal dominant D O M I N A N T. Hey. 
try to say the full form it's not very difficult if you try b for von willebrand disease f for familial hypercholesteremia uh, h is uh, i have to see hypercholesteremia a is adult polycystic kidney disease d for dystrophic myotonica osteogenesis imperfecta marfan syndrome intermittent porphyria neurofibromatosis type 1 and 2 achondroplasia tuberous sclerosis hutchinson's disease maybe i have missed something or i am wrong but at least i tried so write down the mnemonic and try like this these all are autosomal dominant coming on the next one autosomal recessive autosomal recessive see the generation skip so the first generation have the second don't have third don't have then the fourth have so generation skip is very common here generation skipped are there again the both sexes are involved there is no gender bias right and it is early in onset that was variable in onset this one is early in onset see the examples the example is a b c d e f g h s p w a stands for albinism b stands for beta thalassemia c stands for cystic fibrosis d stands for dubin johnson and deafness sensory neural deafness e stands for e stands for enzyme deficiency especially g6pd deficiency F stands for phadric ataxia, Fancoli anemia. G for galactosemia, H for hemochromatosis, Hurler. S for sickle cell anemia, very commonly asked. P for phenylketonuria, W for Wilson. W for Wilson. So please try to say A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, S, P, W. The next is the X-link dominant. X-link dominant disorders, right? Here you can see the gender variation is there. Everyone here on the screen. See here the female is affected. The mother is affected. But the father is healthy. So when they get married, out of the four children, the mother is giving, uh, out of the four children, you can see the four children. One, two, three, four. So out of the two son, one is affected. Out of the two daughter, one is affected. So basically 50% of the son, 50% of the daughter are affected. The affected mother is giving it to 50% son, 50% daughter. She is not doing any variation. But his, uh, this is the affected father. The father is affected here. The mother is normal. If they get married, the father is very partial. The father is giving disease to 100% daughters, not the son. So 100% daughters are affected, not the son. The point is that the male gives the disease to 100% daughters. And the female gives the disease to 50% son, 50% daughter. You can learn like mothers don't differentiate between the children, whether it is a son or daughter. So if she is affected, she is transmitting the disease to 50% son, 50% daughter. But father is very partial. Father is not giving disease to the son. And father is giving disease only to 100% daughters. It's just a mnemonic to learn. Okay. So you can learn. So this is X-link dominant pattern. Say yes. Say yes. It is X-link dominant pattern. Please say yes. So typically looking at the pattern, you can see. See the mother, see the father. You can typically see the pattern. Based on that, you can answer. It's X-link dominant. Only four diseases are X-link dominant. The mnemonic is FAIR. F-A-I-R. F is facial oro disease. A is Alport. Alport syndrome, very important Alport syndrome. I is incontinenta pigmentosa. And R is re resistant rickets. Okay. And the next is excellent recessive. Excellent recessive, you can see females are always carrier. They don't have the disease. And males, are the, males have the disease. Males are the cases, females are the carrier. Right. Males are the, because it is excellent recessive, no. So if both the X are involved, then only the disease is there. If one of them is involved, patient won't have disease. And female have double X. Male have only one X, so males will express it. But females will never express it. So the mnemonic is Graham Bell. G-R-A-H-A-M-B-E-L-L. -L. So please read the full form. G for G6PD deficiency. R for retinitis pigmentosa. A for androgen insensitivity. H for hemophilia. Very important PYQ. Hemophilias are excellent recessive. A for a, uh, adenoleukodystrophy, M for man case disease, B for Baker Duchin, there is a question on that. E for Emery's, Deftrude dystrophy, Lishnian and Lobe. So I know it's difficult. I know, I know. Still, I insist you to learn. Okay. So there are four patterns. If you don't learn the pedigree, it's okay. But learn the mnemonics, learn the full form. So there are four patterns. We will revise. We will revise the mnemonics of all of them. Let's see. Let's see who will answer. Let's see who will answer. Tell me the mnemonics. Arthur, Shalini, Kiran, Habib, Nikki, Osama, Tejdeep. Anyone can answer? Want to try to tell me the mnemonics at least? Full form I will say. But try to say the mnemonics. Autosomal dominant. Vo, familial, hypercholesteremia, autosomal, dominant hai. D-O-M-I-N-A-N-T. Dominant hai. This is the mnemonic. The second mnemonic.
I guess it's connected again. I guess it's connected again. I guess it's connected again. Let's wait. I'm waiting for okay, connected now. Okay, okay. So see, I have told you the mnemonics, the four mnemonics. If if the four mnemonics you know, you can half job is done. You know, you have to just say the full form. <laughs> and at least if you are confused in the full form, also you can rule out some option. So you will always get a question on these or direct or indirect clues can be there. So please learn the four mnemonics as well as their full form. Can we go ahead? Can we go ahead? Let me show you some questions based on that. The first question is in front of you. Can you tell me the type of inheritance in tuberous sclerosis? In which mnemonic it was coming? Tuberous sclerosis. Can you please give me the answer? In which mnemonic it was coming? The mnemonic was, was Wo familial hypercholesteremia autosomal dominant hai. D O M I N A N T ka jo T hai wo tuberous sclerosis hai. So yes, in which mnemonic it is coming? It is coming in the mnemonic of autosomal dominant. So correct answer here is autosomal dominant. The correct answer here is autosomal dominant. The next question is in front of you, type of inheritance in Wilson disease. In which mnemonic it was coming? Just apply all four mnemonics and tell me where W was coming. SPW, where it was coming? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, SPW. It is a mnemonic of autosomal recessive. You can see W is for Wilson. In none of other is it is coming. So correct answer here is B. You got it? This is how the mnemonics will help you. Many questions are there on this. Which of the following is the X-linked recessive disease? X-linked recessive disease. So what is the mnemonic of X-linked recessive? Graham Bell. G-R-A-H-A-M-B-E-L-L. -L. Apply the mnemonic and look for the option. Which option is coming in this mnemonic? I see, as I, I can see G is coming only. So G is G6PD deficiency. Graham Bell ka G hai ye. This is how the mnemonics will be useful for you. Okay, this is how. The next is on the pedigree analysis. Right, look at the pattern of the pedigree and tell me the answer. Which type of inheritance is it? So, I will see for male and female. There is no generation skip I can see. I can see the male can transmit the disease to daughter, daughter, daughter. But the female transmitting the disease to 50% son, 50% daughter. 50% son, 50% daughter. It's a typical pattern of X-link dominant. I told you it's a typical pattern of X-link dominant. Okay. So the correct answer here is D. So based on the pedigree, I have told you the pedigree of all four. I have told you the pedigree of all four. Right. You got it. Now, coming on the next chapter, the chromosomal disorder. The last chapter in the genetics. After that, we will start the neoplasia. Right. So, uh, chromosomal disorder. The next is the chromosomal disorder. In chromosomal disorder, I will tell you Down, Patau, Edward, Turner, Klinfinter, they are uh, karyotype only. The symptoms, I will give you diagram. The five diagrams, I will give you based on the diagram, the important, important symptom sign you have to learn. You don't have to learn all the symptoms and sign. Only the important symptom sign you have to learn, but you have to learn the karyotype. So, among them, you know, uh, the normal karyotype of a male and female. So, during uh, uh, the sperm or the, the gamete formation, I mean. So, what is the male? Male is 46. Female is also 46. But in male, the last pair is XY. In female, the last pair is XX. So, in male, when the sperms are formed, it's 23X and 23Y. Two types of sperms are formed. Two types of sperms are formed. But in females, when the ova are formed, when the gametes are formed, both are same. Both are 23x, 23x. I guess everyone knows that. There is no need to say, right? What I mean to say now, what I mean to say, if the female is more than 35 years of age at the time of the pregnancy. So sometimes there can be some problem which is known as non-disjunction. What is known as non-disjunction? So in increase or older females, that's why it is said that first pregnancy or pregnancy should be before 35 years of age in females. Male's age hardly matters, but female's age matters, right? Because in females, what is the problem? After 35 years of age, when the gametes form, see what, what is the distribution. It is 23 plus 1 in one of them. And in other gamete, it is 23 minus 1. So here in one of the ova, it will be 24. In one of the ova, it will be 22. So it will it will, it will will fuse with one of the normal, uh, it, both of them will fuse with one of the normal sperm. So total count will be in the fetus, either 47 or 45. It's not 46. So the fetus which is formed because of the fusion of the defective ova with normal sperm. I'm repeating the defective ova and the normal sperm. The ova is defective either having one more chromosome or one less. The reason is the non-disjunction. What is the reason? The reason is the non-disjunction. Due to the non-disjunction, the two ovas are formed. They are not same. 
right they are they are abnormal when they fuses with the sperm it will lead to monosomy or trisomy so the fetus which is born with 47 and 45 now so 47 is known as trisomy it is having one extra chromosome and the fetus with 45 is known as monosomy so monosomies and trisomies can happen you got my point so this is the meaning of the monosomy and trisomy so this is known as aneuploidy aneuploid is of two type monosomy trisomy in monosomy 45 chromosomes are there trisomy 47 are there you got my point so the same thing is shown to you okay now the three disorders down patau and advert they occur due to autosome involvement and the last two that is uh, turner and uh, clint flinter they occur due to sex chromosome the last pair involvement in down there is trisomy of 21 patau is trisomy of 13 and advert is trisomy of uh, 18 so all of them have 47 chromosome instead of 46 normal humans have 46 but these patients have 47 chromosome in all the cells out of the 47 so i told you now the chromosomes are in pairs so this is pair number one pair number two pair number three pair number four likewise so here pair number 21 not two chromosome three chromosome Pair number 13, not 2 chromosome, 3 chromosome. Pair number 18, not 2 chromosome, 3 chromosome. So, this is the main thing you have to understand here. So, Down syndrome is the most common chromosomal abnormality among all. Most common is Down. See, see the karyotype. Can you see the karyotype, please? Can you see the karyotype? Now, identify the disorder. Please identify the disorder. See, this is the abnormality. This is one pair. This is one pair. One pair. Count. The, if you count total are 47, not 46. Subse pehle toh trisomy, it's not monosomy. If you count, if you have the time, please count. Now see which is the triplet. All of them are pair, 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 pair. One is triplet. So 21 is the triplet. It's trisomy 21. So that's why answer is down. Give me a thumbs up if you got it. Now don't learn the symptoms and signs. Have a look on the diagram. This is a down baby. Down syndrome baby. Right. So basically the face, broad flat faces there. Right. The eyes are far away from each other having the epicanthic fold in between okay the hands there is a single palmar crease single palmar crease on the hand okay in the heart there are congenital heart abnormalities especially vsd okay and uh, hernias are very common umbilical hernia especially very common so i request you i'm not reading all the symptoms have a look on the diagram mentally retarded the child is mentally retarded so have a look on the diagram and learn main main features in the complication of the down, the most important complication is VSD. I told you in the heart, there is ventricular septal defect and ALL type of leukemias may occur. Okay. Now coming on, the patau. The patau is trisomy 13. Can you see here? If you count it total, the total are 47 again, not 46. But what is a triplet? This is a pair. This is a pair. This is a pair. I can see 13th number is a triplet. So there is trisomy of 13 that is patau. Patau is trisomy 13. The most, most typical feature is the cleft lip and cleft palate. Very unique feature. Apart from that, many things are there. But most important is cleft lip and cleft palate. Right? And polydactyly. You know, if you see the hands, it is not visible. More than five fingers are there. Polydactyly is very unique feature. Right? So, please learn it. Right? You can see all the feature. And the next one is the adword. Here, you can see the adword. Again, if you count, again it's 47. But this time, you can see the triplet is 18. It's 18 trisomy, right? The typical uh, feature here is rocker bottom foot. Have you seen your foot? So, the normal human foot is like this. It's like this. Appreciate the arch. Appreciate the arch. And see the foot here. It's opposite. It's opposite. This foot is known as rocker bottom foot. And opposite arch. This is rocker bottom foot. It is very unique feature for adverb. Rocker bottom foot. Other features are also there. There is a typical uh, uh, this thing also. The fist. Please do a fist. Fist yani mutti banna. We can do it normally. Na? Here you can see if you ask the baby to, to make a clenched fist. This digit number 2 and 5 are overlapping 3 and 4. You can see 2 and 5 are overlapping 3 and 4. This is 2. This is 5. They are overlapping 3 and 4. So it is always like this. Like yay. This is digit number 1. I guess everyone knows. This is 2, 3, 4, 5. Count the counting from 1. Counting start from the thumb. So digit number 2 and 5 is on the, I'm sorry, 1 and 5. No, no, no. 2 and 5 is on 3 and 4. It's like this. So it's always like this. Very unique thing. So it is advert. Say yes, it is advert. Okay, advert syndrome. Ah, ah, yes, it's advert. Okay. So we are done with the three disorders here. Down, patau. Adward, trisomy 21, trisomy 13, trisomy uh, 18. I told you unique, unique feature. Learn the unique feature. Don't learn all the features. Okay. Coming on the sex chromosome. In the sex chromosome, I will tell you one disorder in male, one in female. In the female, in the male, it's Clint Printer. In female, it's Turner. 
So see the Klein filter. The so total total chromosome are 47. What is additional? Additional is the sex chromosome. Normal male have XY. Here one additional X is present. It's XXY. So normal male is XY, but here the male, it's male only. Male having XXY. Right. So one extra, I'm sorry, just a second. In the, here one more extra chromosome is present. Y is normal. See, see the karyotype. It's a male. It's a male. If you count the total chromosome, it's 47. So what is additional? One X is additional. Normally it should be XY, but it's XXY. It's XXY. Right. So one extra X chromosome will give the female-like feature. X is female chromosome. Right. It will give female-like feature in the male. So the male will have atrophic testes, feminization, lack of secondary sexual characters. The breast is enlarged in male, like females. It is gynecomastia. I know. So that can be the thing. You can see. But the male is tall looking. The male is tall looking. The bones are tall. The intelligence is normal. I know. Such a male are usually get married. And after marriage, when they cannot conceive, then they come and notice that they are clinfrinter male. And they have normal intelligence. They are tall looking. The only thing, they don't have beard. They don't have mosque. The testes are atrophic. The external genitalia are extra atrophic. And the uh, pubic hairs are not there. Or the hair distribution is like females. So small testes, wide hip, narrow shoulders, poor beard. Right. So these are the features of the clinflinter. Say yes. The next is the turner. The turner is a female. Right. Normal females have 40, 46 chromosome. She is having 45. So which one is missing? One of the X is missing. So X0. I, normal female have two X. No. It's only one X. This is known as X0. X0. So total for, if you count total are 45. So it's a monosomy. It's a monosomy. It's 45 X. Monosomy of X. So such a female again. She is having atrophic ovaries. She is having edema over the neck, short neck and edema over the neck, right? And she don't have menstruation, don't have uh, breast enlargement, don't have secondary sexual characters. She cannot conceive like that. And she is short stretcher. She, but mental status is normal. So these are the symptoms. Give me a thumbs up if you got it. So we have discussed five disorders. Down, Patau, Edward, Clinfrinter, Turner. Say yes. Okay. Okay. Down, Patau, Edward, Clinfrinter, Turner. So down is trisomy, it's trisomy 21, this is trisomy 13 and this is trisomy 18. So tell me the total number of the chromosomes. The total chromosome 47, 47, 47 since they are trisomy. But here the pair number 21 is triplet, here pair number 13 is triplet, here pair number 18 is triplet. Right. What about Klinfrinter and Turner? Klinfrinter and Turner involve the sex chromosome. So Klinfrinter is also trisomy but of the sex chromosome and this one is a monosomy of the sex chromosome, right? Klinflinter is a male, Turner is a female. Tell me the karyotype. Here it's 47. Normal male is XY, it's XXY, one additional X. And here it is 45. Normal female is XX, here it's X0. So here one X is additional, here one is missing, right? And you know main main symptoms. So this is the, this is the crux. You have to learn the crux, okay? And learn one, 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 one main main symptom in all of them. Please, everyone, appreciate my efforts. Please give me a thumbs up. We are done with genetics. Congratulations. Can you please answer this question? What is Patau syndrome? What is Patau syndrome? What is Patau syndrome, please? Yes, you all are right. The Patau syndrome is trisomy 13. Yes, correct answer here is trisomy 13. I guess every one of you is right. Every one of you is right, okay? Yes. Instead of Patau, if I ask down, the answer will become A. And instead of down, if I ask Edward, the answer will become B. Very commonly asked question. Can we go ahead? Down syndrome is most commonly caused by what? Maternal non-disjunction or paternal? Maternal is mother. Paternal is father. Or translocation or mesoicism. So what is the most common cause of the down? Not only down. All these genetic disorders, most common cause is the maternal non-disjunction. Normally, mother is 46 XX. If the age of the mother, as I told you, is more than 35 years or some other problems are there, so the two ovas are formed, they are not equal. One of the ova contain 23 plus 1, one of the ova contain 23 minus 1. Normal ova 23, 23 and both of them are XX. So here this is known as maternal non-disjunction. This is the cause of these disorders. In Turner, what is the number of chromosomes? Turner, what is Turner? Turner is a female. So what is the number of the chromosomes? Is it a monosomy or trisomy? 45, 47, 46, 42. What is the total number of chromosome in a Turner female? You all are right. It's 45. It's 45. The Turner female is XO. I'm not O, X0 I mean. 
right so one of the x is missing so that's why it's 45 right let me read one more question for you there is a male the biggest clue given in the question is a male sexually underdeveloped the sex sex organs are not developed rudimentary testes are there prostate gland is also rudimentary sparse pubic hair facial hair is not there beard is not there mustache but the male is long long tall right large hands large feet so can you tell me the diagnosis and the genetic makeup so of course based on the symptom they are talking about the clint flinter syndrome you can make it out the male is with normal intelligence long tall the only thing the beard mustache is missing the pubic hair is missing and atrophic testes are there so what is clint flinter it's 47 xxy yes you all are right the correct answer is c it's a very repeatedly asked question they can change the you know symptom signs but ultimately uh, crux of the question is that you have to make the diagnosis and tell the genetic makeup yes we are done okay so we are done here also so what's now just a second i will share the annotated version of uh, ppt with you on the group after completing the session give me a minute okay so now i am moving on the neoplasia the next chapter to be discussed here is the neoplasia just a second let me see where it is The last chapter which I will discuss here in the general pathology is the neoplasia. So let's start neoplasia. Are you people there? Can I start neoplasia? So let's start neoplasia. What is neoplasia? Neoplasia. Neoplasia means new growth. Neoplasia, the new growth, which is known as tumor. Tumor. The study of the neoplasia is known as oncology. So what is neoplasia? How you will define a neoplastic cell? How the neoplastic cell is different from the normal cell? Normal cell is different from the neoplastic cell. How? Can you tell me the answer? How does a normal cell is different from the neoplastic cell? Can you see this is a normal cell I have drawn for you. In this cell, there is a growth factor coming, binding with the growth receptor. The red color is the growth receptor. The growth factor is coming, binding with the growth receptor and because of which the mitosis takes place. So the cell division takes place. The two cells are formed out of the one cell. So mitosis takes place only when growth factor or stimulus is coming. So mitosis is under physiological control. Okay. Now see a neoplastic cell. See, this is not a normal cell. This cell I have drawn here is a neoplastic cell. Why it is a neoplastic cell? Here the growth factor is absent. Here the growth factor is absent. The stimulus is absent. Even in absence of growth factor is doing the mitosis. So such a cell in which the mitosis, the cell division is uncontrolled. It's uncoordinated. Even on cessation of growth stimulus, it is going on dividing. So this cell will go on dividing, go on dividing, go on dividing. It will form a mass of cell. And that mass of cell is known as neoplasm or cancer. The only problem in the neoplastic cell is that their mitosis or cell division is uncontrolled. It's unregulated. They keep on dividing, keep on dividing. Uncontrolled growth. Yes, absolutely right. Mohit. They have uncontrolled growth. And uncontrolled growth leads to the neoplasm. So that is the thing. So what is neoplasia? It is the new growth. New growth. The new growth is the neoplasm. Okay. So when the growth is accidated, uncoordinated and even it occurs even after the cessation of the stimulus, it is known as neoplasia, right? Or neoplasm. Now there is a special type of uh, cancer. You know the human body is made up of three germ cell layers. During embryology, you may have read the three germ cell layers. The ectoderm, the mesoderm and the endoderm. All the germ cell layers lead to some organs like our blood vessels, our circulatory system is formed from the mesoderm, the nervous system is formed from the ectoderm. So I don't know exactly but yeah, all the organs are made up of some or other germ cells. So one organ contains one germ cell. So whenever cancer occurs in one organ, it is arising from one germ cell. The cancer of that organ having one germ cell. But there are certain cancer which arises from totipotent cell. What are totipotent cell? They can give rise to all the three germ cell layer. The ectoderm, the mesoderm, the endoderm. So basically the tumor containing all three germ cell layer. Such a tumor which contain all three germ cell, tumor, germ cell layer is known as teratoma. So what is teratoma? Teratoma is a tumor which contain all three germ cell layer. Normal tumors contain one germ cell layer. But teratomas are derived from totipotent cell and they contain all three germ cell layer. All three germ cell layer, acto, meso, endo. So inside them anything can present. 
So usually they occur in ovaries or testes. Now if you take out the tumor, you can find teeth in them. You can find hair, you can find gelatin, you can find cartilage, you can find bone, you can find brain inside the tumor. You can find pancreas, adipose tissue, technically anything, anything. So teeth, hair, bone, muscle, anything can be present. It is a teratoma. Say yes. So that is the meaning of the teratoma. So please learn the special tumor that is teratoma. Now I would like to, before coming on the main chapter of the neoplasia, I would like to highlight two things. Hamartoma and choreostoma. What is hamartoma and what is choreostoma? Both of them, these terminologies, they look like tumor but they are not tumor. They look like tumor. You can see the suffix is oma and oma. So you can confuse that it is a tumor but they are not tumor. Let me explain you the both. What is hamartoma? What is choreostoma? Let me explain. Let me read the definition. I will explain. Don't confused. So when the tissue is normal, but the site is abnormal, it's choreostoma. But when the tissue is abnormal, but site is normal, it's hamartoma. You will say, ma'am, what does it mean? What does it mean? Let me explain you. Let me explain you. Let me come on the hamartoma. Can you see here? So this is lung. Inside the lung, you can see this is the cartilage. This is the cartilage. So does normal lungs have cartilage? Yes, normal lungs have the tracheal rings here and the cartilage in the bronchi. We know. So normal lungs have cartilage. But the only thing here, so site is normal. The site is normal. Normal lung have cartilage. But the only thing, the cartilage become malformed. It become maldeveloped. Malformation is there. Right? It's not cancer. If you cut it, it's not dysplastic. It's not anaplastic. It's not cancer. The only thing, it is disorganized. The, the cartilage become disorganized, it become malformed, it is known as hamartoma. So hamartoma, the site is normal, but the tissue is abnormal. The tissue is abnormal, that is malformed, that is hamartoma. See the second example, spleen. You know in spleen, there is red pulp and there is white pulp. In the spleen, this is normal spleen, you can see it here. This is the normal spleen. Inside the normal spleen, you can see abundant of red pulp. So red pulp is normally present, the only thing it become malformed, it become uh, it become malformation or uh, uh, development, maldevelopment is there. So, but here the site is normal. Site is normal, tissue is abnormal, it is hamartoma. So, hamartoma is a developmental abnormality. The tissue become disorganized, the tissue become malformed, okay? The tissue become malformed, okay? So, hamartoma of the lung and hamartoma of the spleen. Hamartoma of the lung contain the cartilage, hamartoma of spleen contain the red and the white pulp. So, site is abnormal, tissues, tissue Site is normal, tissue is abnormal. The next is the choreostoma. In choreostoma, reverse happen. Can you see? This is the tongue. In the tongue, can you see the cartilage and the bone? Ah, normal tongue don't have cartilage and bone here, right? So, if you cut this cartilage bone, it's absolutely normal. It's not malformed. The only thing is site, site is abnormal. The tissue is normal, but the site is abnormal. The site is abnormal. Tissue is normal. Site is abnormal. That is osteocartilaginous choreostoma of the lung. Here also you can see we are doing the endoscopy of the stomach. In the stomach we found a mass that is pancreas. Pancreas don't present inside the stomach normally. It is absolutely normal pancreas. The only thing the site is abnormal. So say the thing. Say the two things. What we have learned. What we have learned. Say about the tissue. Say about the site. Tissue and site. Say about the tissue. Say about the site. What do you say? What is normal? What is abnormal? So say if the tissue is normal but the site is abnormal. Site is abnormal means ectopic. Site is abnormal. What is this known as? Or say the tissue is abnormal. Abnormal means it is not cancer. Mind it. It is malformation. Tissue is abnormal but the site is normal. Site is normal of that organ only. What is it known as? Can you tell me the answer? When the tissue is normal, site is ectopic. It is known as choristoma. Okay. And when the tissue is abnormal but site is normal, it is known as hamartoma. Hamar, hamartoma. How you will learn? I don't know. Right? Okay, you have to learn Islam. There is no mnemonic for that. Okay. If you know Hindi, hamar yani hamara. Hamartoma yani hamara. So, ye hamara apna hai. Site is normal. You can learn like that. It's a small mnemonic. If you learn, understand Hindi, hamar toma mein hamar aata hai na. Hamar matlab hamara. Kita na ye hamara hai, ye tumara hai. Hamara means my, my own. So its site is normal. It's normal site. Hamara hai. Hamara site hai. But tissue is abnormal. And you can make the reverse for the choreostoma if you want a mnemonic at all. Okay. So can we go ahead? Yes. Yes. Absolutely right. Teratoma is something different. You have got it. Okay. So can we go ahead? So please learn choreostoma, hamartoma. You get many questions on that. So what we have learned, let's summarize. They are not tumors. Neither choreostoma is tumor, not hamartoma is tumor. Both are tumor like lesion, but they are not tumor. Choreostoma, the Tissue is normal, but the site is not abnormal. That is ectopic. Hamartoma, the tissue is abnormal, but the site is normal. I hope everyone got it. Okay. 
ओके कैन वी गेट गो हेड ओके यस यस खुश सिंह चोरी का टिश्यू इज कोरियोस्टोमा यू कैन लर्न तो कोरियो से याद आएगा चोरी ही मीन टू से दैट आई गेस सो इट्स अ गुड वन तो कोरियोस्टोमा इज चोरी यू नो चोरी करते हैं स्टीलिंग समथिंग इफ यू स्टील समथिंग सो दिस द साइड इज अब नॉर्मल ना तो उन्होंने चुराया है कहीं और से द साइड इज अब नॉर्मल सो गुड वन थैंक यू थैंक यू गुड वन तो खुश हज गिवन अ गुड नेमोनिक तो कोरियोस्टोमा इज चोरी का माल ओके एंड हमार टोमा इज हमारा माल हमारा अपना सो यू कैन लर्न लाइक दैट गुड वन सो कैन वी गो हैड so we have learned the two things the summary is in front of you both of them none of them is tumor both of them are tumor like lesions but none of them is real tumor so one is choriostoma so the site is ectomic but the tissue is normal hamartoma the tissue is abnormal but the site is abnormal site is normal but the tissue is abnormal i hope you got it can we go ahead can we go ahead we will solve some mcqs now based on that so the first question is in front of you tumor containing cells of all three जम सेल लेयर्स आई गेट एवरी आई गेस एवरी वन नोज द आंसर आई गेस एवरी वन नोज द आंसर वॉट इज द करेक्ट आंसर हियर प्लीज ट्यूमर कंटेनिंग सेल्स ऑफ ऑल थ्री जम लेयर्स वॉट इज द करेक्ट आंसर वॉट इज द करेक्ट आंसर यस टेल मी द आंसर Yes, of course, the correct answer is teratoma. I don't know why you people are not writing the answer. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. So all three germ cell layer, the teratoma only tumor. What is hamartoma? Can you define? Is it malignant tumor? Is it metastatic tissue? Is it developmental malformation? Or is it hemorrhage in the vessel? Very easy question. Can you tell me what is hamartoma? Who will tell me what is hamartoma? What is hamartoma? Is it malignant tumor? Malignant tissue, developmental malformation, or hemorrhage in the vessel? Yes, I'm waiting for the answer. So of course, the correct answer is C. It's a developmental malformation. It's not malignant tissue. Neither malignant nor metastatic, not hemorrhage. The correct answer is C. The next question is in front of you. Ectopic rest of the normal tissue. I mean to say, the tissue is normal, but the site is abnormal. The site is abnormal. The tissue is normal, but site is abnormal. What it is known as? Choriostoma, hamartoma, pseudo tumor. It's pseudo tumor. Pseudo tumor or lymphoma. What is the correct answer? Yes. You all are right. The correct answer is A. The ectopic site, but the normal tissue. What is hamartoma? The next question. What is hamartoma? Is it proliferation of the cell in the foreign site? Proliferation of the native cell in the tissue? Malignant condition, acquired condition. It's neither acquired, it's neither malignant. Now tell me answer from A and B. It is proliferative of the cell at foreign site, or it is proliferation of the native cells of the same site in other tissue. So what do you say? Yes, the correct answer here is B. It's the native cell. The site is normal. The same site, the tissue is abnormal. So the word native is very important here. Yes, the correct answer here is B. So we are done with this also. The next topic is benign versus malignant tumors. Okay. So what are the differences? You know there are two type of tumors, the benign and the malignant. How to differentiate between benign and malignant tumor? What is what are benign tumor? What are malignant tumor? How to differentiate between the two? How you can differentiate the benign tumor from the malignant tumor? Can you please tell me? how you can differentiate the benign tumor from the malignant tumor yes how you can differentiate the benign tumor from the malignant tumor so based on the five features we can differentiate based on their rate of growth clinical feature gross microscopy and most important is the spread of the tumor so the benign tumor and malignant tumor let me show you here only the benign tumor are slow growing the malignant tumor are fast growing this is based on their rate of growth based on the clinical feature benign tumor usually asymptomatic usually exceptions are there and malignant tumor usually symptomatic again exceptions are there gross feature the benign tumor they are well circumscribed they are well circumscribed they are capsulated they are circle oval malignant they are irregular they don't have capsule they are infiltrating the benign compress the tissue the malignant infiltrate inside the invade the tissue okay microscopic feature i will explain you i will explain the 10 features the 10 features of the dysplasia which makes the differences between benign and malignant and most important the last one is the spread of the tumor benign tumor do not do any spread no metastasis no local invasion malignant tumors do the both so based on these feature we can differentiate the benign tumor from the malignant tumor yes based on the gross finding shalini based on the size also we can differentiate okay so let me discuss the five points one by one let me start let me start the characteristic of the tumor so benign tumor the rate of the growth here 
they are slow growing the malignant one are the fast growing clinical features the benign tumors the benign tumors they are asymptomatic usually except some like meningioma they can produce the seizures and various symptoms malignant tumors usually rapidly growing usually they rapidly grow they rapidly grow they can ulcerate on the surface and they can do the systemic features also like weight loss anorexia anemia usually they are symptomatic gross features benign tumors are small spherical capsule present well circumscribed malignant tumors are irregular you can see here both of them are breast tumors this one is benign this one is malignant both are breast tumor here you can see the benign tumor is well circumscribed the malignant tumor is irregular it is invading inside right so based on the gross we can identify and the most important feature to differentiate benign and malignant tumor is the microscopic feature the microscopic feature is the anaplasia can you see these are the 10 points of the anaplasia based on which we can define whether it is a benign tumor or a malignant tumor let me discuss the 10 points of the anaplasia can you see this is a normal or benign and this one is the malignant tumor so see first is the basal polarity in the morning i explained you what is basal polarity Basal polarity means the nucleus is present towards the basement membrane. So, basal polarity is present in benign, but it is lost in the malignant. So, first feature is loss of basal polarity. Second, pleomorphism. Here, all the cells are of same size. Here, some cells are small, some are moderate, some are large. So, here pleomorphism is absent, here it is present. So, presence of pleomorphism is anaplasia. Okay, NC ratio, here NC ratio, you can see small nucleus and more cytoplasm. Here, you can see the nucleus is big and cytoplasm is less. So, here ANC ratio is high, right? And isonucleosis is the size of the nucleus. All the nucleus here same size. Here some are small, some are large. So, here no anisonucleosis, here anisonucleosis is present. You can see the nuclear chromatin here, it's normal. Here dark color nucleus is there. So, hyperchromatism is there. Inside the nucleus, appreciate the nucleoli. Here there is no nucleoli, here nucleoli is present. Here there is no mitosis, here mitosis is present. Here you can see no giant cell. Here some of the cells having multiple nucleus that is giant cells are present. So these are the features basically you have to learn differentiating between the benign and the malignant tumors. You got my point? So just to let me go and the next point is the spread of the tumor. There are two types of spread. Let me explain you. After that we will take a lunch break. Okay. So just five minutes more. So you can see this is a patient. This is a patient. Just imagine she is having uh, any tumor, just suppose breast tumor, okay. So, if it is growing, growing, growing and involving the pectoralis major, involving the ribs, involving the surrounding tissue, it is known as local invasion. Local means in continuity it is growing. Local invasion means it, it is continuity involving other organs. Apart from that organ, involving other organs also in continuity. But the second option is that the tumor cells are going in the blood vessel. Or lymphatic vessel and via blood vessel it is reaching in multiple organs of the body and involving multiple secondaries in multiple organs which are discontinuous with the primary discontinuous this is known as distant spread distant spread is known as metastasis metastasis the word to be picked here is the discontinuous multiple secondaries so there are two type of spread local and distant you got it if you got it give me a thumbs up what are the two types of spread local spread distant spread distant spread is known as metastasis the local spread occurs in continuity and distance spread metastasis it is the discontinuous multiple secondaries are formed both of them are are absent in benign and both of them are present in malignant you got it you got it so same thing is shown to you can you see here this is a tumor it is going on involving the surrounding tissue in continuity in continuity this is local invasion after that it is moving to the blood one of the cell is going to the blood via blood it is going to multiple other organs and forming multiple secondaries here so this is metastasis this is local invasion this is metastasis i hope you got it i hope you got it now please understand benign tumor may dono absent hai. neither local invasion nor metastasis but malignant tumor may dono present hai. please please okay so i told you the five now please i'm enumerating everyone here on the screen so i have told you the five differences to differentiate the benign and the malignant tumor okay benign tumor malignant tumor help me in filling so based on rate of growth, these are slow growing, these are fast growing. Okay, based on clinical feature, these are asymptomatic, exceptions are there. These are symptomatic, exceptions are there. Based on the gross finding, these are circular, oval, spherical, um, uh, capsule is there. These are uh, irregular, no capsule is there. Based on microscopy, I told you the features of the anaplasia. So here uh, the polarity is present, here the basal polarity is lost, right? 
um, here hyperchromatism is present, pleomorphism is present, and isonucleosis is present. I mean, I'm, uh, all of them are absent in benign and present in malignant. So please learn those 10 features. The last one I told you, the local invasion and distant invasion, both are absent in benign, both are present in malignant. Both are present. Now, these are the differences, everyone here, everyone here on the screen, which is the surest sign of malignancy out of the five. Surest, most reliable sign, which differentiate benign versus malignancy. One sign, the surest one. Surest, most reliable sign to differentiate benign or malignant. It is known as surest sign of malignancy. Can you tell me the answer? The surest sign. Surest sign. What is the surest sign of malignancy? The most reliable one. The most reliable one is the metastasis, number one. So, if metastasis is present, it has to be malignant. There is no exception. There is no exception. Okay. The second most surest is the local invasion. Again, if it is present, it has to be malignant. Third most is the microscopy. Right. Rest all are just clues. They will not give you sure. Okay. So, most surest sign is metastasis. Okay. Please learn. It's a very important MCQ. So, surest sign, most reliable sign is the metastasis. Second most reliable sign is the local invasiveness. Same thing is written in front of you. You got it? So that is the benign versus malignant tumors I told you. We will solve some MCQs and we are done till now. Just a second. MCQs are not very important here. We can leave. So let's take a break. Let's say a lunch break. After that, what topics are left? Let me tell you. Okay. So from neoplasia, metastasis is left. Right. So I will tell you the three roots of the metastasis. I will tell you the tumor markers. I will tell you the carcinogenesis, the physical, chemical and biological. Yeah, these are the important topics from neoplasia. We are packing with general. So I guess I was having more 30, 40 minutes. I can pack general before lunch. But yeah, I'm lacking. First, I will take the lunch. In the next, after lunch, 30 minutes, I will try or 40 minutes, I will try to complete general. Right. After that, in hemat, we have few anemias, leukemias and platelet disorders. I will take only important one here, not the detail. In anemia, I will require one hour. In leukemias, I will require one hour. Right. Platelet disorders, I will tell you only classification and hemophilia is not important one here. So, I will take, I guess, two and a half hour session more here. Let me plan how we can do after the lunch. Okay. So, let's take a lunch. Currently, it's uh, two o'clock. So, let's connect again at uh, what? How many? How much time you require for lunch? Let me know. How much time you require for lunch? Uh, let's connect at after uh, 45 minutes, 2.45. Okay. At 2.45, we will connect and we'll try to compile till 4 o'clock. 4 or 4.30 maximum. 4 or 4.30, I will try to finish it up. Okay. So, let's come back at 2.45. Lunch break. Give me a thumbs up if you got it. Okay. Okay. So, please come back at 2.45 sharp. I'm ending it right now.
Hello everyone, am I back? Am I visible? Am I audible? Give me a minute to check. If everything is good, I will start the session ad. Am I clearly visible, audible? You can write in the chat box. Okay, thank you, thank you, Kush, for uh, confirming. Thank you so much. So, can we continue the session ahead? Can we continue the session? Yes, so let's continue the session, okay? Okay, thank you, Osama. Thank you, Farhad. Thank you, thank you. So, you people are still there. Thank you. So, let's start ahead. We were uh, studying the general pathology. In general pathology, we have covered most of the topic. The last topic uh, is the neoplasia we are taking on. We have already seen cell adaptation, cell injury, cell death, acute inflammation, chronic inflammation, apoptosis, necrosis. We have already covered um, uh, after that hemodynamics, right? Thrombosis, embolism, shock, edema. We have already covered the genetics. And now we have started neoplasia. So, in neoplasia, uh, just a second give me a minute so i would like to continue neoplasia with the topic carcinogenesis give me a minute so let me start with carcinogenesis and tumor marker these two topics are important here still in neoplasia after that the general pathology is done the important topics are done after that we will move on hematology so let's start with carcinogenesis okay what is carcinogenesis first understand what is carcinogens what is carcinogenesis first understand that okay carcinogenesis is the mechanism of induction of tumor can you see here okay let me show you can you see everyone see on the screen can you see two cells in front of you in the first cell you can see the growth factor is coming this is the growth factor it is binding with the growth receptor when the growth factor come bind with the growth receptor the cell divide in the second cell you can see no growth factor is coming in absence of growth factor cell do not divide right now what is the genes which are leading this like the growth factor in presence of growth factor there is a gene known as proto oncogene which gets stimulated and causes the cell division in absence of growth factor there is another gene known as tumor suppressor gene inside the nucleus in, in the dna these are the names of the genes tumor suppressor gene gets stimulated and it inhibits cell division so, proto-oncogene causes mitosis, tumor suppressor gene inhibit mitosis normally in all of us, in me, in you, in all normal individuals, the cell division is caused by proto-oncogene in presence of growth factor and cell division is inhibited by tumor suppressor gene. Learn the name of the two genes, the proto-oncogene and tumor suppressor gene. One is causing the uh, stimulation of cell division other is causing the inhibition of the cell division please understand so can i say proto oncogene is like the accelerator have you drive any vehicle like car or any vehicle so if you want to increase the speed what do you do of course you will apply the accelerator if you want to decrease the speed or stop the car what do you do of course you will apply the brake so can i say the proto oncogene is like accelerator it is causing the stimulation of the cell division or increasing the rate of cell division can i say tumor suppressor genes are the like the brakes they inhibit or stop the cell division can i say this say yes or no say yes or no shalini atul tej, uh, tej deep can i say this so these are the accelerator these are the brake so imagine i'm driving a car i want to increase the speed i will apply the accelerator i want to decrease the speed or stop the car i will apply the brake so speed is balanced this is known as balanced the same occurs in human body the god has provided the molecular accelerator and the molecular brake with us we have a molecular accelerator we have a molecular brake okay so but imagine an unfortunate condition if the brake is failed you are driving a car or anyone is driving a car the brake is failed or the accelerator got stuck at the highest speed you cannot reduce the accelerator what will happen the speed increases drastically imagine if the same occurs in human body in the human body the proto oncogenes get overstimulated these are the accelerator they got stuck at the highest speed they are overstimulated or the tumor suppressor genes they are inhibited because of the mutation so what will happen the one which causes cell division is overstimulated the one which stops cell division is inhibited it will lead to uncontrolled cell division it will lead to cancer so this is how the cancer takes place in human body cancer takes place because of two reasons there are two reasons for cancer 
ओवर स्टिमुलेशन ऑफ प्रोटो ऑनको जीन इनिबिशन ऑफ ट्यूमर सप्रेसर जीन सो यू कैन सी द टू टाइप ऑफ द जीन्स द एक्सेलरेटर गॉट ओवर स्टिमुलेटेड एंड द ब्रेक्स गॉट इनिबिटेड द ब्रेक इज फेल्ड एंड द एक्सेलर इज स्टक एट द हाइएस्ट स्पीड वॉट विल हैपन अनकंट्रोल स्पीड अनकंट्रोल सेल डिविजन अनकंट्रोल सेल डिविजन लीड्स टू कैंसर गिव मी अ थम्स अप दिस इज द सिंप्लीफाइड वर्जन हाउ यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड द मॉलिकुलर मेकेनिज्म ऑफ द कैंसर यू गॉट इट Now the point is that you must ask me, ma'am, why the proto oncogene get overstimulated? Proto oncogene and tumor suppressor gene, they are normal gene. They are present in me, you all, healthy individual. But we have normal version. If they get mutated and get overstimulated, or if they get mutated and get inhibited, then they are abnormal and lead to cancer. You got my point? Tumor suppressor gene and proto oncogene, they are not no abnormal. Normally, they are normal only. But once they get they get mutated, they are abnormal. So who is causing the mutation? who is causing the mutation the mutation can be caused by one of the three agent either the physical or chemical or biological and that is known as carcinogenesis you got it that is known as carcinogenesis so what is known as carcinogenesis it is the mechanism of induction of mutation inside the cell and the agents the physical chemical or biological agents are known as carcinogens so basically there are three type of carcinogens they all cause mutations mutation of the two genes either they cause mutation of proto oncogene that is gain of function mutation that is they get overstimulated or they can cause mutation of tumor suppressor gene that is loss of function mutation they got inhibited so these mutations are caused either by the physical agent or chemical agent or biological agent and this is known as carcinogenesis first understand what is carcinogenesis have we got it now let's start with physical carcinogenesis what is physical carcinogenesis the physical carcinogenesis is uh, you know radiation induced carcinogenesis so there are rays in the environment where we are living now we are surrounded with multiple rays you know uv and ir rays are mainly they can induce the cancer we will discuss them one by one uv ir the source of them the cancer they causes and the mechanism so source let's start with uv light what is the source of the uv light from where we get the uv light we get the uv light from sunlight imagine this is the earth and this is the sun let me draw the sun this is the sun we get sunlight from the sun and it falls on the earth there are three uv rays present in the sunlight uv a b c three uv rays are coming from the sunlight c never reaches the earth because c is filtered by the ozone we know the earth is surrounded by ozone so the c is filtered by ozone only a and b are coming on the earth a is coming b is coming on the earth learn b for bad b for bad b is bad for humans b for bad right so a do not cause the cancer b causes cancer it's a very important question b can cause cancers uvb you can learn the wavelength if you wish the wavelength of abc c get filtered by the ozone not reaching the earth b is the carcinogenic among abc b is carcinogenic never never forget which cancers it causes it causes only skin cancer on the skin it can cause squamous cell carcinoma basal cell carcinoma and melanoma the three type of cancers in the skin squamous cell carcinoma basal cell carcinoma and melanoma among them the most common is basal cell carcinoma right what is the mechanism imagine this is a skin cell it is a skin cell of human the keratinocyte this is the nucleus inside the nucleus this is the dna containing multiple genes now this uvb is coming uvb is coming from the sunlight once it comes now you know normal watson and crick model of the dna you have read this in biochemistry so purine form bonds with pyrimidine right adenine form bonds with cytosine i'm sorry thymidine and cytosine bond form bonds with guanine we know that purine form bonds with pyrimidine i guess everyone knows that if the uv uvb is falling on the cell because of uvb on the dna there is pyrimidine pyrimidine bond formation i repeat my words there is pyrimidine pyrimidine bond formation pyrimidine pyrimidine bond formation which leads to mutation and this mutation leads to cancer the mutation can be in proto oncogene or tumor suppressor gene that leads to cancer say yes you got it so what is the mechanism due to uv light pyrimidine pyrimidine dimers are formed pyrimidine form bonds with pyrimidine 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 dimers are formed that leads to mutation that leads to cancer the mutation are two type you know either proto oncogene gain of function or tumor suppressor gene the loss of function say yes are you people there are you understanding the topic is difficult but i'm trying my best so this is the mechanism right let me come on the next rays the next rays are the ir rays ir rays are present in sunlight no 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 uv rays are present in sunlight but ir are not present in sunlight the ir rays are present in x rays gamma rays alpha rays beta rays it can present that how many cancers it cause it cause all type of leukemia how many type of leukemia you know it is 
एक्यूट माइलॉइड ल्यूकेमिया एक्यूट लिम्फॉइड ल्यूकेमिया क्रॉनिक माइलॉइड ल्यूकेमिया क्रॉनिक लिम्फॉइड ल्यूकेमिया देर आर फोर टाइप्स ऑफ ल्यूकेमिया आई आर कॉजेज थ्री ऑफ दैम नॉट द फोर्थ वन सो विच वन इट डजन कॉजेज इट नेवर कॉजेज सी एल एल आई आर इट्स अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पी वाई क्यू आई आर आई आर मीन्स आयोनाइजिंग रेडिएशन आयोनाइजिंग रेडिएशन नेवर कॉजेज सी एल एल अपार्ट फ्रॉम सी एल एल इट कॉजेज ऑल ल्यूकेमिया सी एस So it causes all leukemia except 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 mind exception. Please mind the exception. Exception is CLL. It never causes CLL. Number one. Number two, it causes all thyroid cancer. There are four types of thyroid cancer: follicular, papillary, uh, anaplastic, medullary. It causes all of them. Most common is papillary, but it causes all of them. Right. So that is the thing. That is the thing. And CLL is never caused by IR. What is the mechanism? Imagine either this is a uh wbc uh bone marrow cell i mean or it is a thyroid cell it is having the dna and ir is falling this time uv is not falling the ir is falling on the cell so when ionizing radiation is falling on the cell you know in the cytoplasm the cell is having water of course all cells have water what is water what is water is h2 hoh when ir rays fall on the water water form the free radicals oh negative water forms the free radical oh negative and this oh negative will cause the mutation so form the mutation here is due to the formation of the free radical from the water this is the mechanism you got it so exposure to to ionizing radiation dislodge ions from the water and it will form the free radical that causes mutation that leads to cancer you got it so we are done listen listen first i will write for you then you will tell me the answers so tell me uv rays ir rays the two type of the physical carcinogenesis okay you have to tell me the source of each of them number 1 you have to tell me the cancers they are causing in which organ and you have to tell me the mechanism in one one line not in detail that's it so what is the source of uv who will tell me what is the source of uv of course it's sunlight there are three uv uv a b c which is bad d for bad uv b is bad it is carcinogenic c never reaches the earth and a is good a is healthy right so ir the source is x ray alpha ray beta ray gamma ray which cancers does it causes here uv rays causes skin cancer the three type of skin cancers squamous cell carcinoma basal cell carcinoma and melanoma okay and here it causes either thyroid cancer or blood cancer thyroid cancer are of four type papillary follicular medullary anaplastic and blood cancer all leukemia but never cll right mechanism you have to tell me for both of them what is the mechanism here the mechanism is pyrimidine pyrimidine dimer formation which leads to mutation here the mechanism is formation of free radical which leads to mutation say yes so you get many mcqs based on the physical carcinogenesis we are done with physical let's start chemical can we go ahead yes here bcc is most common very good and here papillary is most common can we go ahead yes give me a thumbs up you all are right very good okay so the same thing is written in front of you see the source see the cancer see the mechanism okay we will solve some questions if you answer it very fast ha huh? i don't have time so the first question is in front of you skin cancers due to sunlight exposure induced by uv a b c d which uv causes skin cancer a b c d which uv i told you very specifically which uv is bad you have to tell me which uv is bad okay so there is a little bit delay so i will lay, wait for your answers let me see i guess you all are right b for bad so b for bad absolutely right so uv b is bad it is a very important question one of the following leukemia never occurs after radiation is it aml is it cml is it all or is it cll what is the correct answer what do you say ha huh? so there are four types of leukemia one of them never occurs after radiation ir radiation can lead to leukemia but cll never occurs so correct answer is d and you all are right you all are right very good going to the next question uv radiation has one of the following effects on the cell tell me the mechanism of action of uv what is the mechanism of action of uv it prevents it prevents formation of pyril py pyrilodin uh, dimers it stimulates the formation of pyrimidine dimers prevents the formation of purine dimer all of the above what is the correct answer you tell me what so all the options are related to dimer 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 but what is the exact answer is it purine pyrimidine it prevents or it stimulates so what is the correct answer can you please tell me 
what is the mechanism of action of the uv i mean yes it stimulates the formation of pyrimidine and pyrimidine dimer you all are right so we are done with physical carcinogenesis let's start chemical carcinogenesis can i can i okay so there are many chemicals which can cause cancer there are two type of chem chemicals direct and indirect we are surrounded with chemicals in the air in whatever we eat whatever we drink it contains many pesticides many chemicals you know uh, so pollution contains the chemicals and some of the chemicals causes cancer the best example you can take not only like this you can take the smoking what does the smoke contain we all know we all know smoking leads to lung cancer what does the smoke contain smoke contain tar and tar leads to cancer so tar is the chemical present inside the smoke that leads to lung cancer so there are two types of chemical the direct and the indirect direct carcinogens and indirect carcinogens two type of chemicals are present direct and indirect carcinogens okay what do you mean by direct they are directly going in the body and they induce mutation they go to the target organ and induce mutation indirect one are inactive one first they go in the liver they become activated inside human body after that they go to the target organ and they cause the cancer right now what are the steps how does the chemical uh, induces cancer like what are the stages in chemical carcinogenesis so there are three stages what are the three stages you can see its initiation promotion and progression in the initiation itself there are four steps metabolic activation reactive electrophile mutation and initiated cell i will show you all rather i will draw it for you okay let me draw a rough diagram of huh, human body so i'm drawing a rough sketch diagram so don't laugh okay it's a rough sketch diagram just to explain you imagine this person is exposed to some chemical right now the chemical is present in the blood let me draw the blood vessel okay let me draw the liver let me draw the target organ let's say the target organ is lung it can be anyone right the chemical is present in the blood so if the chemical is direct it will go directly to the target organ but if the chemical is indirect first it will go to the liver in the liver hepatocytes are present inside the hepatocytes there is a enzyme known as cytochrome p450 that cytochrome p450 convert the inactive to active inactive chemical to active chemical that is the first step so let's start initiation in the initiation the first step is metabolic activation the metabolic activation takes place in liver so indirect chemical goes in the liver the liver converted from indirect to direct inactive to active and again it will go in the blood after becoming active it will go in the blood so first step is over the metabolic activation say yes after that after that uh, we are going to the target cell we are going to the target cell i mean the chemical will go to the tar uh, uh, target cell in the target cell imagine the target cell this is the nucleus of the target cell imagine it is a cell so in the cytoplasm it will lose electron let me draw a target cell this is a target cell the nucleus of the target cell the dna of the target cell this is the chemical which is already active which is already active if it is direct it is directly coming here indirect first go in the liver and then come here okay now this chemical will lose electron and form the electrophile electrophile here lose the electron and become positively charged it will in the cytoplasm of the target cell now nucleus is negatively charged we all know nucleus is negatively charged and by losing electron it become positively charged so negative attract positive so because of that it will go in the nucleus and hit the dna i'm using the word hit it will hit the dna it will hit the dna right because of which it will produce the cancers right so first electrophile formation then it hit the nucleus and causes mutation and because of the mutation the cell will divide and form the initiated cell so these are the steps of initiation you got it so in initiation there are four steps i have explained you so first the metabolic activation only the indirect chemical first go in the liver and by cytochrome p450 it will be activated then it will form reactive electrophiles it will lose the electron and form positively charged ions which are known as electrophile and it will hit the dna produce the mutations and finally the initiated cell is formed say yes can we go ahead can we go ahead the initiated cell is formed now the initiated cell the mutated cell is the initiated cell okay the mutated or initiated cell is present but it will not cause the cancer this is the mutated cell it is already having the mutation by the chemical the mutation is already there but it cannot cause the cancer unless until it is having um, uncontrolled proliferation for that another chemical is required the name of that chemical is promoter 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 will cause the proliferation of the mutated cell so this cell go on dividing go on dividing from 1 to 2 
टू टू फोर फोर टू एट एट टू सिक्सटीन सिक्सटीन टू थर्टी टू थर्टी टू टू सिक्सटी फोर लाइक वाइज एंड इट विल फॉर्म अ बंच ऑफ सेल्स नोन एज कैंसर सो दिस इज नोन एज प्रमोशन सो इनिशिएशन डिफरेंट केमिकल इज रिक्वायर्ड प्रमोशन डिफरेंट केमिकल इज रिक्वायर्ड द केमिकल रिक्वायर्ड फॉर इनिशिएशन इज इनिशिएटर द केमिकल रिक्वायर्ड फॉर प्रमोशन इज प्रमोटर राइट एंड फॉर अ कैंसर बोथ आर रिक्वायर्ड राइट इनिशिएटर कॉजेज म्यूटेशन it is mutagenic and promoter causes proliferation of already mutated cell please appreciate my efforts come on you got it so initiator chemical causes the mutation and promoter chemical causes the proliferation of the mutated cell and finally the cancer occurs right this is known as progression you got it so promoter is required it do not damage the dna it do not produce the mutation it causes proliferation of the mutated cell okay so initiator should be followed by promoter promoter is not followed by initiator then only cancer will occur if only initiator is present there is no cancer if only promoter is present see the triangles are the promoter green triangles then also no cancer is present if initiator if promoter is followed by initiator again no cancer is present cancer occur only if initiator is followed by promoter whether in continuity or whether after a gap say yes So it is a diagram from Robbins, and I hope you all can understand it very well now. Okay, so initiator should be uh, uh, followed by promoter. Promoter should not followed by initiator. Promoter, पहले आके क्या करेगा? What does the promoter will do? अगर mutated cell ही नहीं होगा तो first initiator should come, cause the mutation. Then promoter should come, and it it should cause the proliferation of the mutated cell. Okay, and finally, just suppose we are talking of the lung cancer. the initiator is the tar it will produce the cancer the promoter is also tar sometimes the same chemical acts as a both okay it is also causing the problem but the patient don't have cough patient don't have dyspnea so genotypically the patient have cancer but phenotypically you know phenotype phenotype means the expression when the cancer is expressing it is known as progression the progression is the phenotypic expression of the malignancy you got it so these are the steps initiation promotion progression in the initiation there are four steps say yes How does the chemical carcinogenesis occurs? Who will tell me? How does the chemical carcinogenesis occurs? There are three steps. First, initiation is required. Then promotion is required, and then progression. That is phenotypic expression. In the initiation, there are four steps. First, metabolic activation. It occurs in liver. It is required only by indirect chemical, not direct chemical. Then electrophile formation. Electrophile formation takes place in the target organ cells. in the cytoplasm then mutation mutation mutate mutated cell is formed and initiated cell is formed then promoter is required that causes clonal proliferation of the mutated cell and then progression is the phenotypic expression of the cancer say yes so i hope you got it right so is there is any test to prove the chemical carcinogenesis i explained you the chemical carcinogenesis you should not believe me you should ask me ma'am is there is any proof that whatever you are saying is right केमिकल कॉजेज कैंसर इसका कोई प्रूफ है क्या देर इज सम टेस्ट विच कैन प्रूव दैट केमिकल कॉजेज कैंसर येस देर इज द टेस्ट सो द नेम ऑफ द टेस्ट इज अमीज टेस्ट वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पी वाई क्यू अमीज टेस्ट फर्स्ट लर्न अमीज टेस्ट इज प्रूविंग दैट केमिकल कैन कॉज कैंसर लेट मी एक्सप्लेन द टेस्ट इट्स अ वेरी इजी टेस्ट सो टेक अ बैक्टीरिया इन अ टेस्ट यू टेक द बैक्टीरियल सस्पेंशन द नेम ऑफ द बैक्टीरिया सालमोनेला टाइफी म्यूरियम what is the name of the bacteria it's salmonella typhi murium it's the name of the bacteria salmonella typhi murium it is already mutated we are taking already mutated strain you know what is the mutation salmonella typhi murium cannot grow without histidin histidin is given then only it will do binary fission otherwise it will not grow it's a unique property this is the mutated strain that cannot synthesize histidin in the body so if you give from outside then only the bacteria will grow otherwise it it will not grow because it is a mutated strain it cannot synthesize histidin okay now you put one drop of this bacteria bacterial suspension mix it with the chemicals mix it with chemicals in a jar right now if the chemical is carcinogenic the chemical will cause the mutation in this bacteria but you will say ma'am it's already mutated it's already so basically they will reverse the mutation उल्टे का उल्टा सुल्टा हिंदी में कहते हैं यू गॉट माई पॉइंट द बैक्टीरिया इज ऑलरेडी म्यूटेटेड राइट एंड द केमिकल विल कॉज द म्यूटेशन सो यू नो माइनस माइनस इज इक्वल टू प्लस इन मैथमेटिक्स तो बेसिकली द म्यूटेशन विल रिवर्स राइट बिकॉज ऑफ द केमिकल द म्यूटेशन द ऑलरेडी म्यूटेटेड सेल द म्यूटेशन विल रिवर्स इट विल कॉज म्यूटेशन ओवर म्यूटेशन टू रिवर्स द म्यूटेशन 
I mean to say. Now, if you try to grow this bacteria on histidine free media, the bacterial colonies can be seen. This is only occurring when the mutation is reversed. Say yes. Say yes. Can we go ahead? Can we go ahead? Okay. So, this is Ami's test. This is Ami's test. You can see the list of the chemicals and the corresponding cancers they cause. I request all my dear students, I will provide the notes. Please have a look on this list. Like alkylating agents causes AML, androgens causes prostate cancer, dyes causes bladder cancer, arsenic causes cancer of the lung and the skin, asbestos causes cancer of lung, pura, mesothelium, like this. On there is a already uh, asked question, PYQ on the vinyl chloride, on benzene, on aflatoxin. Vinyl chloride causes angiosarcoma of the liver. Benzene, benzene causes leukemia and aflatoxin causes liver cancer. So, please learn this list. It's very important. We are done. We are done with the chemical carcinogenesis also. Can you tell me the answer? The question is in front of you. A simple bacterial test for mutagenic carcinogenesis. Is it Ami's test, redox test, bacteriophage or gene splicing? What is the correct answer? The simple bacterial test for mutagenic carcinogenesis. For mutagenic carcinogens. One test. Single bacterial test. To prove that. Yes, the correct answer is Ami's test. Just now I told you. For mutagenic carcinogens. Okay, so correct answer is A. You all are right. Okay. Uh, rest questions you can see by yourself. The last thing here in Neoplasia I would like to tell you is the biological carcinogenesis. So let's start biological carcinogenesis. In biological carcinogenesis I would like to tell you three type of carcinogenesis viral, bacterial and parasitic. What do you mean by biological carcinogenesis? Some biological agent is causing the cancer. So how many viruses? There are six viruses. There is one bacteria and four parasite. Total 11 organisms in this world are carcinogenic. They can cause cancer. So you should know. The first thing you should know the list. Which six viruses? How many of them are DNA viruses? How many of them are RNA viruses? So you should know the list of the viruses. You should know the list of the bacteria and list of the parasite. Okay. So let's start with the viruses. Okay. So you can see the list. These are the six viruses I am telling you. They are carcinogenic. You can read HPV, human papilloma virus, Epstein Barr virus. Hepatitis B, Hepatitis C virus, HIV, HTLV and HHV. So, you know these, so you should know which cancer, each of them is causing which cancer. Only one bacteria is carcinogenic which can cause cancer. The name of the bacteria is Helicobacter pylori. It causes two, two stomach cancer, the gastric cancer, the adenocarcinoma of the stomach and maltoma, the lymphoma or the maltoma of the stomach. Both are of them are of stomach only. One is adenocarcinoma, one is maltoma. And there are four parasites which causes cancer. Cystosomiasis, clonorchus sinensis, ophisthorchus and fasciola hepatica. Very important PYQ. Learn the list. Learn the name of the six viruses, one bacteria and four parasites which are oncogenic. Your 90% job is done. Then the most important among them I will explain in detail. Okay. So the six <coughs> viruses, out of the six viruses are, you can see how many of them are DNA. The four of them are DNA. And the two of them are RNA. Which four are DNA? It is hepatitis B virus. <coughs> I'm really sorry. Human herpes virus 8, human papilloma virus, Epstein Barr virus. And which are RNA viruses? HTLV and HCV. So please learn them different differently. Among them, I will give you details of only two. Which two? So I will give you detail of I guess HPV and ABV. How they causes cancer i cannot give you the detail of all of them now how they cause cancer the most important which are important from exam point of view we will see so how does hpv causes cancer hpv there are many types of hpv some causes benign cancer some causes malignant so 16 and 18 most commonly cause malignant cancer they are high risk okay in the hpv there are two proteins <coughs> e6 and e7 e6 causes mutation of p53 and E7 causes mutation of retinoblastoma gene. And because of which the person had cancer. HPV causes genital cancer. By genital cancer, I mean cervix cancer in female. And I mean panis cancer in male. You got it? Give me a minute, please. <coughs> I'm really sorry. Let me draw it for you. Instead of reading, we will draw it. So you can see here I am drawing any cell. Like either the skin cell. Or the genital cell of human. You can see I am drawing the nucleus. I am drawing the DNA. Okay. This is HPV virus. <clears throat> HPV virus enters inside the cell. And here it forms two proteins. E6 and E7. 
Among them, both of them will go in the nucleus. E6 causes mutation of P53 and E7 causes mutation of retinoblastoma gene and because of which this cell becomes immortal and it will lead to cancer, various types of cancer. <clears throat> This is the mechanism. So E6 and E7 you have to learn. And Epstein Barr viruses most commonly it causes Burkitt lymphoma. It causes other cancers also, but most commonly it causes Burkitt lymphoma. So that's all about it. That's all. So please read the list: the viruses, the bacteria, and parasite. Bacteria and parasite, there is no mechanism. You have to learn the list. So that's all about it. I guess we are done with the general pathology. We should start the hematology. I would like to take a small break for uh, say 10 minutes only and we will start the hematology. I will take one hour session for hematology right now <clears throat> after a break of 10 minutes. So currently it's uh, 3.20. I will start at 3.30. Okay. At 3.30 come back at 3.30 start hematology. Okay.
Hello everyone. Am I visible? Am I audible? Kindly confirm. If I'm clearly visible, audible, I will continue. Give me a minute. Let me check. So if you can see and hear me, kindly write down in the chat box. I'm waiting. Yes, okay, okay. Thank you, Osama. Thank you for confirming. So, let me continue with hematology. So, we have done the most important topics in general pathology, and let's start with hematology. In hematology, we will start with anemias. So, what is the definition of anemia? How can you define anemia? Do you know what is anemia? Can you define anemia for me? What is anemia basically? So, anemia, how many RBCs human have? Human have rbc's wbc and platelet in the blood the normal count of rbc is 4.5 to 5.5 million per deciliter this is the normal count right so anemia is reduction in rbc mass reduction in rbc mass but measuring rbc is difficult and all the rbc contain hemoglobin inside them we know the, how uh, what is the rbc rbc is a cell which is non-nucleated it doesn't have the nucleus at the periphery hemoglobin is present so rbc is a non-nucleated cell which contain hemoglobin all the RBC contain hemoglobin. So whenever the RBC reduce in number, the hemoglobin also reduce in number because RBC is directly proportional to hemoglobin. So indirectly, instead of measuring RBC, we can measure the hemoglobin. So basically, the anemia is reduction in total RBC mass. But in practice, measurement of RBC mass is difficult. That's why instead of measuring RBC mass, we measure the hemoglobin. So nowadays, we define anemia as reduction of hemoglobin. Below what? <laughs> Reduction of hemoglobin below what? Below the normal, normal limit, normal lower limit of hemoglobin for that individual. So, what is the normal limit for hemoglobin for individuals defined by the WHO? For males, it's 13.6 gram per deciliter. If any male having hemoglobin less than 13.5 gram per deciliter, it is anemic. The male is anemic. In females, it's 12 gram per deciliter. And in newborns, it's 15 gram per deciliter. So it depends on the age of the person. It depends on the gender of the person. Let me ask a question. Let me ask a question. The question is a person is having hemoglobin 12.5. Uh, is the person anemic or not? Is the person anemic or not? My question to you. Is the person anemic or not? Do you know? Can you answer it? You should not answer it. You should ask me the age and you should ask me the gender. If I say the age is adult. And if I say the gender is male, the male is anemic because for male the cutoff is 13.6 and it is less. So the male is anemic. But if I say the female, the female is non-anemic because for female the cutoff is 12 and it is more than that. It is more than that. You got it? So male and female. For male it's anemic. The, uh, the male is normal. For, for female it's anemic. You got my point? I'm sorry. For male, it's anemic. For female, it's normal. So, the age and the gender is important to define anemia. That is my point. Oh, so let me come on the classification of the anemia. For understanding the classification of anemia, you should understand the morphology of the RBC. In the RBC, see two things. Number one, okay, see the shape of the RBC. What is the shape of the RBC? RBC, if you see from front, it's circular. It's circular like a coin. And if you see from side, it's biconcave. If you see from the side, it's biconcave. If you see from the front, from the top, it's circular. And if you see from the side, it's biconcave. Right. The diameter of the RBC is 7.5 micrometer. The diameter of the RBC is 7.5 micrometer. Please learn this dimension. 7.5 micrometer. It's a circle. So the diameter you have to learn. This is normal RBC. You have seen the shape. Now, is it nucleated? No. RBC is a non-nucleated cell. It contains hemoglobin. And wherever it contains hemoglobin, it is having the pink color. So, the hemoglobin is present at the periphery. See, I am marking. It is present at the periphery, not at the center. The central one-third is empty. The central one-third is empty. It is known as pellar. It is known as central one-third pellar. So, please learn two things for the RBC. Number one, its size. Number two, its color. Size and color. See the size from the top. Say, ma'am, size is 7.5 micrometer. Please learn that. And what is the color? If you ask me about the color, the color is present at the peripheral two-third, not at central one-third. So, peripheral two-third is colored, but central one-third is empty. It's pellar. It's pink color. Okay. So, this is the color. Learn central one-third is pellar. 
एम्प्टी पोर्शन इज कलर तो दिस इज नॉर्मल साइज नॉर्मल कलर इफ यू नो द नॉर्मल साइज नॉर्मल कलर यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड नाउ अहेड लाइक द क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ द एनीमिया सो नॉर्मल साइज इज सेवन पॉइंट फाइव माइक्रोमीटर एंड सेंट्रल वन थर्ड इज पेलर द लाइफ साइज लाइफ स्पान ऑफ आर बी सी इज वन ट्वेंटी डेज एवरी वन नोज दैट नाउ बेस्ड ऑन द साइज आर बी सीज आर ऑफ थ्री टाइप बेस्ड ऑन द कलर आर बी सीज आर ऑफ थ्री टाइप फर्स्ट टॉक अबाउट साइज इन पैथोलॉजी साइज इज नोन एज सिटिक प्लीज लर्न द वर्ड सिटिक सिटिक इज साइज सिटिक इज साइज ओके सो नॉर्मल साइज इज सेवन पॉइंट फाइव माइक्रोमीटर ओके राइट आर बी सीज कैन बी नॉर्मल साइज कैन बी लार्जर साइज कैन बी स्मॉलर साइज ओके नॉर्मल लार्जर स्मॉलर द साइज ओके सो दिस वन इज नोन एज नॉर्मोसिटिक दिस वन इज नोन एज मैक्रोसिटिक and this one known as micro microcytic okay this is cytic 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 so that is cytic cytic means size please learn that based on the size rbcs are of three type so they are in front of you normocytic macrocytic microcytic see the suffix suffix is cytic normocyte macrocyte microcyte based on no how you measure the size okay let me tell you color also okay first finish size how you measure the size just suppose i am giving a slide in front of you there are three slides how you measure the size of the rbc you don't have scale in the microscope right you don't use a scale to measure whether the rbcs are 7.5 micrometer smaller than that bigger than that how you measure we don't use a scale na so there is a way you know in the slide we have wbcs also one of the wbc is lymphocyte the size of lymphocyte is also 7.5 micrometer and it is fixed rbc can be smaller can be larger but the lymphocyte is always 7.5 micrometer so we compare the size of the rbc on a peripheral smear with a lymphocyte see here the rbcs are same size as that of lymphocyte that's why it is normocytic see in the second slide the rbcs are smaller as compared to lymphocyte these are microcytes and in the third size in the third, third slide the rbcs are larger the rbcs are larger than the lymphocyte it is macrocytes so normocytes microcyte and macrocyte based on the size you can divide the rbc into three categories yes we have to compare it with a small lymphocyte so that is a thing based on the color rbcs are of two types only right not three types color in pathology is known as chromic color color is known as chroma chromic or chroma ka matlab hai color cytic means size chroma means color if the rbc is there in the rbc if the peripheral two third is colored you can see peripheral two third is color central one third is an empty it is known as normochromic normochromic okay but if the color is present only at the periphery central one third pilar is more and peripheral two third ring is less it's like this hardly any color is present at the periphery it is known as hypochromic hypo means less there is no condition like hyperchromic hyperchromic nahi hota it doesn't exist so basically normochromic the central one third pilar is there and here the pilar is more than one third the pilar is one more than one third the color is less so this is the based on the color so what we have learned what we have learned can you please summarize based on the size how many type of rbc based on the color how many type of rbc based on the size that is known as cytic how many type of rbc based on the color that is chroma how many type of rbc can you please tell me based on the size three type of rbcs normocytic okay normocytic microcytic and macrocytic okay based on the color there are two type of rbc normo normo chromic the suffix is important the suffix is cytic or chromic see that and hypo hypochromic hypo there is no hyperchromic now let me classify anemia everyone with me everyone so first type of anemia is normocytic normochromic the size is normal the color is normal still person have anemia such anemia is normocytic normochromic the second type of anemia is microcytic hypochromic in which rbcs are less in size less in color and the patient have anemia it is known as microcytic hypochromic anemia and the third type of anemia macrocytic but there is no hyperchromic na there is no corresponding so macrocytic normochromic so tell me the three types of anemia what are the three types of anemia normocytic normochromic microcytic hypochromic macrocytic normochromic you got it so based on the size based on the color we have three type of anemia normocytic normochromic microcytic hypochromic 
macrocytic normochromic say yes you got it so just learn in pathology size is cytic and color is chromic you will not, not get confused normocytic normochromic microcytic hypochromic and macrocytic normochromic everyone give me a thumbs up if you got this basic concept this is the basic classification of anemia known as morphological classification of anemia for measuring the size you require a uh, lymphocyte on the smear for color you don't require any lymphocyte give me a thumbs up everyone are you people there you got it so normochromic and hypochromic we got it can you see the rbc's here in the slide in the slide they are normochromic see the central one third pallor see the central one third pallor is there in all of them central one third is pallor right see the second slide in the second slide you can hardly see in any color maximum slide is pallor only hardly any color is present maximum is pallor so this is normochromic this is hypochromic got it can we go ahead huh two more terminologies you have to learn here two more terminologies what two more terminologies i want to tell you anisocytosis and poikilocytosis now can you see here some rbcs are small some are normal some are large so variation in size is known as anisocytosis some are small some are normal some are large but variation in shape can you see this is tear shape this is helmet shape this is oval this is circular so variation in shape is known as poikilocytosis poikilocytosis so variation in size is anisocytosis and variation in shape is poikilocytosis these are the basics if you learn okay if you know the basics learning the concepts are very easy so let's classify anemia now you can very easily understand the classification of the anemia there are two important anemias morpho two important classifications of anemia morphological and etiological okay morphological and etiological so morphological uh, classification i already told you normocytic normochromic microcytic hypochromic macrocytic normochromic that is the three types of anemia the morphological classification and okay coming on the etiological classification now in etiological classification what is the cause of the anemia you have to learn the cause of the anemia okay what is the cause of the anemia so the anemia can be due to three causes number one blood loss like someone is having surgery someone is having accident acute blood loss or someone is having hemorrhoids peptic ulcer menstruation menorrhagia chronic blood loss can be there so blood loss can lead to anemia the two more important causes of anemia where does the rbc produced the rbcs are produced in the bone marrow this is the bone marrow this is the blood vessel the rbcs are produced in the bone marrow from the cell hematopoietic stem cell which is the precursor of all cell it gave rise to the rbc and rbc finally formation it come in the blood like this this is the rbc rbc comes in the blood after formation okay after formation in the bone marrow from the precursors the normoblast early intermediate late right now for anemia there are two causes either there is problem in the bone marrow and there is decreased production of rbc or the production is normal there is problem in the peripheral blood vessel there is increased destruction of rbc so these are the two main causes of the anemia please understand decreased production so the problem is in the bone marrow or increased destruction the problem is in the peripheral blood vessel what is the problem okay so either there is decreased production or there is increased destruction the two causes the anemia due to increased destruction is known as hemolytic anemia hemolytic anemia hemolytic anemia is the anemia due to increased destruction of rbc got it so there are two main type of anemia decreased production increased destruction so what is the cause of decreased production now why the production is less the production can be less you know in the bone marrow how does the production takes place let me tell you the precursors so what is erythropoiesis how does the precursors of the rbc are there so first cell is hematopoietic stem stem cell then pro normoblast early normoblast intermediate normoblast late normoblast reticulocyte and finally rbc is formed after formation it comes in the blood vessel okay now in all these precursors let me draw the precursors these all are there they all the are there now the cytoplasm contains the hemoglobin they all have hemoglobin in the cytoplasm and they all have nucleus nucleus but nucleus is extruded at at late normoblast stage the last retic and rbc don't have nucleus they are non nucleated cell the nucleus is extruded at late normoblast stage you got my point so basically decreased production can be due to two reason either there is problem in the cytoplasm or there is problem in the nucleus the problem in the cytoplasm means hemoglobin is not there either heme is not there or globin is not there heme is not there it is iron deficiency anemia sideroblastic anemia anemia of chronic disease and globin is not there it is thalassemia or sickle cell anemia 
or else there is a problem in the nucleus. For the synthesis of nucleus, vitamin B12 and folic acid are required, it is megaloblastic anemia. Or there is a problem in the stem cell, that is aplastic anemia. So these all are the various classification of the anemia you must understand. You got it? Give me a thumbs up if you got it. Give me a thumbs up. So can we continue? Okay. So let's start hemolytic anemia. In the hemolytic anemia, I will be discussing a few more anemias. Just a second. Okay. okay so we will be discussing one more topic hemolytic anemia after that i will end the session the remaining rbc few more anemias are important remaining and all wbcs i mean all the leukemias i will be discussing tomorrow along with the systemic tomorrow also we are having the same session the session tomorrow okay so let me finish it now only because it is a fresh topic if i start now and leave it in the between and tomorrow I'll, so there will not be a link of continuity so let me end the session now tomorrow 9 a.m in the morning till again 4 or 4 30 we will be having the session we will be having lunch break in between that's it so we are having the session i uh, request all of you don't miss tomorrow's session tomorrow i will first start with systemic in the systemic, I am going to cover 10 important systems. I have enumerated the 10 systems. You can see uh, in tomorrow's link. So, we will start with the blood vessels. Then we will move on CVS, then CNS. Then, you know, one by one, we, we will take the systems like GIT, hepatobiliary, endocrine, and uh, which else? Respiratory, musculoskeletal. So, we are going to take all these systems one by one. Tomorrow's session, the most important topics in them, not the complete systems, of course. So, in blood vessels, I am going to teach you the important atherosclerosis, aneurysm, aortic dissection. In CVS, I will teach you MI, endocarditis. In CNS, I will teach you meningitis. In GIT, I will teach you peptic ulcer. I will teach you gastritis, like the important, important topics we are going to cover in the entire systemic pathology. Right, and after that, so I will try to finish it till 2 o'clock and after lunch, I will take hematology tomorrow, directly hematology. So the remaining anemias and WBC, I will cover it tomorrow. Will it work for you? Will it work for you? So tomorrow it's already, uh, today it's already late now. So tomorrow we can continue. Okay, so how was the session? Can you give me the feedback? Do you find it useful? Do you find it useful? So you want tomorrow's session also, the systemic pathology? Any special request? I am going to cover the important topics and the important entire systemic pathology. According to me, whatever important in entire systemic pathology, I will definitely cover. So today we have covered the general. In the same way, we will cover systemic tomorrow. And hemat, we will continue. Okay. So tomorrow, sharp 9 a.m. I will start with CVS. So don't dare to miss it. If you miss the initial half now, you will lose the grip. Okay. So thank you so much. Thank you for being with me. Yes, it is more than enough for the uh, FMG Mohit. If you study this much of pathology, I can guarantee all the questions in your exam will be from this section only. I will provide the notes on the Telegram group. Okay, I will I will uh, provide it to the team and the ProCM team will share with uh, share it with you on the Telegram channel. Okay, so the same notes I am uh, providing you. Thank you so much. And uh, tomorrow, we will continue the session. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.